Hello, Sharon's here. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning.
Tom, you're on audio mute. Morning, Mr. Chair. You are uh, you are live, and we hear your audio, so I think you are probably good to go, even though we can't see you. Tom? Yes, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? I can see you now, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, I think everyone is on. Uh, Tom, can you confirm that we are, uh, good morning. I'm not getting audio in my direction, so I need to work on that. Uh, but let's start the meeting and I'll, I'll just uh, hold on my preliminary or my opening comments and turn it over to Chris. And maybe we can get audio going both ways. You bet, Mr. Chair. Maybe I'll give one attempt to see if you can hear me, and if others can, either a thumbs up or a, or a verbal to make sure that people can hear me, and I can happily jump right in. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Well, as we take a look at the agenda, clearly we'll skip over the chair's report for right now, but I wanted to dive into a presentation uh, to recognize the 2020 Jackson, Jackson Scholarship recipient. So a little bit about the Jackson, uh, Glenn Jackson Scholarship. The Jackson Scholarship Program was established in 1985 and is named after the late Glenn L. Jackson, widely regarded as Oregon's first citizen. For 20 years, Jackson served on the Highway and Transportation Commission most of that time as chairman and had a lasting influence on both state parks and transportation in Oregon. Contributors to the scholarship fund include Oregon Department of Transportation and state parks employees and their families, friends, and business associates in memory of the late Glenn Jackson. No state funds are used for the scholarship fund and it's really dedicated to college-bound high school seniors who are dependents of current regular status ODOT or state parks employees or retirees uh, and who may apply for the Jackson Scholarship Program. Applicants are evaluated by the Oregon State Scholarship Commission on their academic record, leadership qualities, moral character, community and school activities, and financial need. Uh, so a pretty robust evaluation program. At this point, I'd like to congratulate Leslie Chacon Romero as this year's Glenn Jackson Scholar recipient. Congratulations. A little bit about uh, her mom. Leslie's mother, Maribel Romero, was hired by ODOT and uh, works in DMV in July of 2017 as a transportation service representative in the Cottage Grove field office. She is a dedicated employee and exceeds expectations in customer service always provides patient, courteous, and professional service to her customers and represents the agency in a very positive light. She's a, she's a true example for others to follow. Her daughter, Leslie, graduated receiving high honors uh, with a 3.7 GPA and over 100 hours of community service. 
She was part of several organizations in her community, such as beginning the first cultural club at her school, being part of the Youth Advisory Council, and several other organizations that support students of color uh, to receive a better education. She was also part of the cross country, community boxing and wrestling teams, all while working at a restaurant in town. She was accepted uh, to Oregon State University and the University of Oregon and has eventually chosen to be a duck. She was awarded several scholarships and will be attending her freshman year of college debt free. Leslie now works for both the restaurant and recently became a legal assistant for the Molina Law Group. She'll be attending the University of Oregon to pursue a career in law and become a criminal and immigration attorney. She already uh, has accomplished being one of the first in her family to go to college. Her next goal is not only to be the first female in her whole family to graduate college, but also to become a lawyer and help others in need. Uh, so congratulations and the best of luck uh, to you and your educational pursuit. Uh, I'm hopeful at this point that Maribel and Leslie have an opportunity and we can tie them in to maybe say a few words. And Mr. Director, we're trying to get them on. Maybe just momentarily we'll be able to complete this. Thank you, sir. And after uh, they say a few words, we will take an opportunity to have a photo op with the commission uh, and myself uh, and do our very best to capture this historic and significant moment for Less Than Your Family as best we can over the uh, WebEx platform. So Maribel, you have joined us now and you're unmuted if you wanted to say a few words. Director Strickler, it, it may be that uh, she's not been able to fully connect. I see she's coming in on a mobile device. Um, so, uh, not sure that we'll be able to complete this uh, vagaries of technology and all. Okay, well, Leslie and Maribel, uh, I, I wish we had the opportunity to hear from you because this is a significant moment for you and your family. I just want to extend my appreciation and congratulations. Uh, and recognize all of the hard work. Uh, as I was going through, Leslie, your accomplishments, uh, I was wondering when you had time to sleep. So congratulations, great job, uh, and good luck next year as you begin your freshman year. At this point, uh, unless you're ready, uh, Mr. Chair, I can happily go into the uh, director's update um, for this meeting. I can now hear you, uh, Chris, and thank you for uh, carrying the ball here the first few minutes of the meeting. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, to today's uh, meeting of the Oregon Transportation Commission. We actually are having a two day meeting tomorrow as a workshop uh, for the commission, but uh, I just want to uh, join with Chris and welcoming everyone to the meeting as I continue to work through a little few technology glitches this morning. So uh, I, I just wanted to say a couple of things before we go into your report, Mr. Director. Uh, the first is I want to recognize uh, Commissioner Brown, who is uh, this summer was reappointed to the commission effective July 1 to a four year term. Uh, Julie's been a great uh, part of the commission, great member of the commission since she joined us in uh, 2018, and we look forward to her continued service. Uh, she has a deep background in transportation and it's uh, been a great addition to our group of five. So Julie, uh, thank you for agreeing to continue to serve and 
We look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, Julie, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say thank you for those kind of words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the second thing I wanted to say was I, as I looked at the agenda uh, today and tomorrow, uh, I'm, uh, I was feeling like we really have done a lot of work uh, in concert with the agency to try to um, move to what I know the commission as a whole uh, believes strongly and I do as well, um, that we really want it to be the policy making and strategic uh, directive kind of body, which is our role in this, as well as the oversight uh, board for the department. Uh, and I think if you look at our agenda for this meeting today and tomorrow, you, you see that reflected in in what we've been able to accomplish to really kind of get out of the weeds, uh, we, which we were in for a while, and have a uh, meeting which is really focused on strategic and uh, policy level discussions, including with respect to the strategic plan, which we will get into uh, some today and further tomorrow, uh, and then so just all through the agenda are items which um, which I think are at the level that we're supposed to be playing at. And so I appreciate uh, working with uh, Director Strickler and the senior leadership team uh, to uh, get to this day. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, just make a couple of other kind of technical comments. We, we do have closed caption for this meeting. And so, um, I think we have a slide on that that will come up here momentarily or has already been up. And uh, so I'd encourage people that need closed caption or want to uh, uh, avail themselves of that, do so. Uh, yeah, there it is. Um, so that should give you um, the link to the uh, closed caption function and I encourage people to use that function. Uh, so I may have a few other comments, but I think because we started a little late, uh, I'll just try and lay some in through the meeting uh, and turn it over to you, Chris, for your report. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, once again, Chris Strickler, privilege of serving as director. I have a few items to report, and I will be brief as well to try and get us back on track. Uh, the first item is I want to also recognize Commissioner Brown's reappointment uh, and echo the comments made by the chair. Uh, we appreciate your continued service and uh, your over 20 years experience in transportation planning, uh, as well as general manager for the Rogue Valley Transportation District to bring a significant amount of benefits to the commission. And thank you very much for uh, your service and your candor on the commission. It's greatly appreciated. The next item is uh, the approval of Senate Bill 1601, passed on June 26th. Uh, on June 26th, the Legislative Assembly passed the bill enabling the statewide transportation improvement formula fund recipients to use their fiscal year 2019-2021 disbursements to maintain existing transportation services. Also provided flexibility for the STIF fund uh, used in response to fiscal impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on public transportation providers and consolidated the special transportation fund uh, with the STIF, which will become effective July 1, 2023. Uh, our public transportation division is currently developing guidance for transit providers on a new option to expend uh, STIF funds on maintaining existing services and they anticipate distributing that guidance in July. The next item uh, is an update regarding uh, Stephanie Coons and Troy Costales. So Stephanie Coons, for those of you that don't know, has been working in DMV uh, for quite some time and has been uh, overseeing a field services group since 2015. Stephanie is now transitioning over to be uh, ODOT's chief human resource manager. Uh, she'll be replacing Clyde Psyche, who has served in that role on an interim basis since December. Uh, and she uh, brings a significant amount of experience, both from DMV, but also uh, from the City of Albany Parks and Rec Department, uh, as well as other things within her career. Stephanie is passionate and results focused. Uh, she is a great leader and she emphasizes equity and inclusion, which is a significant element uh, of importance for our agency. We are really excited to have Stephanie transition into that role uh, on, on a rotational basis. 
Troy Costales, our Transportation Safety Division Administrator, will be back filling her role at DMV because of uh, this rotational assignment and the significant time we have for DMV. Uh, so we're looking forward to the work that Stephanie is going to continue to do, and we appreciate Troy stepping in to backfill in this time. I say Troy stepping in to backfill in this time because we just reached a significant milestone for Mr. McClellan, our division administrator, or DMV administrator, excuse me, uh, and the entire DMV staff. On July 6th, DMV successfully completed the replacement of their computer system on time and on budget, the service transportation, uh, excuse me, the service transformation program. The system roll out, rolled out over the holiday weekend and it went smoothly. The team is still working through a few punch list items, uh, but to our customers, it appears that everything is running exactly the way as we had intended. Uh, this will bring more online service. Is that additional services to the online DMB to you website, a new point of sale equipment for more convenient and accurate transactions, new computer system to replace the current system, which believe it or not was built during the 1960s. It will provide real-time updates so that agencies like law enforcement can access information as soon as it's added to a vehicle or driving record, and we're now issuing real ID compliant driver license and ID cards. DMV is emerging from this project with a new approach to change, a very nimble system that is ready to transition with the times and a renewed sense of teamwork. Uh, big congratulations out to DMV, uh, both Mr. McClellan and all of the staff across the state for being part of this significant and positive change. Mr. Chair, with that, those are my opening remarks, and thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Director Strickler. So we have a set of action items this morning, the first of which uh, concerns the Commission's 2020 investment strategy. Uh, so I'm hoping that Travis Brower is here and can uh, here virtually and can report out on that. Travis? Okay. Can you I can hear you. Okay, my apologies. Can you actually hear me? If so, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up. All right, thank you. <laughs> As usual, the technology issues are always fun. So I will be uh, masters of ceremonies today, essentially for a rather lengthy and involved discussion of a number of financial areas across the agency. And uh, we, uh, just by sort of a random chance, have uh, the the confluence of multiple approvals across the financial world today. I'm gonna to start by giving you a very brief overview of the, sorry, the, very, uh, the various areas across the agency that uh, are going to be impacted today. So next slide, please. The first uh, thing that's really important to note is that ODOT is a little bit strange in that we essentially have two different budgets. We have a agency budget and then we have a STIP. The agency budget incorporates everything and the STIP is really a subset of that agency budget. What's included specifically in the budget are the agency capital expenditures for things like facilities, fleets, and information systems, as well as the agency operations costs, everything from uh, collecting the revenue and managing our programs, administrative costs, and regulation uh, of various industries, as well as some of the highway or all of the highway maintenance and operations costs that are a substantial portion of our work as an agency, and the state funded non highway programs like Connect Oregon or the STIP. Those are part of the system, but aren't included in the STIP. The STIP is really focused on the transportation system, but really even just a subset of that. It is the federally funded projects the state funded highway projects that we include there, and then federal planning research and analysis. So just a subset of that transportation system work that we as an agency do. Next slide, please. The commission has a really key role in both the STIP and the budget, but it differs a little bit across the two. Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. The OTC's role in the STIP is to allocate funding among, oh, one more back, sorry. 
commission's role in the SIP is to allocate funding across the various programs and set program requirements and expectations for public engagement, and then approve the draft and final steps. We're going to be working through that today. Uh, your factors in decision making the SIP really come down to the, the policies and the Oregon Transportation Plan, the system needs, the performance measures, and the stakeholder input you receive. In the budget, your uh, priority or your role is really to set priorities for investments, uh, review the uh, proposals that ODOT brings forward for those areas that are specifically in the budget around capital programs, uh, the positions and programs that we have that are funded. We're good. And then approve the agency request budget as one step in a long process that goes to the governor's office all the way through the legislative process. The uh, important thing to know is that when you take up the budget, those funding allocations that you've already decided in the STIP are already included there. And really, some of the key factors in decision making are uh, the growth in personal services costs, uh, the agency program system and facility needs, and then, of course, uh, funding, which is a key consideration right now. Next slide, please. The budget and the STIP operate on different cycles, but it just so happens that three of these came together this month. If you drew a line down the the middle of 2020 there, you'd see that the development of the 21-24 STIP concludes, the beginning of the 24-27 STIP is this month, and then we uh, get through the initial process of legislative de uh, budget development. So this is that interesting confluence of all of these coming together at one time. Next slide, please. A couple of themes you will hear throughout the conversation today are some sources of risk and uncertainty, specifically on federal funding, which plays a really important role in the STIP. The FAST Act, uh, uh, the Current Surface Transportation Authorization, <clears throat> expires in two months uh, and 15 and a half days. Not that anybody's counting. And sometime later this year, or early next year, the Highway Trust Fund is gonna run out of cash. At that point, we'll face a deficit and Congress may have to cut funding substantially if they don't find a source of funding to back them. So we need to be very cognizant of that and build in uh, appropriate risk mitigation into our discussion. The second area is COVID-19 and the economy. Uh, we have already seen that COVID-19 uh, directly caused significant reductions in driving as people stayed home and also <clears throat> has then uh, sparked an economic recession. We just put out an updated revenue forecast based on more data uh, that came out earlier this week. In fact, it just came out on Monday. What it showed is that the state highway fund is now down about a quarter billion dollars over the period of 2020 through 2024. That is a not insubstantial number that will impact uh, local governments who receive about half the state highway fund, uh, as well as ODOT's operational budget that we have for maintenance and operation and those other uh, internal functions, as well as uh, projects uh, out on the road. So we're going to have to come back a little bit later and work through some of those issues as well. But those are, are significant sources of risk and uncertainty that we're going to have to work into these discussions and figure out how best we can mitigate those and address those going forward. Next slide, please. Today's discussion is going to consist of five different elements. We're asking you for, for really five different actions. The first uh, is to accept the uh, updated investment strategy. Uh, the second is we're at the end of the 21-24 step process. So we'll ask you to approve that, to send it on to FHWA and FTA for their final approval. On the 24-27 step, as we begin that process, we have a number of areas of direction where we, we need uh, some feedback and guidance and input from the commission. Things like assumptions about federal funding and how we mitigate risk there. Uh, the program categories, our public outreach, and how we're going to approach climate specifically. On the 21-23 agency request budget, we have a deadline at the end of the month to uh, submit that, uh, and so need uh, the commission to take action to approve that document. And then we also wanted to have a longer term budget discussion about our challenges and how we might close some of those gaps. So we'll ask the commission to, uh, uh, we'll discuss some of those items and then ask the commission uh, to discuss and provide direction. So that is an overview of everything you will get today and really the beginning of a longer journey that will take us through the end of the year and beyond as we begin developing the STIP and really begin developing solutions to our long-term budget challenge. Unless there are any questions, I will uh, move along to covering the investment strategy. Up.
All right, we'll move along. Michelle, next slide, please. So the investment strategy work began back in January and then took a couple of detours and uh, delays, but we are bringing this back to you uh, for you to accept. The investment strategy was designed to reassess the gap in funding and the uh, resulting impacts on the transportation system based on the funding that was provided in HB 2017. Your previous investment strategy covered the period up to that point. And so now it is an update to incorporate that additional funding. We wanted to look at the funding constraints uh, and the revenue challenges and risks, and also develop some options for sustainable revenue. And so really the purpose is to uh, inform this discussion uh, of the commission's decisions regarding program funding allocations for the 24, 27 step, also to inform some of our budgetary discussions. The investment strategy in, is, uh, in laying out the need is really uh, a foundational document for these discussions in the sense that it gives you a sense of what those gaps in need are and what the uh, as is state is on both funding and our current investment strategies with looks to the future for what may be. And so it really is uh, a starting point for your discussions uh, and an opportunity for you to look at modifying the way we fund the transportation system in the agency. Uh, as well as looking at other revenue options. Next slide, please. The investment strategy is really designed to fill the gap between the high level statewide transportation policy plans like the OTP and those statewide modal plans and the funding decisions you make in the agency request budget, uh, the STIP and those non-highway grant programs. So it provides a layer uh, explaining what our investment strategies are across all different parts of the transportation system to help with those funding decisions. Next slide, please. Add, in a conversation uh, the other day with Chair Van Brocklin, uh, he articulated after reading the investment strategy that it became really clear that there really just isn't enough money to go around. So I think if there's one key conclusion from this investment strategy, it's that even with the significant investments made by HB 2017, the condition and performance of the transportation system will decline over time. As a result, the investment decisions made by the OTC in the STIP uh, and in our budget will require very difficult trade-off discussions. Next slide, please. One of the reasons for this is that uh, we have had a series of good investments uh, made by the legislature, made by Congress over the years. But as this chart shows, when you actually look at the buying power of our state and federal highway funds, they're going to peak in 2021 and then begin to decline. And I should also note, uh, this is an old slide based on our pre-COVID uh, situation. Uh, I was too depressed to actually go update it to include the latest revenue forecast. So as a result, uh, this is a little bit older. And I should just note that throughout this document or this discussion today, most of our uh, charts and graphs uh, are based on the April 20. 20 revenue forecast that included some of our COVID impacts, but we have not yet had a chance to incorporate that new information that is literally just hot off the presses into our financial models and bring you those updates. So we'll be doing that in the future as well. All right, next slide, please. One of the really important elements uh, that's in the investment strategy that you'll find throughout our, our programs is uh, what we call our major improvements hierarchy for the highway system. This is foundational to who we are as a state, DOT, and uh, plays across all of our programs. The first priority is to protect the existing system, to preserve it, to make it safe. Secondly, we try to improve efficiency and capacity of existing highway facilities, including through operational improvements, uh, as well as through lower cost solutions, like adding auxiliary lanes where we have congested bottlenecks. When we've done all that and we need to still make additional improvements uh, based on uh, the performance of the system, that's when we look at adding capacity to the existing system. And the last priority uh, is that we look, only after we've done all of those things, do we look to add new facilities to the system, new bypasses, new roads. That's why we have not been uh, building uh, very many new roads. We are primarily in the, the role of preserving and improving the roads and the facilities that we already have. Next slide, please. That's really important on the preservation side uh, as one of our top priorities as an agency is just to keep the system in a state of good repair. 
However, the challenge is that we don't have enough money to do that for all of the 8,000 lane miles of state highways. So across our preservation fix-it programs, we focus on a set of high priority fix-it corridors that carry high volumes of freight and connect most of the population centers uh, across the state. Even just focusing on those blue routes that you see here today, funding is not sufficient, uh, resulting in a triage approach that looks at investing our uh, limited resources in the best projects for recognizing that elements of the system will continue to decay. When we did this investment strategy, we found that across all the areas of preservation, just maintaining that status quo condition requires more than doubling current funding. Next slide, please. That's particularly the case in bridges. The majority of our bridges on state highways, there's 2,700 of them, are over 50 years old. And a large number of them are nearing the end of their service life and require either rehabilitation or a complete replacement. However, uh, our funding is so limited that we really don't have enough money to replace bridges. We're doing an average of about three a year. So we're really focused on repairing deteriorating bridges to temporarily extend their service life. That means we are on a current replacement cycle for our state highway bridges of 900 years. I look at the Shikuna Bay Bridge. It's a beautiful, wonderful structure. We want to keep it in, in uh, good shape for as long as possible. I can guarantee you that thing is not going to last 900 years. So fundamentally on bridges, what we're going to see is gradual deterioration of our structures that will lead to load restrictions, delays, and detours that will cause significant challenges for the economy. Next slide, please. I should note on bridges, uh, we currently spend about $160 million a year and need about another $300 million a year to maintain our existing uh, performance uh, or condition of the system. Pavement's very similar. We've had to stretch our paving cycle out to about 50 years. Uh, that's more than double what you would want. Typical life cycle is 10 to 30 years. And we expect that uh, even with the new funding in HB 2017, our conditions will start declining in 2024. We need about $100 million a year in increased funding, about double what we have today to achieve a sustainable program. Next slide, please. What's really too bad about that is we know that if we can intervene at the right time before pavements deteriorate with cheaper uh, treatments, we can do simple overlays or even a multiple layer uh, paving. Once the pavement deteriorates, we have to get into a situation where we have to rebuild that pavement at much greater cost per mile. So there's an element of pay me now or pay me more later. Next slide. But you know, bridges and pavements are only two of the most obvious assets out on the system. As we did this work on the investment uh, strategy, we looked at culverts and we calculated that uh, they make bridges look good in the sense that we're on a 1,300 year replacement cycle for our culverts, some of which look like that having almost completely deteriorated. And I had to work in a picture of a really ginormous boulder. So I wanted to point out that we have over 4,000 known unstable slope locations across the state highway system. And the repair costs of all those are estimated at $3.3 billion well beyond the funding we are investing in either culverts or rock falls to take care of these critical parts of the system. Next slide. But beyond our capital investment in the system, we also know that our maintenance and operations needs have funding is not kept up with rising costs. What you'll see as we talk about this a little bit later uh, is that you know, maintenance can only be funded by a portion of our state highway fund revenue as much of it is dedicated to projects and debt service. We have a major shortfall there that almost inevitably will affect our ability to maintain our current level of service for maintenance. What's even uh, worse is that uh, as the system begins to deteriorate, as we're not able to preserve all of our assets, then more of the burden falls on maintenance crews to take care of some of those shortfalls. We can't deal with rock falls. Maintenance crews have to go out and deal with these slides. When our culverts blow out, maintenance crews have to go close down the road and uh, replace those or hire uh, contractors. It's also uh, important to note that we have about 100 maintenance facilities all across the state. Uh, about a quarter of those are over 50 years old, and 40% have, uh, have become functionally obsolete. We need to be spending about $100 million to replace those that are functionally obsolete every biennium. We're spending more like about $20 million, so falling very far behind there. And there's some consequences of these. In some cases, our uh, vehicles can no longer fit inside our bays at our maintenance stations uh, because of changing vehicle size. 
Next slide, please. Safety is also obviously a very key priority. We have over 1,800 life-changing uh, crashes every year, fatal and serious injury crashes. That's been going up, particularly for vulnerable users where road deaths are the highest in 27 years. And I should also note that that's particularly the case for people of color who are particularly uh, highly overly represented uh, in those who are uh, killed or seriously injured while walking or biking. We have put significant additional resources in recent years, both from federal money and state money into the All Roads Transportation Safety Program. It uses a data-driven approach to fund the most cost-effective projects to reduce fatalities and serious injuries on all public roads for all users. So it is jurisdictionally blind for both local governments and state governments. Even with all that money though, we still see that we're only meeting a fraction of the need there are still a lot of very important projects that can uh, reduce injuries and fatalities that we're not able to find. Next slide, please. Active transportation is another area where we're meeting only a fraction of the need. At our current uh, funding, it would take 164 years for us to complete the state system of bike uh, lanes and sidewalks. We need 53 million a year just to complete that basic network on state highways by 2050. We also see that when we open up grant programs, we have massive requests for funding. The Safe Routes to School program had an application totaling five times the available funding. Next slide, please. What we know about public transportation is that we, as a state, made a significant investment with the creation of the statewide transportation improvement fund. But even that uh, creation of the STIF met only a portion of the need and over some period of time, we're going to fall back below that as the purchasing power of those dollars declines. This graph comes from the Oregon Public Transportation Plan, which looked at a baseline need uh, equivalent to the 2013 service levels, and then looked at a reasonable unmet need. The stiff for a little while is going to eat into some of that unmet need uh, before our overall transit service uh, falls back down into the, uh, just that baseline we set in 2013. And that's even before we look at climate, where we know we need to uh, probably triple transit service in order to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions we need as a state. Next slide, please. We need more money uh, in public transportation to expand transit operations. Uh, we also have a deficit in the funding to replace vehicles that ODOT is responsible for, about $5 million a year, short of what is needed to improve fleet conditions. And we also find that in a crucial area of public transportation, our passenger rail system, we really don't have a funding source that will allow us to increase frequency or improve reliability and travel times with capital investments in that. We barely eke by on funding the basic operations of our trains today. Next slide. In the area of multimodal freight, uh, we find that rail and marine projects are often critical for creation of jobs across the state. And yet there are extremely limited funding sources available, Connect Oregon being the primary funding source. Uh, Connect Oregon had fairly robust funding from uh, the legislature in the form of lottery bonds for its first 12 years, averaged about $35 million a year, which allowed us to make pretty significant investments across the rail and port and aviation systems and other parts as well. Now, however, uh, even with dedicated funding from HB 2017, unfortunately that amount is only about $11 million a year. So we do not anticipate that we'll be able to launch another Connect Oregon round of competitive grants uh, for another couple of years. Next slide, please. We talked earlier about how we oftentimes try to make the system operate more efficiently through investments in intelligent transportation systems and other technology that can maximize throughput uh, with technology and operational solutions. We found these can be a very cost-effective day to improve mobility and safety while reducing GHG emissions. Uh, and yet we, uh, we're, we're in the midst of deploying these operational solutions across the Portland metro region. We know that in the future, as connected vehicles hit the road, we'll have additional investment needs uh, to be able to serve those vehicles and gain that uh, efficiency of getting data from vehicles and providing uh, data to vehicles to improve mobility and operations. But as we deploy these across the system, we have more and more electronic devices that with a relatively short lifespan and that aging operations infrastructure increases, uh, increases our maintenance expenditures as well. Next slide. Modernization is also one of the major categories of funding that is used to uh, improve our highways 
to address the congestion that's been growing in Portland and other metro areas of the state, as well as some rural areas, due to our population and economic growth. Modernization can be part of a comprehensive congestion relief strategy that includes more transportation options, uh, includes tolling as a way to manage demand, and also includes operational solutions like intelligent transportation systems. What we've seen though in recent years is that most modernization projects have been funded from legislative earmarks, uh, whether at the federal or congressional, I'm sorry, federal or state level. There has been relatively little discretionary money in recent steps because the commission has prioritized safety and preservation of the system, and there has not been much left over after that. Next slide, please. So that gives you an overview of the content of the investment strategy. It's important to note that in the near future, the commission is going to be taking up updates to the Oregon Transportation Plan and the Oregon Highway Plan that will kick off later this year and continue through 2023. That will be another opportunity to uh, update and reset some of our investment strategies going forward as we look to the future. And with that, we'll go to the next slide, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions, questions. for Travis uh, on this segment? Any questions? Okay, I think in that Martin. Martin, go ahead. Uh, Travis, on the safety considerations that we're looking at, how much does law enforcement availability affect our safety programs? Commissioner Keller, that's a really good question and really important to note that uh, law enforcement is one of the significant deficits. What we've seen in recent years is that uh, we've been putting record amounts of money into fixing safety engineering problems on the roads, to make our roads more resilient and so that people can recover when they make a mistake. Uh, and yet we are seeing uh, more and more fatalities that seem to be behavior based, high rates of speeding, more DUIIs, uh, distracted driving being an epidemic. All of that goes to the fact that we have one of the lowest rates of having state police presence on our state highways of any state in the nation. And so as we've talked to the commission in the past, that is a significant factor in uh, the uh, safety uh, problems we have today and the increasing number of fatalities and serious injuries. We didn't include any note on that uh, in this investment strategy because uh, we really focus on the areas that are under the commission's purviews and you have very limited opportunities to, to allocate funding to law enforcement. Uh, but it is a very important part of keeping our roads safe. Well, I understand I understand the, the reason it's not in the investment strategy, but it seems to me that we should at least have a note in there that says something about the need for greater law enforcement availability, both at the state and probably the county level. Uh, just so it's noted as part of what the challenges are in the safety program. Mm -hmm. We would be happy to, to add that if the commission so desires. Thank you. Uh, I think on that suggestion, my own view is that's a good idea and uh, there's general support for it, we'll add it. But uh, we'll, we can get to that question and is when we get to the approval of the investment strategy. Are there other questions from the commission? Okay, hearing none, I think we should move then to uh, act on this item. Uh, so I would be looking for a motion for us to uh, accept the uh, Oregon Transportation Commission's 2020 investment strategy. I move for approval of the investment strategy for 2020. Is there a second, Commissioner Calgary's motion? Sharon Smith, I second. Commissioner Smith seconds. Further discussion on the item? Okay, hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Smith? Aye. 
Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Commissioner Callery? Aye. Commissioner Callery votes aye. Vice Chair Simpson? Orlando, are you on? I thought I was on. Now you're on. But I'm going to have to use the online because my phone is not working clearly. Uh, so, Mr. Simpson, your vote is? Aye. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very much. So, Travis, let's move on to the 21-24 um, STIP. Great, and we will turn it over to Mr. Flowers, who is going to walk through most of this item and bring in uh, Ms. Peets and Ms. Rowe as well to cover some elements. Great. Mr. Flowers, welcome. Um, to walk through the 2124, this uh, next slide, please, Michelle. So this is a step that has been in the works for over three, a little over three years now. And this is the final leg for us to get the, the document off the Federal Highway and Federal Transit Agency to be able to have an implementation date of October 1st. So as this slide indicates, this is our capital improvement program with our federal and state funds, a variety of programs, road work, et cetera, goes into this. Um, next slide, please. To kind of go through the, the funding assumptions that went in. This graph illustrates where our funding has, in, has been, and you can see where we've had dips that back in 2012 through about 2015 before the end of the uh, MAP 21 and the FAST Act came in. We built the 2124 with your permission based with a 10% reduction on our federal funds and with a little caveat to that, which I will touch on in one second. The reason we've done that is historically, we have not had a federal authorization as we build STIPs. The idea to do a 10% reduction provides us an opportunity to come back and revisit with you to deal with that if the funding level comes in higher, because we have found historically it is easier to add projects than it is to come back and have a difficult conversation as to which ones to cut in the event that we are in, those, in that boat. Everything in the STIP is at a 10% reduction minus one, element, minus one element, which is the funding that goes to the TMAs, or Portland, Salem, and Eugene, and the rest of the small MPOs. Any funding that has been dedicated to them, either through federal rule or through our AOC-LOC agreement, we have altered the, the math a little bit to ensure that they have a 2% growth rate in their math so that they can program their projects and their NSIPs accordingly with that so that they have the most flexibility in, in the event for the future. Next slide, please. So for the 2124, the commission approved six different funding categories, enhance, safety, non-highway, local programs, other functions, and fix it. The main functions behind these was to put the groupings of projects and, and work into these so that it was a little bit clearer for the commission to understand what you were approving. Um, in the past, we had not been as, as, didn't have that same clarity, so we wanted to provide a little bit more for that. Um, next slide, please. And the next slide indicates those funding levels at which each of the categories were funded. The majority of Enhanced dealt with our House Bill 2017 named projects. We did have a little bit of funding that went to the regions to be able to do some enhanced leverage opportunities on fix-it projects where they had an opportunity to go in and expand the roadway a little bit to add turn lanes, um, auxiliary lanes, et cetera, depending on the need of the region and the communities. Safety, the 10% or the $10 million a year, so it was about $30 million of House Bill safety funds is the House Bill 2017. Non-highway had a little bit extra too, our local programs as you can see, equates to quite a bit of numbers that we put in. This deals with our local bridge program, our money to, through the AOC LOC agreement to our small cities and counties, as well as small MPOs. The direct allocation from the federal funds that go to our three biggest MPOs of Portland, Salem, and Eugene. Other functions includes our planning functions, our indirect cost allocation program, which allows us to be able to recoup some of our overhead costs because it does cost us a little bit, but we can't 
directly charge a computer when a computer is used on multiple projects. So this allows us to capture that. And then the Fix It program, which was the big chunk of our federal aid program with our new house bill funds um, dedicated to the, to the bridge preservation and culvert activities. Next slide, please. This is a little bit of a timeline to kind of illustrate what has happened. So back in October of 2017, the 2018-21 STIP was put into effect. And at that same time, you can see where we have started the 21-24 STIP development. The commission approved the funding allocations in December of 2017, which then kicked off a two-year process to be able to put together the draft STIP, which you approved in January for public comment and allows the regions to begin to develop their project lists and priority lists to be able to fund the variety of uh, investments that we have in the step. As we get going forward, uh, as soon as we have your approval, we'll be able to submit the final document to Federal Highway and Federal Transit Agency. They will take the next couple months to ensure that we've got everything in compliance. They will give us an approval the last cycle. We actually got our approval about September 15th with a you know, with the caveat that we would start on October 1st, which is the first day of the federal fiscal year. So we're expecting the same, the same type of timeline this year. Um, with that comes about the same time as we're gonna start talking in the next presentation is the 24-27 STIP development. So you can see at any one time, we're always talking. We have a short period of three to six months where we have three STIPs in action at one time. So next slide, please. So back in January, the commission approved the draft step to go out for public comment. We submitted that for everybody and put out the press release immediately upon, upon that action. So we were open from January 24th until April 10th. This is almost, two, almost double up from what our federal requirements are. It's usually about a 45 day period. And as you can see, we went well over two months, almost three. So we had 11 in-person meetings as an agency, 211 members of the public showed up for those agency meetings. And this is not counting ACT members because we tag team those with our ACT meetings at the time. We developed something new this year was an online open house with a new public comment tool. And as you can see the online open house had 1,582 unique views throughout our open time period. The pie chart on the right provides you with actual comments received. So the STIP document has the public comment report for you to review in it. And so therefore you can see what the, the type of comments we've gotten from, from our public. Um, on that, I know that we have gotten a public comment that was submitted to the commission regarding the 2124 regarding one particular project. I'm gonna turn it over to Karen Rowe to address that one for you before I move on. Okay. Uh, Administrator oh, can you Rowe? Hear me? Sorry. Yes. Karen, sorry. are this you there? Karen Rowe? Yes, I can yeah, hear can you. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, sorry. I no had problem. to unmute the computer no and the phone. Okay, um, is this so the Carlton? Hi, commissioners. Is this the Carlton project? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, my name is Karen Rowe. I'm the Delivery and Operations Division Administrator. Um, you received comments on uh, Oregon 47 um, Carlton project. We had uh, previously, we had two STIP numbers in uh, the plan. We have combined them into one. And we've gotten a comment about that, um, as well as some misconceptions on what the project is and what, um, what the perception is from. So the comment is that why do we have, uh, why do we combine two into one and that the project out there, which is uh, 18746 OR 47 Main Street in Carlton, um, that they're not in favor of it and how did it, how did it get on there? Now, there, that project in particular combined um, what was 20240 Oregon 47 urban upgrade into one project. Currently, the project in the SIP is the intersections of Yam Hill and Main Street, as well as Main and Pine Street. Now, I do have Sunny Chickering on the line if you have more details. But in essence, the 
summary of what's happened is that there is a thought and a plan in coordination with the city of Carleton to uh, change the scope of that project to something different. However, what you're seeing in the SIP right now does not reflect that. So if there is a change in the scope of that project and possibly funding changes, it will come back to the commission on its own and not um, in this full SIP package. But right now, the project in there is just to um, rebuild the intersections of Yam Hill and Main Street and Main and Pine Street. Um, and that's the project currently in the SIP. So um, we have, ODOT has not changed the scope of that to reflect um, some of the coordination with the city, which would kind of reroute the state highway um, to another part of the city. So I just wanted to see um, ODOT will continue to outreach the impacted stakeholders and elected officials over the coming weeks and will clarify the facts and address any outstanding questions or concerns. So, so Karen, these comments that have come in that uh, are raising concerns, those comments, as I understand them, all relate to the potential future rerouting or proposal to reroute that would come to us. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. And so that is not in this proposal before us today. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so is there any objection from these commenters to the project uh, as presented to us today, the, the, the elements of the project which don't include the rerouting that are um, before us today? Are you aware of any? I think the problem is that the comments are don't say whether they oppose the existing project or not. They kind of are saying that they they are opposed to the project that they think it is. Um, I'll I'll turn it over to Sunny because he is coordinating with some of those comment people. Um, however, we just um, uh, started to reach out to them yesterday and today. So, okay. Sunny, do you have any insight on that? You have to unmute your phone and the computer. All right, we, can you hear I me? Think, can hear you, yeah. Sonny, and we can see you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Van Brocklin. Um, that is true. The testimony that was provided by uh, two property owners in the Carleton area uh, primarily concerns confusion over what the project in the STIP is and what the project in the STIP is not. Um, they do have concerns, I think, with the current project as well. However, um, I believe that those concerns can be addressed through our continuing conversations as well. Their primary objections have to do with the potential of going to a reroute option that specifically impacts their properties and um, some of their development concepts for the future. So, so would you recommend that we move forward with the proposal that doesn't include the reroute or that we give you a little more time for uh, community interaction and delay that approval of that one project for I, I don't know, some period, uh, probably not until the August meeting, but maybe, well, let's say uh, delay it a month till the August meeting, which would be preferable. Commissioner, I definitely recommend that you move forward with the project as it is in the final step today. And if and when, there's agreement reached on a reroute proposal, we'll have an independent conversation at a future commission meeting. Okay. I guess my question and I'd was- And I agree with that. Okay, Karen, thank you. I guess I, my question is, do you need uh, more time before we act even on what's here today? This does include the rerouting. Would it be better to have that dialogue prior to our acting? No, Commissioner, I don't believe that's necessary. Okay. 
Karen? Mr. Chair, I wonder uh, if I could jump in for the moment. Yeah. Uh, I know Ms. Stripper? Baker has a few. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, sir. Um, I know Ms. Baker has a few comments, and certainly as uh, Mr. O and Mr. Chickering are done, uh, kind of giving a little bit of explanation, I'd probably like Ms. Baker to kind of fold up um, some of her conversation and okay. where she thinks the direction should go. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, are, are there further questions of uh, uh, of Administrator Rowe or uh, Mr. Chickering on the on the uh, Carlton matter from commissioners? I don't have anything else at this time. Any, oh, any you're asking other commissioners? Yeah, I'm wondering if commissioners have questions of you or of Sunny. Okay, well then let's hear from, thank you, Karen, uh, and thank you, Sonny. Maybe stand by in case there's a follow-up. Uh, so I guess, uh, Lindsay, are you on? Deputy, I am uh, on. Direct, thank you, Deputy Mr. Director Mr. Uh, Baker? Yeah, good morning, uh, Chairman Brock and members of the Commission. For the record, Lindsay Baker, uh, Assistant Director for External Relations. So yeah, I just wanted to hop in really quickly because I know that this project in particular, this sort of uh, collection of projects has been uh, top of mind for lots of folks, and I personally have engaged uh, with some members, I think local electeds and members of the state legislature as well. Um, so I think uh, Karen and Sunny laid it out quite nicely, which is, I think, some of the public comments the commission has received, uh, which were objecting, I believe, um, to the, the combining of the two Oregon 47 projects in the 21-24 STIP. It's my understanding that the individuals who were so objecting were sort of conflating the thing that is before you all today in the 2124 stip with a conversation that's on a sort of separate and parallel track, but is not the conversation which is before you for consideration today. And I think that one is the reroute. So my recommendation, I think consistent with uh, Mr. Chickering and Ms. Rowe is for you all to move forward on adopting the 2124 stip as it's currently before you, which combines two projects. And then we are continuing to have a conversation around uh, sort of different reroute options that are separate and distinct from the projects currently under consideration today. And I think that, again, that's on a sort of separate track. Uh, and, and we're continuing to engage with city council, members of state legislature, uh, as well as property, property owners around, around that project. Uh, and we'll come to the commission and to the director um, in future months, I think, um, to continue that conversation. So just to provide a level of clarity, I think, around what it is that's before you all today versus what might be before you all at some point in the future, if that's helpful. Thank you, I, I think that is helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a question and then if there are other members of the commission wanna ask questions. My question is, uh, we heard particularly uh, in writing from uh, Senator Boquist, and I'm wondering if uh, you think the course you've outlined would be satisfactory uh, based on your conversations with him or interactions with him, with Senator Boquist, since he has specifically been active on this and we've seen correspondence directed at us, uh, I mean, addressed to us. So thoughts on Senator Bo Boquist's comfort level with us going forward? On the project? Mr. So absolutely. So I certainly am not gonna speak on behalf of Senator Boquist and I have not <laughs> had personal um, communication or contact with him uh, since some of the <clears throat> outreach that he did in the past, I think, 48, 72 hours. That being said, uh, I have had a number of conversations with him historically and with Representative Noble as well. Uh, and those really have centered on, again, not what is before you all today, which is the, up, the urban upgrade and then the Main Street paving, but on that separate and distinct kind of reroute conversation. So I believe uh, once that sort of level of, of clarity is arrived at and people understand what is sort of Project A, for lack of a better term, and Project B, uh, I believe that Senator Boquist would be comfortable with the process that we have uh, engaged so far on the reroute conversation, uh, and and to move for you all to move forward with adopting the 2124 step. Okay, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Assistant Director. Are there questions of uh, Ms. Baker, members of the Commission, or or uh, Sunny or Karen, either? This is Commissioner Brown. Commissioner I, Brown. I just wanted to, I wanted to thank the staff because I, I personally made a phone call um, asking specifics about this. And um, 
I am glad that they were able to lay, lay it out for the rest of the commission and, and speak to it because I thought it was very important that we get it on record what, what it was and I hope that the future conversations with everyone involved will calm down a little bit and they'll be able to articulate what it is they'd like. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful to know you've had some interaction and so we've got commission input as well. Uh, do you have any questions, Mr. Brown? Uh, I want to make sure if you do that you get to ask them. Okay, um, questions from others on the commission on the subject? Okay, great. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, so, Director Strickler, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Uh, or are we, uh, are we good to go on what's in front of us on the Carleton project? I think we are okay on the Carlton project, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And I believe uh, Mr. Flowers has just a few minutes to wrap up. Okay. Uh, and then we'll do what we can to get you back on schedule. Thank Great. you, sir. Uh, thank you. And I, I, I think Travis also said that we, that Amanda may have, uh, Director Peets may have something to say here as well. So I want to make sure we provide her with a little time. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so, sure. yeah. So, do we hear from her first, or should we have Mr. Flowers wrap up uh, his comments first? Well, the next slide is actually for Ms. Pete, so okay. I will turn it over to Amanda, and she Great. can take it from there, and then we can wrap it up for you, sir. Super. Amanda? Um, well, good morning, Chair Van Brocklin, members of the commission. My name is Amanda Pete. I'm the director of ODOT's new climate office. Um, so. Excited to be with you here today and talking about um, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program. I think many of you are familiar with the governor's executive order that came out in March. That's Executive Order 2004 on climate change, um, which included uh, direction to a number of state agencies to integrate greenhouse gas consideration and climate considerations into all aspects of business, including um, how we invest, plan, and maintain our transportation system. There was actually a specific requirement to uh, the Department of Transportation to integrate consideration of greenhouse gas emissions into the STIP decision-making process. And so as you're considering the 21 through 24 STIP before you, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about how that relates to this particular document. Um, we are in the process of developing a methodology to evaluate projects relative to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in the past, as projects have been selected, uh, climate has been one of the considerations, um, but not necessarily quantified as much or explicitly discussed as much. Um, so our effort is working on a methodology by which we can have some more solid information that we can provide to you as a commission that gives you a sense of how the projects or the suites of investments will increase emissions, decrease emissions, or um, keep them relatively steady so that can inform your decision-making process. Uh, we're working on trying to get that process up and running pretty quickly. Um, so as you'll see in, <clears throat> excuse me, my portion of the next presentation for the 24th through 27th step, um, we'll be going with you live through that process, um, making sure that we're providing it, <clears throat> excuse me, information on greenhouse gas emissions as you're making decisions along the entire way of that process. Um, for right now, given where uh, we are in developing our methodology um, and where the step is in terms of uh, the process of identifying projects um, and the public review, uh, we have not been able to do that at this time um, on the 21 through 24 set of projects. Um, one of the things we do plan to do with these projects that move forward is to look at how we can reduce the carbon footprint um, of how they're constructed. So looking at the types of materials that are used in the construction of these projects, as well as the types of fuels in the um, equipment that's used to build these projects. So that we're trying to lower our carbon footprint of construction and maintenance altogether. Um, we'll continue to partner with our regions to look for other ways that um, we can leverage these efforts to continue to mitigate for greenhouse gas reductions um, and influence this step cycle. Um, where you'll really see the big change, however, is in the 24 through 27 step 
along every step of that decision-making process. And I'll wait to talk about that a little bit more in that next presentation. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions or Chair Van Brocklin, if there's any thoughts that you'd like to make sure that we add um, to the climate piece of the SIP. So you and I have had a number of conversations about this since the executive order came out. And I guess what I would say is, uh, uh, we, as you mentioned, we did uh, the agency did have two specific charges, along with a number that were were more agent or statewide uh, multi agency charges. The two for us were enhancing electrification and uh, and this GHG uh, assessment tool or lens through which we assess the uh, GHG impact of uh, each S, each step project. So I guess it's a comment for you to comment on. And the comment would be that um, I think uh, even if even if at the beginning that that tool is somewhat imperfect, because I think we'll learn a lot from just starting to try and try and do this uh, work, this assessment of GHG uh, impact, that we begin to use one, uh, even if it's imperfect while we're developing it out. Uh, so that we begin to include in the discussion, uh, th and this is just my view, others on the commission may have different views, but uh, it, in order to be responsive to the uh, GHG provision, the specific to ODOT that is in uh, the climate executive order, I think we need to just begin to develop out something we can, can start using as soon as possible, uh, which would mean soon, and uh, then uh, use that to help us figure out uh, kind of as we're developing out the 24-27 STIP process, what refinements to that tool we need to make. But I, I, I think uh, my own view is we need to be responsive on this. Uh, the executive order has been out for a few months uh, and I would like to be, uh, I would like to exceed expectations on, uh, in terms of responsiveness on it, uh, again, even if, even if we're a little bit in the formative process uh, stage, uh, formative stages, we're uh, developing out the tool. So this is, I guess, more of a procedural comment. Uh, how, how do you see that coming along? If you, if you have any further insights into how that's going to develop, that would be great for us to hear. Sure. So um, excellent question and point. It was one um, I wanted to touch on a little bit in the 24 through 27 SIP. Um, and make the point that we're not going to have a perfect process by that point, um, but we're going to put something in place so that we're affecting decisions immediately. And that's really, I think, to your point, Chair Van Brocklin, the key is being as responsive as possible to this um, and trying to bring about um, better decision makings that lead to a cleaner Oregon for us. So uh, what we're doing currently is, um, I guess what I should say first, is we, the executive order calls for us to create a methodology by June of next year. But between now and then, you as a commission are making decisions on the step. You'll be making decisions for funding allocations. Um, our regions and our programs will be starting to identify projects. And so we want to make sure that we're providing information in real time as they're doing that and as you are doing that. So uh, we are looking at, um, the 18 through 21 step, the 21 through 24 step, um, to start to analyze projects to get a sense of what those projects' impacts are on greenhouse gas emissions and climate, to look at how those projects may or may not contribute to helping us to adapt and make a more resilient transportation system. Um, and we'll, we're learning from that in order to apply it as we're moving forward for the 24 through 27 step in looking at um, different scenarios and options <clears throat> and informing how um, the project list shrinks down to selected projects um, by being very explicit in how we're considering the impacts of each and every project on greenhouse gas emissions, on climate adaptation, and really affecting how we're making those decisions. So my hope is that by June of next year, it's not just a report on methodology. By June of next year, we're reporting on how we applied the process. To your point, what we learned from that process, because it won't be perfect, but we'll need to iterate and improve over time. Um, and even better, how did we make decisions differently and how did we come out with better decisions in the end? Because that's the accountability piece that I think is key to this as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's the right approach. 
Uh, I don't think because we have until June to do the methodology, we should take until June if we can do it more quickly. And I, I like the approach you've just described. I think that's uh, that's the kind of exceeding expectation idea that I was suggesting. So uh, let me turn to the other members of the commission if they have questions uh, on this subject uh, of uh, Director Peets. Uh, happy to have them now. This is uh, Martin Callery. Commissioner Callery. It's, it seems to me that we've had a similar discussion on the Rose Quarter project about how we're going to minimize environmental impacts, including GHG. And it seems that what we learned from that can be carried over to what we're trying to do with the STIP and for the climate office. And that's just my observation. Amanda? Yeah, so Commissioner Callery, I think um, that's spot on. We're trying to learn from other efforts that we've put into place. And I think um, what we also learn is not only how do we approach the analysis and um, the information coming out, but how are we working with stakeholders in coming out with the results for that? Um, and what types of projects do we need to, to spend a little bit more time in understanding the impacts of and the trade-offs and really um, developing a cooperative plan together to mitigate emissions where um, we do think that they might increase potentially. Thank you for that question, Commissioner. That's a great uh, comment. I appreciate your raising it. Uh, Vice Chair Simpson, do I hear you? You do hear me, I think. If you can. I do. Okay, great. I do. Um, <clears throat> Fire away. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda, on that update. And I kind of want to build up on Commissioner Callery's question as it relates to GHG, especially in, in more densely populated communities. Um, one, 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 but before I do that, Amanda, is, is, is the way in which we're gonna measure going forward, is that gonna be an internal process or are we gonna be working with an external consulting group or is there gonna be some kind of external entity that we work with on that piece? Yeah, so Vice Chair Simpson, we, um, we plan to do a combination thereof. So we're looking at hiring a consultant to support us. So the, the biggest key to our effort is the assumptions we make. So what types of projects might increase emissions? What types of projects might decrease emissions? We want to base that on the best available science, research, data, information. So getting that consultant support that's um, an impartial uh, entity that can really help ferret through the research out there, make sure we're having very sound assumptions as we're going through that is key. Um, as we apply the process, it's probably going to be a combination thereof because we're really trying to integrate it into our decision making process. Um, so that's not a standalone activity. It's informing every decision and every step of the way. So um, in that regard, we're really trying to transition it to a staff thing that's integrated into our day to day business. And then, uh, good. And, and then the, the other thing that I was going to highlight was, you know, prior to me being on the, uh, the OTC, I was on the Oregon Sustainability Board. And I know that there was a lot of interfacing. Uh, I think that's when I met uh, Margie at the time when she was uh, working for, for ODOT, who's over at Metro now. And um, I'm just curious about that interaction and that relationship amongst those state agencies. I know Sustainability Board is trying to look at ways to, to adopt principles around, you know, connect the, the connectivity between equity and climate change. And so I'm just curious whether or not if it's that is that one of those stakeholders that, that you're considering working with as a state agency or, or are they like ex external, you know, consultant companies? Right, so um, the Oregon Sustainability mm -hmm. Board is definitely one of the organizations we've had some conversations with to date um, in terms of the staff that supports that group and the chairs and vice chair of that committee um, to make sure that on all efforts related to mitigation and adaptation around climate that we're partnering together, we're leveraging uh, what each other is working on and kind of figuring out ways that we can develop some joint um, action plans. So uh, the greenhouse gas and projects lens uh, is an important one for the Oregon Sustainability Board. They've mentioned that before. Um, so we may have an opportunity coming up in a, in a few months to potentially uh, engage some of these groups with you as we talk about our implementation efforts and our implementation plans so that um, one, we're um, having the opportunity to, to really have that collaborative discussion with you um, on how we proceed, but also uh, I think illustrating those key partnerships that we're forming and moving forward with. 
So the other piece that I would just add is that, um, you know, in the short term, um, as processes evolve, again, it's not going to be perfect. We're going to put some things in place. We're going to, as staff and as consultants, make some assumptions and try those. And then over time, the improving that is really going to be through the vetting process. Um, and that will take a little while. I don't think we'll have that opportunity as easily now. Um, but I think an assurance or commitment from my office that we will be engaging partners like you're mentioning and others in vetting and making sure um, that we're in agreement in the direction that we're heading. Great. Can you can you do me a favor and, and maybe we we and Director Strickler, even Chair Van Brocklin, we, we 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 keep this conversation at the at something that's that's a little bit more consistent on our on our check-in process. Not only do I like to hear Amanda talk about these things, but also I just would like to know how how are things kind of planning themselves out as it relates to our other partners and stakeholders in this conversation. I think that's a good idea. I like that idea, and uh, we'll incorporate it in so we keep up to speed on this, since it uh, it relates to a number of things, including the executive order. And then my my last comment tied back to Commissioner Callery's uh, comments earlier related to GHGs. Um, I, I'm curious whether Amanda, if, if anybody has done an assessment on on, a, on our on our mode share percentages um, as a statewide agency. Because I feel like that's a baseline metric that we could utilize to try to address GHGs. Um, everybody believes electric vehicles are going to be the the magic, you know, wand that's going to fix everything. But the reality is, the electricity is still dependent on natural resources and fossil fuel type of energy. And so, and as we as we start building on that platform, I'm just I'm just curious whether or not if mode share especially in the more urban dense populated communities where people and goods and commodities and businesses can get moved around more efficiently i think mode share is going to be a very important conversation that we entertain going forward given the lack the, the the amount of investments that are going to be going into the urban communities and obviously just population growth as well into the um to the 21st century further into the 21st century so just curious about right that. so so one of the things we haven't had much of an opportunity to talk about yet with you is performance measures. Um, and so we're collaborating with other state agencies on performance metrics to evaluate how we're doing and what some of those key drivers are. So to your point, Commissioner Simpson, uh, one of those keys is mode share, um, the miles driven, uh, the, the volumes at certain times of day, what are our peak hours and what does our spread look like, um, the amount of electric vehicles in the fleet. So what we found through the statewide transportation strategy, and we know to be true, is there's no one silver bullet. So vehicles and fuels are not the be all and end all. There is a significant portion of the solution, about half the solution, because we know people will continue to drive and we need to facilitate people's access from point A to point B. So let's try to make that as clean as possible. Um, but for a number of reasons, we want to support uh, utilization and shift to low and no emission modes, biking, walking, public transportation. Um, so monitoring how we're doing and actually we provide the facilities, our education, our enforcement, all of those factors lead into people actually using those systems. So that's a key one to continue to measure. It also creates access and opportunity for all individuals. So it addresses some of our equity issues, um, helps to address some of our frontline communities and meet their needs. So it really is that multifaceted approach. Um, and so we're really trying to think comprehensively about all the different pieces that we need to move forward um, and then measuring against those to see how are we doing, where do we need to make some adjustments. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Sorry for all the questions. But no, not at all. Good questions. Good questions, uh, Commissioner. Thank you so much. And thank you, Amanda. I think we should try and wrap up this element. We have a decision point. So, uh, Mr. Flowers, if you have any closing comments, uh, Go ahead, and then I think we'd like to move uh, fairly quickly here to a commission discussion and an action on the the twenty one twenty four step. I will close up for you as quickly as possible. Michelle, can you have the next slide, please? And this is the last one. So, because of the uncertainty with the federal side, we're going to be coming back to you with a rebalance of the twenty one twenty four as soon as we've got more clarity. So that includes any COVID related issues and potential federal revenue replacement stimulus or a funding allocation or a funding authorization bill that exceeds what we've already forecasted. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Um, next slide, please, Michelle, and then I will turn it over to the commission. So any questions for Mr. Flowers before we deliberate? Okay, hearing none, uh, 
Uh, I would, this is Commissioner Callery. Yeah, Commissioner Callery. I just want to, I just want to compliment uh, Amanda Peets for the job she's doing. She's really jumped in there and taken a proactive approach to what we're trying to accomplish with the climate office. And I very much appreciate that as a, both as a citizen and a member of the commission. Thank you, uh, commissioner. Good comment and couldn't agree more. So, uh, we uh, are ready, I believe, for a motion to adopt the final or final subject to what Jeff just told us about uh, federal action. Final 2124 step uh, to submit that to the uh, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Agency for final approval. Do I hear a motion? This is Commissioner Callery, I, I move for approval of the 2124 step to move forward to the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Agency for their final approval. I have a motion. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Brown, I'll second. Commissioner Brown seconds for their discussion. I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Smith votes aye. Hold on. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Callery? Aye. Commissioner Callery votes aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Vice Chair Simpson? Aye. Vice Chair Simpson votes aye. The Chair votes aye. Approved. Thank you uh, very much. Good discussion. Good presentations. Thank you to the entire presentation team and for all the work uh, you've done to date on the step. And, uh, Appreciate very much all the comments. Very helpful. Uh, okay, uh, I, I think it's back to Travis. It's the same. I think it's the same. Uh, essentially, the same panel on the on the twenty four twenty seven step. So, uh, please uh, take us into that. We'll try to catch up here a little bit. Yep, we've got the same posse uh, doing the twenty four twenty seven step as we had for the previous item. So. This is the point where you pat yourself on the back for your completion of three years of work on the 21-24 step, and then launch right into the 24-27 step without a break. So uh, thanks for- Was that, Travis, was that it right there? That was the- moment. That was it. Yep, we that was your moment. Roses. We smelled yep. the roses. We're moving on. Yep. We got time to catch up. So- Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, just as a reminder, uh, I know you've seen this, this already, but really today we're focused on starting to develop the 24 27 step that includes all of the capital program funds, federal and state funds. But separate from that is the money we use to maintain and operate the system, the money we provide for uh, multimodal grant programs, as well as for the ODOT internal revenue program administrative regulatory functions. I will tell you though that in general, what we're going to do throughout this process. Uh, we found helpful last time was to show you some of those things that it may be outside the commission's uh, discretion in the step, but that may still be relevant. So, for example, uh, working in uh, the funding for the statewide transportation improvement fund as a complement to the money that you put in the step into public transportation. Next slide, please. So today's agenda, we have four specific items that we want to talk to you about and get your feedback and direction. The first is federal funding assumptions. This is key as the STIP is largely uh, made up of federal highway and federal transit administration funds. The second is to talk to you about the program categories and suggest uh, where you may want to uh, go with those categories uh, as a fairly light starting point because you can always change that later, but it's good to have some organization to the programs to think through this. The third is to continue the discussion on the approach we plan to take on climate uh, with Ms. Pete's uh, laying out uh, how we're going to go through a three phase process to incorporate climate into all of our decisions. And then the fourth is really to talk about our public and stakeholder engagement as engaging our advisory committees, the acts, the modal committees, MPOs, and the general public and other stakeholders It's really important uh, to getting good information that can help you make good decisions. So those are the four areas where we're gonna be asking you for feedback and direction. We'll go through each of these and then take a pause and allow for conversation before we move on to the next one so that we can make sure we get sufficient direction. 
This is an iterative approach. So your answers to these questions today will then allow us to come back uh, in August uh, and September and October and the December meeting uh, with further pieces of the puzzle. We really want to get a sense from you, what information do you need in order to make this very important decision about how the state will spend its money on the transportation system? So I'm going to start out with talking about federal funding assumptions. Next slide, please, Michelle. This slide shows you the challenges we're facing at the federal level with the Highway Trust Fund, showing the revenue flowing in in blue, uh, the funding flowing out in expenditures at the black line, and then the balance in a red line, which we'll use, you will see next year goes below zero. This is actually a chart that has not been updated, but just this morning I got additional information uh, that tells us that the balance in the Highway Trust Fund is actually several billion dollars worse off than had been previously projected. So uh, if anything, this chart will be worse, showing a slightly earlier point at which the Highway Trust Fund could go uh, into a negative uh, place. This is on the highway side of the uh, equation uh, where Congress has shoveled literally tens of billions of dollars of general fund money into the highway uh, and transit accounts in order to ensure that they haven't had to cut funding deeply. If, however, after the FAST Act expires this year, after the Highway Trust Fund runs out of cash, if Congress does nothing, then they will have to reduce funding for the highway program somewhere between a quarter and a third, and by the transit program by even more, probably in the range of 40 to 50%. So we always have to look out to the future as we're uh, allocating funds seven years into the future when we don't know how much federal money we're gonna have coming in three months from now. It provides a significant challenge. Next slide, please. In the past, we have worked with the commission to determine what sort of funding assumptions to make uh, in the long run after the expiration of a uh, service transportation authorization bill. Uh, and in the, the last couple of steps, what the commission has chosen to do is to take about a 10% reduction from current funding levels uh, from in any future year in which there is not a surface transportation authorization in, ex, uh, in place. So what we see uh, in this chart, and one of the reasons why we go back more than a decade here, is to show you what happened in a similar situation back in 2009, 10, and 11. After uh, Safety Lou, uh, a long-term surface transportation bill expired, funding actually fell pretty substantially for a number of years. And in fact, when I looked at the actual numbers of dollars that came into the state, uh, from in 2010, we reached a peak that we did not reach or exceed until 2020. So throughout that time, we actually saw funding dip below those levels. So we know that uh, it is possible that Congress may not be able to find a way to keep funding at its current level in the future. And so in the last round, the 21-24 step, the commission took a 10% reduction from current funding levels <clears throat> with the idea that uh, it is always easier to add projects than to cut them. The commission had previously gone through some painful processes of having to cut projects in the STIP. And so we would propose to you that you consider that going forward, we would continue uh, that flatlined assumption about federal funding. This really uh, seems to us a fairly prudent risk mitigation approach that allows you to pivot in either direction uh, and add projects as necessary. The last time that the commission took this up in uh, 2017, what the commission decided to do was provide direction <clears throat> to ODOT on how to spend any money that comes in over this level. Uh, we could do that again so that we would bake into the cake uh, a decision from the commission or some direction from the Kish commission about how we would uh, direct funding that came in over and above this level. Of course, if Congress were to pass uh, something like the Invest Act that Chairman DeFazio is working on, we would be coming back to you in the very enviable position of having to update the STIP uh, and provide more money. And that would uh, give us the opportunity to have a larger public discussion. We did that actually when the FAST Act was passed. We came back with a, a pretty significant STIP update in between our three-year STIP cycles 
that had a very public conversation about how to spend that additional money. So what I will tell you is I would say you, you have, uh, obviously can give us any direction you want about the assumptions around federal funds. The two most likely options are one would be just a flat line at current federal funding of about $500 million a year, or two, uh, continue to flat line at the assumed level, which is just shy of a 10% reduction. I should note that, uh, in 2019 and 2020, the funding came in below what had been authorized in the FAST Act. Uh, and so as a result, it's only actually about a 7% reduction from the funding levels today uh, would be what the assumption is in the next step. And that's you know one of the reasons why we do that is oftentimes, if we were to build the step to the authorized level, funding does not come in at that level, even with an authorization in place. So it's a little bit good to have a cushion there uh, to be able to, to cushion that loss of funding. So with that, I will pause and we'd be very interested in getting your feedback and direction about whether to continue current practice or uh, take some other approach to addressing this uncertainty and risk around federal funds. So comments from the commission. This is Commissioner, Commissioner Callery. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, go ahead. Commission, Commissioner, why don't we hear from Commissioner Brown and then Commissioner Cowery? Well, I think that this kind of addresses the concerns from the MPOs about what to do in the future. And I think that we probably should think a little bit about how we can address it. But I think that Travis brings up something that's in question is with the reauthorization and going forward, um, with the Transportation Act, you know, there may be additional dollars and we're going to be revisiting this again. So I don't know that at this point that we have to come up with a plan just because I think we will revisit it. Because I'm going to be optimistic and say the federal government's going to come in with additional dollars. Good comment. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cowery? Well, I'm I guess I'm not as optimistic as Commissioner Brown. I think there are too many unsettled issues in, in D.C. Uh, we've got a, an election coming up. Uh, I agree that we need to keep it at a redu reduced level. It, I think it's prudent for us. And yes, I've read the comments from the coalition of MPOs and from Metro, and I understand what they're trying to do. Everybody's got projects that they want to see vetted and then included, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we're doing the best thing for the budgets that we are responsible for. So I, I support the 10%, or actually, as Travis said, close to 7% reduction. I think it's just a prudent act. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Smith, Commissioner? Uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Smith, I just had a, a couple yes, comments. Ahead. Thank you. I, I agree generally that, you know, at this point, let's take a moderately conservative approach and go with the 10% reduction. I do think we may see some action within the next couple of months um, from the federal government. I also acknowledge that we are in an election year, so it, we may not have any big action until after that. Yeah. Um, uh, however, uh, the one thing I think we should keep in the back of our mind is, in the event the federal government decides to go forward with some kind of transportation funding, in the past sometimes they've done it in a, it has to be shovel ready um, approach. And so we should be mindful that we don't want to be too far behind the curve on planning uh, in the event that that's how the funding rolls out. So I, I agree right now, let's take this approach and revisit it depending upon what we start hearing and seeing coming out of the federal government in terms of funding. Good comment, Commissioner Smith. Uh, Vice Chair Simpson? I think I'm gonna have to second, especially uh, well, the comments that everybody just mentioned, but specifically Commissioner Smith, just as I really see uncertainties coming down the pike and I mean, outside of that, we have other <laughs> severe uncertainties that we 
are completely unaware of in the, in, in, in the near future. So I think take a big conservative approach is probably the most um, logical step, but also just the most uh, responsible step uh, as a, you know, as an agency that represents public, public money and public resources. So I, I agree with those comments. I, I think we should uh, with, go with the status quo, which is the 7% or 9% or whatever it is, uh, the line that is on this chart in front of us uh, that uh, uh, Assistant Director Brower is suggesting. I, and I also agree with Commissioner Smith. I think um, the way these things oftentimes come up is that you need to act quickly, make sure you've got your place. Uh, pegged so that you, to the degree there's discretionary funding that we're competing for, of course, we're in a good position given where some members, particularly Representative DeFazio, sit uh, in the Congress, but still. So I, I think of it as a uh, relatively conservative 10%, roughly 10%, uh, whatever that line represents, uh, down uh, approach plus uh, contingency packages that can move forward uh, and that we're getting in place. And I'd like to have a further report on that contingency piece uh, in August, and it can be quick. But I think we need to keep track uh, of this because I think when it moves, it will move. Um, and um, obviously COVID and the severe recession and all, there are so many things moving here. Uh, how they coalesce or converge or how they don't that will determine timing on the funding. I would say one last thing, which I've said many times since I joined the commission and before I joined the commission, which is the federal government needs to get back into this. We're, we're having to spend, we don't have enough money even to do the blue roads on preservation on the map that we were shown. We have, uh, we have an I-5 project that is one of our named projects uh, with other than as we stand up tolling, no identified funding. We have a uh, Rose Quarter project that is uh, underfunded, and um, we have an interstate bridge project that is yet to be funded. Uh, and I think we're not going to see the kind of capital we're going to need without federal assistance and substantial federal assistance. So we need them to repartner with us uh, as they have in the past and be, be a major funding factor. Uh, in order to really, I think, address the what the investment strategy tells us, a uh, document we passed earlier this morning is significant uh, underfunding of transportation in the state. So is that, do you have what you need, Travis? Yes, commissioners, absolutely. I have what I need. That was great feedback. We will continue to go with this uh, flatlining of our current assumptions. Uh, and we can August and give you an update on where things are at the federal level we have obviously been uh, taking those approaches to look at shovel ready projects should there be a revenue relief or stimulus package and as jeff noted earlier uh, we plan to come back this fall to look at a rebalance of the stip based on at that point uh, a little bit of reduced uncertainty we will have another revenue forecast that will tell us where we're at with covid and at that point this fall we will be uh, past the expiration of the fast act and also uh, really passed the action of uh, where Congress would have taken action this uh, congressional session. So we'll have a better sense of whether there's been a surface transportation bill uh, and can then make firmer plans for the future. Okay. So now Chair I will. Rand, yes. I just wanted to state for the record, I don't think I articulated myself well, and Martin thought I was saying that. Um, we shouldn't do a reduction. What I was saying is the MPO is asking what happens if the revenue is coming higher. And uh, the piece that I wanted to make clear was I think we should have a process in place if the revenues do come in higher or if there's a transportation package that we have a plan on how we're going to allocate those dollars mm -hmm. out. And I think the request from the MPOs was that we had a process that wasn't so quick that they couldn't turn around projects in a, in a short timeline. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. I do believe we should go with the 10% reduction. Okay, great. It sounds like we're all together on that and we're all also together on doing some 
preparatory work to be able to take full advantage of federal funding if and when it comes kind of at a moment, moment's notice. So I'd, I'd like that, that to be a part of what we hear in August is how we're going to do that and when it's going to be ready and maybe even come back uh, when you've got it done and report out what's, what's in it. So mm -hmm. that we're up to speed as we, we have periodic contact with members of Congress uh, and congressional staff that we and we're asked, well, if we got this, what would you want that we could say, well, we want this? Yep. We can absolutely do that, sir. Uh, with that, we can go to the next slide and we'll transition over to Mr. Flowers. Okay. I think uh, just so everyone knows is following our agenda, I think we'll skip our break unless there's a lot of hue and cry about doing that. We need the time and just push through to lunch and hopefully we can get through all of our items by 1220 or so. So uh, let's keep moving this ahead as quickly as we can. I'm sorry to interrupt here. Um, closed captioner here. I am going to need the 10 minute break. I, I can't um, just go to the bathroom and things like that. So okay. I can try to find someone to take over captions, but okay. I'm, I'm not able to give up a 10 minute break for a seven hour. Drop. Okay. Okay. But um, I'll see if I can get someone to take over for those 10 minutes. Okay, well, please let us know. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Mr. Chair, I think we should take a 10 minute break. I think everybody needs a bio break. Okay, what's the rest of the commission want? I'm fine to do it uh, if there's no objection to doing so. Let's make it a seven minute break, an eight minute break. Let's get back together at uh, 11. Can we do that? Yep. All right, we're in break till 11. And Travis, maybe you can group up with your, uh, with your panel and see what you can do to kind of move the rest of this forward as efficiently as possible. Sorry, we've gotten behind. Uh, this is important stuff though. I don't want to short shrift mm -hmm. it too much, so. Uh, well, uh, maybe we can make it up in the items uh, after that, items G and H. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, yep. for, we'll be back at 11. Thank you.
Okay, are we ready to get uh, get going again? Yes. Commissioners? Travis is back. Commissioner Cowery, I see you. Back. I see you. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner uh, Brown? I'm yet. here. Commissioner Brown. Good. Great. Uh, Commissioner Simpson? Lando, are you back? Sharon, are you back? Chair Van Brocklin, I should note, I think we can get relatively quickly through the remainder of this uh, presentation on the STIP. Okay. We already significantly on the climate aspects, and so yes. I'm going to cover that fairly briefly. And yeah. uh, that's one that there's going to be multitudes of opportunities to discuss that in future meetings as well. Okay. So a preview of coming attractions. The same is the case on the funding categories where we'll lay out what those funding categories are and then uh, get any direction, but you know we can continue to use those funding categories unless uh, the commission wants us to change. And then the same is the case on the public engagement and stakeholder engagement plan. Uh, that will be an iterative process where we continue to develop that and can take comments from the commission anytime. So we okay. welcome your comments today, but don't need to have a uh, lengthy discussion because we can adjust that as we go along. That sounds great. And maybe on Amanda's piece, we can just have her up for more Q&A if there is any. I think we covered that fairly well um, earlier. So, okay, Commissioner uh, Smith, are you back? I'm here, I'm here. Great, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Simpson? I'm here. Okay, great. All right, let's get started then. Travis, go ahead. I will actually turn it over to Mr. Flowers, who will talk to you us about the program categories fairly briefly. Mr. Flowers? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I uh, can hear you fine. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Um, on the screen, you will see the same categories that we just discussed at the 2124 discussion. Um, we would like to use the same categories moving forward and be able to just update the numbers accordingly, bring those scenarios back for you in the near future, um, unless we hear otherwise from you today. Okay, uh, response from the commission members to those categories in front of you? Comfortable going with those? Yes. This is Commissioner Calvary. I'm, I'm fine with those categories. Okay. I'm fine. Okay, great. Anyone, uh, Lander, are you good with them? Yep. Okay. Uh, we're fine with those. Thank uh, you. I guess and I would just say conditioned on our being able to, if we identify something new that we want to, a new category we want to move some things into, we can do that. But uh, let's work from this list. Yes, sir. 
So Travis, I'll we'll turn it back over to you. And now we have Amanda back to talk about uh, climate. She's already covered some of this in her previous discussion. So if she has any additional thoughts to raise, uh, next slide, uh, Michelle, and then the slide after that. Uh, she, this one, perfect. Uh, and she can uh, answer any questions for you as well. Okay. Director Peets. So, oh, I uh, see Chair Jerry. Ben <laughs> There you are. I'll try to keep this pretty brief because um, we have covered quite a bit, but I have pretty pictures I'd like to show. So <laughs> um, really what I just wanted to illustrate is we have a, a three stage process that we have planned. So this is more around what to expect for the 20 more, 24 through 27 SIP. Um, we've got a number of talented folks across the agency working really hard on figuring out how we can quantify and evaluate uh, the different projects and the different investment scenarios. So what we plan to do in stage one um, in the next decision point that you will have before you as you think about program funding scenarios and how much goes it into the categories that you just approved, um, we will be looking at those across uh, different outcome areas. Certainly climate is one of those, so the greenhouse gas emission side, um, as well as adaptation and resilience. Um, but we're also looking at um, helping to round that out by uh, providing some of the other outcome areas that you all are developing in your priorities and goals um, and providing information on those as well because all investment decisions are a trade-off across categories so that will give you a better sense of um, how different um, amounts within different categories can uh, affect some of the outcomes that you care about. So uh, that's something we'll be working on uh, and providing to you later this fall as you consider uh, your funding distribution. Next slide. The, okay, thank you. Uh, the other two stages um, is what the second stage is internal, really, to ODOT staff. So as ODOT staff um, and working with our area commissions on transportation, our modal advisory committees, and others, start to identify projects and narrow those down, we want to make sure that um, we're narrowing those to with the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions in mind. And so we'll be providing information along that um, part of the decision making process to come out with um, an optimal mis mix of projects that really has taken into account trying to minimize um, greenhouse gas emissions and reduce those where possible. And then the third and final stage is more of that public facing kind of back to the commission stage where we're providing an accounting for what the various projects in the SIP result in in terms of emissions, um, focusing on certain project types in particular, but uh, mostly at a programmatic look um, and assessing other factors. So as Travis mentioned, um, this will really evolve and come before you in the coming months. Um, and I can speak to that a lot more as well. But I think our overall goal in all of this work is to try to decrease emissions where we can across our overall investments. So with that, I'll turn it back to Travis. Okay. Um, uh, 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 this is Jerry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so the next slide is actually your involvement. So um, just real quickly, um, I think the steps are pretty similar to what we've done in the past. So um, advisory committee engagement, so this would include our area commissions on transportation, our MPOs, our modal committees. Uh, we actually met for the first time uh, with the staff that support all of them just last week, kind of going over the schedule of what um, the next four months are going to look like so that they really had an opportunity to think about what their schedule looks like if they need to hold special meetings. Uh, those types of things. Um, we obviously will hold, will um, provide updates. So we'll summarize what happened, the direction we get from the commission this meeting, um, and we'll continually do that. Um, we'll be in front of you on the SIP stuff every month between now and our December meeting, and we'll summarize uh, what goes on there, make sure that information gets out to our advisory committees, as well as to other um, folks that are interested, right, using a variety of different lists. Um, we've done a survey in the past. We'll do one uh, for the last SIP. We'll do one for this SIP. Probably will happen between now and the, at least start it uh, right after this commission meeting. Probably won't have the results for the August meeting, but really looking at what the spending priorities are. It's something that we do um, anyway as part of our uh, needs 
um, survey that we do every two years, this will be sort of a follow on to see uh, how those two line up. Um, we also do an online survey. So you heard uh, Jeff talk about that a little bit, but that will probably come in the fall when we um, have a better sense of what the scenarios are looking like so that people can provide uh, some comments on that. So the big point is that we really are trying to look for all of those opportunities to see um, some public uh, comment continuing throughout this process. One of the things that we'll probably want to be thinking about in the future is whether or not there's an opportunity to bring our advisory committees um, back. Uh, we've done that, you know, sort of as part of the October, November uh, workshop scenario, but obviously uh, virtual and a whole variety of different things going on um, right now make that um, something that we'll probably want to discuss um, in the not too distant future. So uh, next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the, the next slide was put, there we go, thank you. On the big questions, I'm not gonna go over these. This is just really, given the conversations we've been having, you, we're gonna challenge you to think about where do we dedicate our funds, right? Non-highway, low program, what's the appropriate funding level for highways, um, and what does that split look like? Those are just, I think, some of the uh, bigger questions that we recognize that you're going to be challenged to ask, um, but we'll probably get into more of those, which really sort of leads me to the next slide um, to really talk about what the um, schedule looks like. Um, so, as I mentioned here in July, um, we're really been talking about the funding categories and we talked about the federal funding. You guys uh, gave us some direction there. Um, as we go through the fall, we're really going to, what we envision in August, do sort of a, um, what we call a funding primer, so you really get a sense of where the money has gone. Also, sort of what the history has been of what's um, really discretionary um, that you all have and perhaps um, what's not as discretionary. Um, in September, we'll probably bring back those that first uh, scenarios and what they look like. Obviously, as we go through this, this will be really key in some of the work that Amanda's been doing um, as she thinks about how do you uh, integrate climate, so um, which has not been something we did with the 21-24. Um, I think in September, as we talk a little bit about the scenarios, get a little bit into some of the consequences, right, of, of some of what the decisions possibly could be. October, we'll come back really fine-tuning based on the direction we get from you. Um, with regards to the scenarios, as I mentioned, maybe that's an opportunity to talk to some of our um, advisory committees. Um, and then depending on the direction we get from there, I think the hope is that in December, we'll have fine-tuned um, the preferred scenario enough that you'll be able to gavel down on the um, program level. Um, and that will allow us to really sort of jumpstart the 24-27 step. So, I think with that, the, we're done. I think the next slide says questions. So I will turn it back to Travis and to the chair. Yes, and commissioners, this is your time to provide us any feedback on what you've heard, ask us any questions, or send us off, in particular, if there are things that you will need to know in order to make good decisions, uh, information, or questions you want us to ask and answer in future meetings. Great time right now to do that. Uh, so that we can bring those back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Questions Mr. from the commission. Mr. Chair. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Um, at, at what level or uh, how do we factor into our funding decisions some geographic um, considerations to make sure that we are spending uh, money appropriately across the entire state with a mind to urban versus rural considerations. Where does that factor in, if at all, in, in this analysis? Commissioner, that, that's a great question. And uh, I'll take a stab and then uh, if, if Karen Rowe is still on and would like to add anything, she may do so. So it depends on the programs. Typically, uh, in most of our fix-it programs, and safety programs, the project selection are based on not so much geographic equity or spread across the state, but where are the management systems? Where's the data showing us we need to make the investments to preserve the system or improve its condition? 
that generally ends up with a pretty good mix of urban uh, versus rural uh, projects. Within the uh, enhanced side, generally we have what is called a modernization uh, distribution formula that does ensure that money flows out to each of the uh, regions of the state uh, so that we're, we're spreading the money between urban and rural. That, of course, these are, these are decisions that the commission gets to make, uh, particularly on any funding that goes into modernization type programs or other areas is how do you want to target it? Uh, should it be with some level of regional equity? Should it be to the highest priority projects, regardless of location or by some other means? So those are all things we'll take your input on as you go through this program development process and start both setting aside money for programs and setting the framework by which that money should be allocated among projects. Okay, follow up, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, so it, it may be, we can maybe save this for another time, but it, maybe an offline conversation. I'd like to understand more what the factors go into this sort of balancing for, for the second category and maybe you and I can just have a discussion rather than waste, you know, stay, take time now. Yeah, and I should note, we'd be very well uh, uh, willing to sit down with any members of the commission if you want to go into a deep dive on any specific questions or just in general. So Commissioner Smith, we'll follow up and we'll set something up and we can walk through all these questions and provide you probably more documentation information than you want, but we'll uh, we'll make sure you get what you need. And don't, for, don't and forget, I'm a nerd. <laughs> and this is Karen Rowe. Um, coming from Colorado, we usually showed how that did break out. Um, what I have understood from once we get the funding scenarios and the data, though, is um, we want to make sure that this is a data-driven project so, or process. So again, Travis hinted at it with the Fix-It program. We need to make sure we're fixing things um, that need it the most or have the most benefit to the cost. Um, but I do think that you need to balance that geographical equity is what I look at it um, from many, from staffing perspectives to bidding perspectives to um, a, a lot of different things, not just rural versus urban, but um, where, so bridges and roads, and then you have culverts and things like that. So it's a, it's a balance between where is it needed and, and how do you balance it out geographically? That, that's my perspective as we move forward in the next tip cycle. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, other questions? Uh, or comments? Okay, well, it, this is only the beginning, obviously. We're going to be talking about this constantly going forward. So, uh, look forward to it and appreciate uh, the comments of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Travis, for emceeing that. Any uh, final comments you have to make or want to make sure we hear before uh, we go forward uh, with action on this? No, commissioners, uh, we appreciate your insight and input, and we will have many more opportunities in front of you really for the next four meetings. We'll be uh, continuing to iterate on this until we get to a final decision. So you've given us what we need for today, and we're, uh, we'll continue to educate and uh, work you through this decision-making process. So, Travis, do you actually need an action here, or do you no. have what you need? Okay. No, we have what we need, uh, Chair uh, Van Brocklin. What we're really looking for today was just that sort of general direction, uh, particularly okay. on the funding assumption and then uh, any feedback on those other areas. Uh, all of those other areas, though, will be ones we'll go into greater depth. And so you can you don't feel as though your time has passed in this very brief uh, last few minutes that we've had. You will be able to continue to give us direction on climate, on uh, program categories, as well as on our uh, public engagement uh, throughout this process. Okay, great. All right, uh, so thank you again. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, the uh, ARB, the agency request budget. And uh, I think we have Stefan here with us, is that correct? Stefan, 
I can, I think, hear you. Is that you? There you are. Yes. Um, Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Welcome. Chair Van Brocklin uh, and members of the Commission. Um, my name is Stephen Hamlin. I'm the ODAP budget officer, and I would like to um, present our proposed budget to you and seek your approval for us to submit it to DAS at the end of the month. So I have a, a slide deck here to walk you through, and at the end, I will be asking for your approval. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so the timeline is that we have to submit our budget, uh, the dollar amounts at the end of July and uh, for our agency request budget, and then our full budget narrative documents by the end of August. Um, then uh, the next part of the budget cycle will turn to the governor's budget, and um, that is due December 1st uh, from the governor's office. So we'll be working with the governor's office through the fall to make any changes that our governor would like to uh, put into the ODOT budget. And then in the spring um, and through late June, the legislature will um, consider our budget and then approve it. Usually the budget bills are done uh, very late in the session, so we um, anticipate approval from the legislature in late June of next year. Uh, next slide, please. So as we look at our budget and we compare it to our existing budget, we see that we've increased our budget by 6.75%. Uh, most of that, uh, the way we are build our budget is we look at our current service level. Um, uh, basically what that means is we take the budget from last biennium and we uh, follow DAS um, procedures of inflating it phasing in and out different components of our budget to get to um, our proposed new budget. And so um, we're going from 4.5 billion to about 4.8 billion. Um, I would note that uh, these figures do not include any refunding that we do on our um, bonds. And uh, so uh, uh, we did have some refunding that we um, have done and that um, we'll change our budget as we do those, but um, we do anticipate we might be doing another refunding this year to take advantage of um, the low interest rates that we have uh, to save us money in the future. So that might be a future uh, agenda topic before the OTC. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So without policy option packages, our budget is up about $274 million. Um, our revenue is, um, we're seeing a slow growth in our revenue and the latest revenue forecast, which just came out about a week ago, um, we did see another hit due to um, the uh, current uh, environment with COVID. Um, this presentation um, was built on pre previous to that but we have looked at the revenues and they are still growing, but even more slow than what we had built this presentation to. Um, so we are seeing, uh, or I'm sorry, we are proposing three policy option packages for a total of $32 million, but no new positions are being requested at this time. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, as we compare to the current biennium and what we are proposing for the next biennium, we see that our personal services is up by about $108 million and our services and supplies is up by um, about $180 million. On the next slide, we show that our capital outlay is down by about $24 million and our special payments are up by about $20 million. Um, and that the special payments are mainly due to the new payroll tax um, for in transit, um, where we are passing most of those dollars to um, our local public transit providers. On the next slide, I would like to show you the three policy option packages that we are proposing. Um, the first one there listed is the Meacham Maintenance Station. This $12 million funding is um, going to complete that maintenance station 
And uh, we are actually uh, moving the funding uh, from an, um, a project on the Central Coast that we are canceling at this time. So we're moving existing funding from the Central Coast Maintenance Station to the Meacham Maintenance Station. So um, we are shifting the, the funding here. It's not a technically a new ask. Um, the second uh, policy option package is um, replacing HVAC systems within regions three, four, and five. We have a number of buildings that we will be able to um, replace HVAC systems in. And then uh, the third policy option package is a continuation of funding the South Coast Maintenance Station. Um, this is the next set of uh, funding that goes there. We um, anticipate that that one is going to um, be uh, close to $40 million when we're all said and done. It is part of our seismic triage um, maintenance station, so it is going to end up costing us uh, more than what a normal maintenance station will cost, but it is part of our um, response to the southern coast um, in case of a seismic event that would um, be, this maintenance station would be used as a um, place where we can um, deploy um, uh, materials to um, local communities that may be cut off from the valley or from um, uh, uh, from the interstate uh, system. Okay, on the next slide, um, so the actually the next number of slides are the actual divisions and how they are changing. So I can go through these fairly quickly or take uh, the time to, to walk through them. So I will um, try to do these as quickly as possible. Um, so this first one, the Delivery and Operations Division, which is our former highway division, um, you can see is going from um, $2.7 billion to $2.9 billion. Um, a lot of that increase is due to Hospital 2017 and the step that were, the projects that were um, uh, constructing. Um, and our FTE count is staying relatively the same for this division. On the next slide, we're looking at the uh, Driver and Motor Vehicles Division. Oh, and I should say, um, I'm sorry, on the previous slide, Delivery and Operations Division, that's um, managed by Karen Rowe. And um, so um, she's in charge of this portfolio. So on the um, next slide, number nine, the DM, uh, DMV Driver and Motor Vehicle Division, which is led by uh, Tom McClellan, um, we see that uh, general inflation is uh, generally what's in here and the um, final stages of the modernization, the SDP project um, that they're going through. Uh, they've had a very successful launch of, the, um, of, the, of their system here um, earlier this uh, last week. And um, uh, so I think um, there's more to come on that for you guys at a future update. Um, you do see an FTE reduction between the current biennium and the next biennium. Uh, that is due to um, we received a lot of limited duration positions to staff up for Real ID and for um, uh, House Bill 2015, the legal presence bill, and we um, we will not need those next bindings. So those, those uh, limited duration positions are being phased out. On the next slide, the Commerce and Compliance Division, which is led by Amy Ramsdale, uh, we see general inflation um, and the FTE count pretty much stays the same. Uh, next, we have the Policy Data and Analysis Division on the next slide. And this is uh, led by Jerry Bohard. And we see, again, uh, an increase, um, which is general inflation. But we also see a decrease here of um, some of, uh, as we have implemented the reorganization that was announced last fall, um, some um, positions are being moved out of this division and into other divisions. Um, I would also like to note that uh, the policy data and analysis division does house the Connect Oregon program in it. and. For the proposed budget for this next biennium, that's um, roughly $78 million of this $194 million is for the Connect Oregon program. The 
Next two slides are the public transportation program led by Karen Criswell. Uh, the first one is the public transit program. Um, and we see, uh, it, again, increases for um, general inflation and we have um, shifted a few positions around for the reorg. Um, and, uh, uh, and then on the following slide, the rail program, again, still part of public transportation, um, we do see an increase here. Um, again, mostly general inflation. Um, this program in particular, the rail program, we were not able to um, handle the uh, reorganization. Um, so we've worked with staff and LFO to do this part of the reorganization with the next budget build. Um, the uh, gross revenue, uh, uh, revenue for the rail program, um, needing to pull all that apart and make sure that we do that correctly we didn't have the time to really do that this time. And so we, we have worked with uh, both DAS and LFO to um, give us the time to do this properly. And then we will be coming back with the next budget bill to uh, fully reflect the reorganization that was announced last November. On the next slide, we have the Transportation Safety Division, which is led by Troy Gustalis and uh, again, um, this one is relatively staying the same, this division. Um, on the next slide, the Support Services Division, which is led by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Robert Gephardt. We um, do see a decrease in dollars and an FTE, but this is mainly due to the reorganization. This, um, this division uh, used to be called Central Services Division and has now been split into three, the Support Services Division. And on the next slide is the ODOT Headquarters Division, which you will not see any uh, dollars for the um, first two bindings listed there. This is a new structure. And so part of the decrease you're seeing in Support Services went to this new budget structure. And then on the following slide, the next slide, we have the Finance and Budget um, Division. And so there, is the balance of what we have taken our support services division. Um, these, both these are the two new structures. And, um, uh, and so that's something that we've worked with DAS to make sure we have these two new structures lined up. On the next slide, we have debt service. And you can see that in the current biennium, we have done some refinancing. That's why the budget is so much higher than in the previous biennium and in the proposed budget. We usually have, we build our budget um, not anticipating refinancing. Um, if we do refinancing, then we go to the legislature and get their approval to do so, and then our budget gets adjusted. So um, we will, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at potentially taking, um, uh, looking at the current interest rates and taking advantage of the low interest rates to possibly save us a lot of money as we uh, look to refinance some of our bonds. Um, so on the next slide, we have a debt service um, uh, graphic that shows how much our debt service has grown over the past um, two decades. So back in 2000, we had relatively speaking very little debt that we had to pay. And over the uh, different acts that have passed, the OTA, the Jobs and Transportation Act and, and um, now House Bill 2017. Um, we've also done some facility and go um, general obligation bonds. Um, those have uh, driven our annual uh, debt service to um, currently just under $250 million and it'll grow um, uh, just a little bit more um, for the next number of years. That's an annual uh, amount that we have to pay, and those are state funds that we have to pay. We are um, not allowed to use federal funds to pay these, and so part of the long-term financial discussion that Travis will be having um, after this uh, agenda topic will focus on the fact that we, um, this, this is one of the pieces of the, of the puzzle that deals with our um, financial situation that we're looking at in the long run. A couple more slides. On the next one is our OTIB, uh, the Oregon Transportation Infrastructure Bank. Um, this is uh, a bank where we allow locals to borrow money um, to do projects. And um, 
that's what this one is. Uh, the next slide is our capital improvement slide. These are um, facilities related um, improvements that we do and we see a general inflation increase here. Um, this is in alignment with uh, the governor's executive order of um, spending uh, funds to um, make sure that our uh, facilities investments are uh, maintained. And then our last um, slide is the capital construction slide um, where we have the three policy option packages that I mentioned previously. And so I will not go through those again. Um, so I guess I, on the final slide, I just have um, any, I entertain any questions or, and seek um, your approval if um, you guys are, um, have had your questions satisfactorily answered. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, are there questions from the commission on the uh, ARB, the agency have, request budget, uh, or the three packages? I have a, I have a question. Commissioner Simpson. Just uh, related to inflation, I, I need to, I just would like to understand more about those numbers. I think we've talked about this before, uh, but I just need to refresh my uh, yes, Commissioner. F FTEs are, are dropping, but inflation is going up. Whether or not if there's a contingency plug into that inflation number. I only ask these questions because obviously we're in a recession now, and who knows how much more worse it's going to get. So I'm trying to understand uh, just the premise of those numbers and what the inflation is really tied to. Is it tied to cost of living adjustments for wages? to supply materials. I'm just trying to get an understanding about that. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Simpson. So the um, general inflation um, is twofold. Uh, personal services it, um, increased uh, the, the allowed inflation that DAS allows on personal services running um, around 9% for our personal services and for our services and supplies and our other categories, capital outlay and special payments. Uh, those run um, anywhere from four and a half to 5% depending on different line items. Uh, they do allow some um, additional inflation on certain line items. So um, this is built with the existing um, collective bargaining agreements, the, um, the COLAs and the step increases that were negotiated that is part of this budget build. And um, we do, um, we follow the DAF instructions, but we also, um, as we built this budget, but we also know that uh, during the current uh, situation and with the special session coming up, we may need to change these numbers. But right now we have followed the DAF instructions and we are submitting per those um, uh, instructions. And we've been working with both DAF and LFO with our request. So I, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, somewhat. How often are those are those collective bargaining agreements negotiated? Uh, the collective bargaining uh, for the unions are uh, usually done um, every every biennium. This last time, SEIU negotiated a four-year um, agreement um, with an allowance to open up for certain um, articles um, uh, two years into the cycle. So uh, usually they're done on the two-year cycle um, during the budget bill. They uh, nego negotiate those collective bargaining um, okay. agreements. Okay. So I'm just, I remember there was a point when the, the market was so hot, uh, the department was having a hard time finding qualified individuals just because of the competition with the employment packages in the private sector. And I would assume now that that paradigm has shifted. And so I'm just curious about whether or not there's a plan or strategy around um, trying to, uh, you know, as a real, I mean, if, if we're doing budget constraints, we're going into recession, borderline recession, or recession, borderline depression. Um, I'm just curious about how we, uh, how we become a little bit, how, how, how can we sharpen our pencils? Essentially? Yeah, so that's a good question, Commissioner Simpson. And what I um, have been, uh, letting our 
senior executives know is that we can ask for this budget, um, but we don't have to execute at the full budget. We, um, as an agency with um, your leadership, could um, uh, execute the budget at less than what we have approved. So if we had a $100 budget um, that we um, asked the legislature for and they approved it, we could execute at $95 or at $90. Um, that is something that we can do um, with your direction. Um, uh, we can't spend more than what the legislature approves us at unless we go and ask their permission, but we can always spend less than what they do. So I think um, part of the conversation that Travis is going to have with you on the next agenda topic will get into that and um, how we may need to um, look at becoming more efficient and having reductions that we are going to um, be needing to look at um, as, um, as the agency, not even despite or regardless of what's happening on the broader context, we have our own issues that we need to deal with, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Stefan, and sorry for jumping the gun. I actually see that we're closing the gap, so TD. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no sorry, problem. Folks. It was a good segue back to Travis. So. Yeah. Okay, are there other questions? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Simpson and uh, uh, Stefan. Are there other questions for Stefan? This is Commissioner Callery. If we yes. go back to the policy data and analysis division slide, uh, there at the bottom, you have uh, Connect Oregon budgeted at $78.2 million for 21-23. How does that carry over into future biennia? Are we going to have adequate funding to continue Connect Oregon at a reasonable uh, amount, or is this a one-time, let's get projects going, and then we have to wait for another two, three, four years? Or Two, three, four, five in. So, Commissioner, this is Travis, and I can uh, address this in part. And Jerry may want to jump in, or or Stefan. Uh, Mr. Porter, our chief economist, just recently ran the latest estimate of revenue coming to the Connect Oregon program from the vehicle uh, dealer privilege tax. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, car sales have plummeted due to our recession. They're predicted to be relatively uh, weak for several years. And so the revenue flowing into Connect Oregon is down. Uh, as a result, uh, Mr. Porter predicted that we would not have a $50 million bank account uh, saved up in the Connect Oregon uh, fund until 20, the end of 2023, approximately. And $50 million is the threshold of which we've discussed is about the right amount to run a program. Uh, so that assumes, of course, that the currently scheduled projects all move forward. Uh, so that could change a little bit depending on economic conditions or project delivery. Yeah, and the only thing that I'd add is that the amount that's showing here is really the amount of funds to uh, for projects that are already obligated. So, for instance, the two intermodal facilities um, and. As you recall from House Bill 2017, um, we also had a few years of funds um, from the privilege tax that needed to make sure we had enough money for the um, intermodal facilities, um, and as well as part of the privilege tax goes to um, Department of Energy. So I think that also substantiates a lot of what Travis just said. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, if not, uh, I would uh, call for a motion to approve the 21-23 agency request budget with the proposed policy options packages. This is Martin. I approve. I move for approval of the 21-23 agency request budget. Is there a second? Commissioner Smith seconds. Commissioner Smith seconds Commissioner Callery's motion. Uh, is there discussion by the commission? 
Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Vice Chair Simpson? Aye. Vice Chair Simpson votes aye. Commissioner Callery? Aye. Commissioner Callery votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. The chair votes aye. Thank you very much, Stefan. Good presentation. So, Thank you. Uh, Back to uh, our MC for the final yes. session before lunch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so today we are running a financial marathon uh, at, now at about mile post 20, probably. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I've never run a marathon. I always assume the last six miles are probably the most difficult. And uh, unfortunately for you, we've saved the hardest part of this for last. I recognize I am getting between you and recharging at lunch. So I'm going to run through this presentation and then allow for some discussion. Again, uh, much like the STIP, this is the first in, uh, uh, well, the second, I guess, in a long chain of conversations that will stretch out over the years. Uh, so today, I'm going to start with reviewing a little bit of the background that we provided to you back in May, just as a reminder, and then move into some of the potential solutions that the agency has been developing. We want to get your feedback on these proposed uh, solutions, what you like, what maybe you don't like quite as much, uh, any thoughts about them as we move forward, uh, things we should consider, uh, and then talk about how we're going to close the remaining gap uh, in that uh, rather large funding gap we have. And I'll remind you, as I mentioned earlier, all of these numbers are still based on an earlier revenue forecast that was a little bit rosier than the one we just got this week. So they're all subject to change. They're already obsolete, uh, and we'll be coming back to you over time and updating them regularly as new things happen, as our budget moves through the process, as revenues change. Uh, so just recognize when I give you a number today, it's going to look different uh, if we have the same conversation in October. So next slide, please. So as a reminder of the problem, the, the challenge we have is that starting in the next few years, ODOT just won't have enough money coming into the state highway fund to allow us to cover all the costs of operating the agency. And that's really driven by the fact that our resources are growing very slowly while our costs are growing at about 6% a year, well above a, a normal rate of inflation. Next slide, please. It's really important to remember that we have two parts of ODOT's budget and one of them is affected by our shortfall and the other really isn't. On the left side, you see the transportation projects and programs. These are the dedicated federal and state funds for specific programs and projects, construction projects, grant programs where we give money out to local governments or transit agencies. Uh, as a result of HB 2017, we are doing okay here. I guess I would say if this was a family budget, we'd be solidly middle class. As the investment strategy makes clear, we are uh, don't have nearly as much money as we need or might want to be able to maintain the transportation systems condition and performance, but we're and so the challenges we talk about today really aren't going to have a direct impact on those transportation projects and programs. The other side of the ledger is the agency operations. This is the state highway fund dollars, the money that is left to us to run the agency after all the other dedicated funds that the legislature and the federal government have given us go into the other side of the budget. So the primary part of this is maintenance and operations, the day-to-day -day work our crews do out on the road, uh, plowing snow in this picture, uh, picking up dead deer, patching puddles, all that work, as well as the revenue collection and programs at the DMV and Commerce Compliance Division, as well as the things you would typically think of as administration, the uh, information technology, HR, procurement, all those things. But it's really important to note that when we talk about agency operations, we are talking very broadly, and really the largest part of this is an investment in keeping the transportation system, the roads and sidewalks and bike lanes open and safe for the traveling public on a day-to-day -day basis, not just the overhead costs of the agency. This agency operations side is where we have a significant shortfall, and we are rapidly sliding into uh, what I might characterize as abject poverty. Next slide, please. So by way of reminder, uh, the state highway fund is a shared resource between ODOT and local government. So uh, about a third of that money in the state highway fund, a little bit north of that, goes to local governments and other agencies. About a quarter of it then 
<clears throat> is dedicated to by the legislature to both debt service and uh, specific projects uh, on the transportation system. And then the remainder of that, about 38%, goes into agency operations for all those things I just talked about. Next slide, please. The breakdown within ODOT's budget uh, for our operations spending is such that, as I mentioned, maintenance and operations uh, out of the delivery and operations division is by largest category, 41%. And I should note uh, that capital construction and improvement at 3%. As Stefan noted earlier, that is uh, largely for our maintenance stations. And so really, uh, when you look at, broadly speaking, our maintenance and operations function is about half of the agency operational budget. The other divisions have other chunks of this. Uh, you see DMV and commerce compliance, and then all of those sort of central services uh, functions are only 18% of our operational budget. So. Uh, really, this is a budget that is focused on the maintenance and operations of the, the transportation system. Next slide, please. As noted earlier, our revenues are increasing fairly slowly, about 2% a year. Uh, even as the overall state highway fund is increasing more rapidly, the money we have to operate the system or operate the agency is increasing fairly slowly, largely because uh, we're just not seeing growth in driving and vehicles are becoming more fuel efficient. Our costs, on the other hand, are going up at triple that rate about 6% a year. Stefan talked about some of the drivers behind this. One of the top drivers here is our personal service costs. Over the last decade, our staffing of our agency has been just about flat. So we're not really seeing more ODOT workers, but what we have seen is that our total personal services costs for salaries, uh, PERS and healthcare have gone up by about 50%. So that is one of the key drivers. Some of the others include our services and supplies, things like you know the, the materials we put down, on the roads uh, or that maintenance uses, uh, rock, sand, all those things, our facilities and our fleets, all those costs are growing at a fairly rapid rate compared to our revenues. And also we find that the state government service charge, the, uh, the charge that we, uh, the, the money that we give uh, to the enterprise for things like technology and other services are also rising fairly rapidly. Next slide, please. So we have been able to maintain a balanced budget for a number of years. And this year, at least at the April 2020 revenue estimate, we were still in balance this year, but we saw that that was going to, to break open in future years and we were going to start running a very large deficit on an annual basis. Next slide. Just like any family, we have a little bit of a, a savings account, some balances in the state highway fund to see us through a rainy day. That rainy day uh, is now just about upon us. So what you can see is that we will start uh, burning down those balances in the state highway fund and fall below zero uh, about 2024, uh, probably a little bit earlier than that now that we have uh, an updated revenue forecast. And then it's all downhill from there. That, that line continues trending downhill uh, at the rate of about $200 million uh, a year. Next slide, please. So just to put a uh, finer point on it uh, in very large red letters, ODOT's operational budget gap is about $720 million through 2027. Of course, it's actually worse based on our most recent revenue forecast. So this is a pretty substantial challenge. We've had similar budget challenges in the past uh, of operational funding not being uh, sufficient to, to cover the agency's operations costs. They've been smaller than this though. So this is uh, a, a large number and something that we're gonna have to work through over time. Luckily, we do have some time to continue working through this, but we have a sense of urgency. That we need to act as an agency very proactively to address this and start putting on the table uh, ways to try to get us back into alignment over the next several years. So next slide, please. I'm gonna start talking you through uh, what we're doing to address the challenge. Next slide, please. We, as an agency leadership board, have identified a number of strategies for closing the gap, areas where we're gonna be looking at. So first, we're gonna to have to focus our limited resources on the most critical programs. Look at really what is our core to the agency and maybe stop doing some things. In some of those areas that maybe are not as core to the agency or even across some that are, we're also gonna to have to look at realigning service levels. Uh, we're gonna to have to look at how well can we serve customers at the DMV how well uh, are we able to maintain our roads, our service levels uh, of our maintenance and operations staff out there? 
Now, I should note that we have articulated that we will uh, not seek to balance the, this budget on the back of the transportation system or our customers. So we're going to do everything we can to try to still serve our customers effectively, but recognize there are going to be service level impacts with a budget deficit of this size. The third area is really to look at becoming more efficient. So what can we do better with, with fewer resources to get the same outcomes, particularly looking at uh, technology solutions, things that will allow us to automate some work where we currently have uh, large staffing resources dedicated to things uh, and free up some of those resources and save money. So those first three really are all about uh, saving money, reducing costs. And that's going to be where we're going to need to take a lot of our focus now. Another area is to shift costs from the state highway fund to other sources. Since we have really a uh, budget problem in one of our fund sources, we can look at are there ways that we can use our federal funds in particular uh, to cover costs and not have state highway fund outlays cover those costs so that we can then save those state highway fund dollars and apply them against our, our deficit. And then lastly, if we do all these things, we hope that over time that the legislature and others will uh, deem fit to provide some additional resources to help cover our costs, particularly with some of our service areas like DMV fees, where the fee does not cover the complete cost of providing the service. Next slide, please. So in your packet, you had a number of documents that laid out some of the proposals that we are putting on the table. Uh, that is just really, to be honest, a starting place for discussion. None of these are uh, written in granite yet. Uh, these are all proposals that we are putting forward that some of them need more development. A lot of them need continued work. Uh, we're beginning down the path on all these fronts uh, in order to make decisions. We've developed what we believe is a balanced approach that looks at closing the budget gap using cost savings and fund shifts and some additional resources. Uh, and we hope that that it matches uh, where the commission will want to go as well. Next slide, please. So uh, as we looked at this, uh, we did a lot of analysis of our budget. And what you can see is that lowest line on there, the darkest blue line shows our cash position through 2027 uh, if we do nothing today. This is the as is uh, current uh, phase that we're on, our current direction that we're on. As you can see, that's where we would hit about $720 million in total shortfall by 2027. And we want to balance that to zero through 2027 to make sure we're in good fiscal health. So as we looked at all the, the proposals that are we have put on the table to date, all those things that are in your packet uh, to close that gap, that would get us about halfway there, about $360 million in budget uh, gap closure through 2027. What that means is that leaves us with another about $360 million that we would need to close through reductions across the agency. What we've calculated that as we would need to take a reduction uh, starting in our 21-23 budget of about 20 or sorry, about 5% and then grow that another 5% to a total of 10% starting in 2025 in order to bring us to balancing to zero in 2027. So you see that top line assumes both implementation of all the proposals that we're bringing forward today, as well as those additional reductions that would be necessary to balance us to zero. So next slide, please. I'm going to start with talking through where the agency is looking to go at efficiencies, and I sh or cost savings, which include efficiencies, service real level realignments and things that we as an agency can stop doing as we focus really on our core work. Uh, we have not yet developed really substantial numbers in these areas. But what we're going to be doing over the next several months leading into the legislative session is looking across the breadth and depth of the agency at where we could find a 5% and 10% reduction in order to balance our budget. We already have taken some steps uh, that point us in that direction. So right at the moment, the state enterprise has a hiring frost in place where we are limiting hiring to critical positions that are really the truly uh, immediate, urgent, important positions uh, that we need to hire for. So we have some vacancy savings as we're holding a lot of our other positions vacant over time. Uh, in the packet, we also described the potential for moving more DMV services online 
uh, and also providing self-service kiosks that could uh, reduce the number of people who have to go into DMV field offices and provide savings. Uh, I should note we did some of this just in the last couple of weeks when we turned on the second phase of the driver system uh, and allowed for people to uh, order a replacement driver license online or get a driver record online. All those are things that will keep literally hundreds of thousands of people from having to go to our DMV field offices. So we think that there are some ways that with online services, we can not only save money, but also be able to better serve our customers in the long term through providing better uh, new transport or new uh, information technology solutions that will do all those things. In a similar vein, uh, Amy Ramsdale at the Commerce and Compliance Division <clears throat> is looking at the potential for developing an automated truck routing and online permitting system. Currently, we have fairly manual processes for, for routing trucks and providing permitting. Many states have gone to uh, online systems that allow people to, truckers to go online and get a permit very quickly. What they found is that that can reduce the cost of the program for the state, uh, as well as in some cases, bring in additional revenue because it becomes so easy to get a permit that most more truckers comply with those requirements. And of course, that also provides better service to the trucking industry. So we also will be looking at things like facilities uh, as we're in this uh, new world of COVID and uh, been implementing telework, we're finding that there are a lot of opportunities we see that we may be able to reduce our facilities footprint by having more people telework uh, and be able to perhaps uh, save some money on what we pay currently uh, in rent and other facility costs. Those are just a sample though of some of the ideas uh, and examples. We're gonna be looking across the rest of the agency uh, and think we have other opportunity as well. Now I'll tell you cost savings won't be easy given the size of our maintenance and operations uh, as a portion of our operational budget. It will almost certainly uh, balancing the budget will almost certainly require some changes to our maintenance levels of service and that is not going to be an easy conversation. Uh, that's certainly not something that we relish uh, but we know that looking forward we will have to uh, look at those opportunities for saving money. I will pause there just briefly and see if there are any comments or thoughts about us, our, our work in looking at cost savings as we go forward. Comments or uh, ideas about this coming uh, from the commission, commission comments? There'll be more time at the end too, I should note. So uh, I may just go along and then as you come up with additional thoughts, we have, we've set aside time at the very end. Okay. Next slide, please. The second category of uh, ways to close this budget gap we are falls into the area of budgets. as we look at, can we use federal money for more things that we're currently uh, spending state dollars on? This has two areas. One would be uh, some fairly uh, modest uh, revisions to the STIP that would change the color of money uh, in some of the programs in the STIP. And then the second is looking at how we exchange uh, resources with local governments where we, we give local governments an allocation of federal dollars and then in some cases allow them to swap that out for state dollars that then aren't available for us to use for uh, operating the agency. Next slide, please. So let me walk you through the proposed changes uh, to the STIP that we are including here. Uh, the goal is really to free up some state dollars by shifting more indirect costs of project delivery to FHWA funds. You heard Mr. Flowers earlier today talk about our indirect cost allocation program. This is where we are able to cover some of our indirect costs of project delivery uh, through federal funds. We currently have uh, negotiated rates with the Federal Highway Administration uh, that are relatively low compared to both our actual indirect costs as well as in comparison to other states. So what we would propose is bumping up the amount of federal dollars that are covering indirect costs of uh, project delivery uh, to a level that is commensurate with some of our costs and uh, in alignment with other states that, of course, then would shift some of the money that those federal dollars that are currently going into projects would be going to those indirect costs. 
What we would do, though, is propose that we would not do this immediately. We would phase this in over time and use federal redistribution funds to avoid impacting the 21 through 24 step that you just approved today so that we wouldn't have to worry about cutting any projects or, or making any adjustments there. And then we would build this into the 24, 27 uh, step uh, with that indirect cost allocation program at a higher level. The second area here is there are a number of maintenance programs. Uh, these were all covered in some detail in the investment strategy, the major bridge maintenance, major interstate maintenance, and major culvert maintenance programs. These are programs that we actually use our own maintenance forces, uh, and these are included in the STIP. Uh, they are programs where uh, we use state dollars because it's more efficient uh, to use state dollars if you're going to use your own maintenance forces. So what we would look at doing is uh, shifting those costs that currently come out of our base state highway fund dollars. Uh, these expenses are all eligible to be to use HB 2017 funds that were provided for bridges and paving and culverts. So we would shift that cost over. Again, that would reduce the amount of HB 2017 funds going into projects in the STIP. So we would look at implementing this first in the 24 to 27 step, building that into our funding numbers, and then uh, look at if there were opportunities, if there was a new service transportation bill that included significant additional funds, if there was money available for redistribution or some other source, we might start that process in uh, the 21 through 24 step. But overall, our goal with these changes to the step is to avoid impacting the already approved 2124 step and any projects that are already moving through the process toward delivery. Next slide, please. The other area is the local fund exchange program. We currently uh, are uh, a state that's very generous in the way we exchange state or federal dollars that we have uh, allocated to local government for state dollars. Uh, which has an effect on our bottom line, as you can imagine. It's really important, though, I want to note up front that we are in no way producing or proposing reducing the of FHWA funds or state highway funds that go formula to local government, that 50, 30, 20. That's not on the table at all. We are not talking about reducing the total amount of funding going to local governments, only what color of money, what type of money would go to them. So we started working with local governments, cities and counties on modifying the fund exchange program. There's really two of those programs. One's called the STP fund exchange program. This has existed for a long time. It allows each uh, city and county and MPO to get an allocation of funds that then most of them, pretty much all of them, exchange for state dollars. In recent years, we also added what's called the state funded local program, where we took federally funded pro projects like uh, all roads, transportation, safety, local bridge program, and some others, and said, you know, uh, it's good for ODOT and good for local governments uh, to get the, uh, to simplify this whole pro process by defederalizing them. So we'll give you state dollars in exchange. Next slide, please. What we've seen though, is over time, our approach to funding, uh, fund exchange programs has led to a rapid growth. Just in the last four years, we saw the amount of funding exchange with local governments about tripled as we created that new state funded local program. Again, it's really good for ODOT as well, because it means we don't have to help local governments deliver federal aid projects, which is something that is a challenge for many of them. But at this point, uh, with this rapid growth and the amount of funding going out the door through these fund exchange programs, it's really come to a point where it's, it's really unsustainable for our budget. So we are proposing modifications to both of these programs that would reduce this total amount by about $28 million. So cutting it about in half. We had our first meeting with what we call the Fund Exchange Working Group. We'd started with discussions with uh, the AOC and LSE staff and then also talked with both organizations, transportation committees uh, to talk about uh, the potential of doing this work. They appointed uh, four city officials and four county officials uh, to sit down with us and work through this. And we had a good discussion yesterday 
Uh, obviously, this is not something that Ocot Relish is doing, nor is it something that local governments are really interested <laughs> on their own in doing either. But we did get a sense from them uh, where they were particularly concerned that if we were to make changes, uh, could have uh, an outsized impact on local government. So what we're working to do with them is to look at how can we make these changes, reduce the amount of federal dollars we're exchanging while avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating the impact on local government. And so hopefully we'll be able to get to a place where we're able to come back to you and have a, a well fleshed out proposal. We're very open as to how to achieve the amount of uh, funding uh, savings that we have laid out. I really want to work with cities and counties to figure out what the best approach to that may be. So again, I will pause now that I've talked about the fund shift piece and see if there are any questions at this point, or again, we can cover them at the very end. Quick question, Travis. Yes. Um, in those conversations with those local agencies, I'm just curious whether or not you guys are having um, dialogue around, you know, divesting in the, in the, in the, in the budget, and cutting it in half, essentially. I'm wondering whether or not in those conversations, there can be more of a concerted effort in terms of the values that that has as well as the values that these agencies have to prioritize where those resources can go. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know if you guys are having those explicit conversations or just, is it just straight across the board monetarily. Um, and I think that that actually provides more of a um, transparent process in terms mm -hmm. of the public's perspective to understand, you know, not only the, uh, the, the cuts that are necessary, but also, more importantly, how the organizations are working in unison to try to address some of these higher priority needs based on the values. Yeah, Commissioner Simpson, so far the, the conversation has been primarily uh, reiterating our goal is to keep as many local agencies and as many projects as possible in the fund exchange program while uh, still providing that level of savings we've laid out. So uh, the goal is if we could look at some of the larger projects where local agencies should be able to deliver a, you know, a $4 million uh, effectively, uh, while keeping some of the smaller projects, uh, $300,000 project just is not new at the federal, uh, using the federal requirements. So we are looking to at how can we get more local agencies certified uh, as able to deliver federal aid projects so that they can uh, do the work themselves. So really trying to help them get to a place to make these projects easier to deliver uh, knowing that uh, it will always be easier to deliver a state-funded project than a federally funded project. Right. Got you, sir. I have a question. Um, this is Commissioner Smith. My understanding is that this will probably disproportionately impact the smaller agencies and their ability to deliver federal projects. Are you considering as part of the mitigation providing ODOT staffing resources who may be able to help in some of that administration and training. And it uh, sounds like you're gonna come back with a proposal. Uh, I'd just like to, to have that be part of the proposal if it's feasible. Yeah, Commissioner, absolutely. So uh, we recognize that if we were just to end fund exchange completely, that would have a disproportionate impact on the smaller local governments. So our goal is to keep as many of the smaller jurisdictions in the fund exchange program as possible, while some of the larger jurisdictions that have more technical resources, and particularly those that already deliver federal aid projects, uh, they know how to deal with these. They should be able to deliver them uh, fairly well. But let's keep you know, the smaller cities, smaller counties uh, on fund exchange to the maximum extent possible. In any situation in which there is uh, a shift to funding projects by, by federal dollars, ODOT actually has to provide those staff resources uh, to help the local agencies deliver the projects. It's still more difficult for them to do so, but there is a substantial role that ODOT plays uh, in essentially standing uh, in for the federal government in delivery of those projects. So 
yes, we would be uh, uh, likely needing to provide additional staff resources for local agencies uh, to del deliver these projects. All right. Any questions or other comments? Not hearing any. Why don't we go along to the next slide, please? Okay. The third area uh, where we're looking in the long run is additional resources that could help cover agency operations costs. Uh, one of the first that we're looking at is there's a, a federal grant program through uh, the Motor Carrier Safety Administration called Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program. This is a grant we used to receive, and we believe that if we were to apply for and receive this uh, grant on an ongoing basis once again, it could help us cover some of the costs of our motor carrier safety work in the Commerce and Compliance Division. So it, it is a not insubstantial amount of money uh, that could help uh, with that work uh, that we're doing today and hopefully drive better safety outcomes as well. Other areas, we would be looking at uh, changing the way we charge for services. Uh, as you may know, the DMV does a cost of service study on a regular basis that looks at how much does it cost them to provide a service versus what is the fee. What it comes back with every time we run the numbers is that uh, while our vehicle fees, like title and registration, more than cover the amount of the cost and actually provide uh, surplus revenue for the road system, our driver fees do not. That includes, in particular, our uh, Class C driver's license as well as some of our commercial driver's license functions. So DMV has done this uh, work on a number of occasions uh, and uh, looking at the possibility of introducing legislation in the 2021 session or at some future legislative session that would seek to uh, align our costs uh, with our fee levels. We're also looking at other areas of DMV fees. There are some DMV fees that are actually able to be set by the DMV uh, to cover our costs. So things like uh, driver record fees, which are currently $2 each, we might look at bumping those costs up. We're looking at the potential even of as we roll out additional service delivery channels for various services, whether that's online or uh, customer service kiosks, could we then, uh, because we're providing so many other ways for people to access those services, charge a surcharge for uh, the additional cost of going into a DMV field office? That's something that obviously we have a lot of work that's shifted out of DMV field offices and we're seeing that people are able to do their, their registration transactions online or by the mail, uh, even though in the past about a third of people still went into the field offices to do that transaction and was a much more costly way of providing that service. So we'll be looking at a variety of the, the fees uh, that the DMV charges uh, and looking at ways that we might be able to ensure that we're covering our costs. And then of course, uh, this isn't one of the proposals that's on the table in your document, but uh, per our strategic plan and per our, our work over the long run, we do think that we're gonna need to look at shifting to road usage charging in the long run to ensure that our revenue streams are sufficient and reliable to cover our costs. So with that, you can go to the next slide and I will wrap up and would love to get any feedback, questions, comments, uh, ideas, or other thoughts on how we should be attacking this uh, significant operational deficit that we have. Maybe we should just go look for a Rambo. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is just a very unfortunate time, and all jokes aside, I know it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of um, tough decisions, and and it's gonna take a lot of just. I guess dialogue and efforts amongst us all to try to figure out how we address this challenge. But it's no different than what I think a lot of other agencies and private businesses and individuals personally are dealing with to try to figure out how to survive this unfortunate time. So I don't really have 
many questions right now. Uh, we need on staff um, to kind of continue to work more deeply on trying to figure out what the next steps, what are some of the best options in terms of the next steps for us as we continue to build upon what we present today going forward. I guess the one comment I would have uh, would be that I think I understand this right, that what whatever we do in, in this time period uh, gets us to 2027, but then uh, there's potential post-2027 for the problems start reoccurring. So uh, is that correct? Yeah, Commissioner, thanks for bringing that, that up. We have focused on 2027 as a time frame that's far enough out to give us long lead time uh, and also uh, to ensure that we're not looking too short because the, the problem gets worse as you go out further beyond 2025. So if we were looking just to the shorter term, we would uh, have a large budget deficit still out uh, on the horizon, uh, even though going out to 2027, yes, we will not necessarily have solved the long-term problem yet at that point if we are, in the next several years, able to balance out to 2027. All of the things I put on the table today are things that do provide not just one-time savings, but ongoing permanent savings year after year. And so what our hope is, is that we can start stacking those on top of each other to be able to uh, what becomes a gap of about $200 million a year. So we will be looking both at balancing to 2027 and then how much of that ongoing $200 million a year annual budget gap have we been able to close? And our hope is we'll be able to close a substantial portion of that and then continue to come back on an iterative basis to address that. So 2027, there's probably you know, potential good. for another funding package, uh, other things that could come along that could shift the conversation in uh, a good direction, also some potential for things that could shift it in the other direction as well. The reason I raised the question is because, uh, and I'm sure you guys are talking about this a lot in the agency, but um, you have structural changes in the budget that uh, benefit the budget for the long term as well as the medium and short, or you can do more stopgap actions, which then um, fade in effectiveness or sunset or whatever they do, and then you're facing a new problem, which is really part of the old problem uh, down the line. So I just want us to be thinking about this in terms of where we can do uh, structural reform. And a good example is one you just mentioned, which is, I think, going from a system that is heavily dependent on a, a deteriorating although it's slow, but still deteriorating funding source, gas tax to a potentially more reliable source like a road user charge is a, would be a structural change that could be relied upon to take advantage of kind of where a, a more stable uh, source of income than the gas tax may become over time. So it's really trying to think about those kinds of questions in doing this, uh, I think that's important among many things that are important to think about. It's one thing that's important to think about. If we see that gas tax, our long-term projections on gas tax revenues is uh, due to a number of uh, positive things like uh, you know, more efficient fuels and more efficient vehicles, that we ought to just recognize that in our discussions now. So we're putting in place uh, revenue sources that can sustain us uh, long term. Yes, that's a good preview of the discussion we'll have a little bit tomorrow when we talk about our strategic action plan and, and road usage charging, our shift in that direction being one of the key goals uh, that is articulated in that. Questions from the commission or comments? 
this is Commissioner Callery. Since I serve on the Rough Tough uh, Committee, one of the one of the concerns I have is how quickly could we make that structural change that Chair Ben Brocklin has brought up? Uh, the I. I worry about the appetite of the legislature and the public into making such a change, but I think we have to make it as quickly as possible. And I know it's going to take a lot of advocacy work on all of all of ODOT's personnel, whether it's working with the ACTS, whether it's working with the other advisory committees. It, we can't stall on you know, on getting rough tough or road usage charges in place. I think it's critical to the future of ODOT. Just a comment. Yeah, and uh, Commissioner, uh, as you know, we had that discussion at the last rough tough meeting and that there is consensus that the, the task force would like to move forward with a proposal for a legislative concept that goes moves us toward a large scale, probably mandatory road use fee, a road use charge of some sort. Unfortunately, the transition to this will probably be agonizingly slow as we watch our revenue deteriorate in the sense that we know we need a new technological model with uh, connected vehicles that just aren't on the market uh, yet today. So we are looking several years out to the future to where we'd really be able to start turning that on and turning that up. Quick, quick question, Travis. Vice Chair. Travis, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so the average person is probably going to say, oh, you know, the feds are entertaining a, you know, federal transportation infrastructure package. You know, you got House Bill 17. Um, how are you guys, you know, how do you guys have these shortfalls? What's the, what's the <laughs> issue here? How does this even, can you, can you, for the record, just kind of articulate just kind of a high level slide how those different components of money work? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's a really good question. And it's one, I, there was actually a slide in the last uh, presentation we gave you, I believe, that showed that the reason we're in this bind, despite HB 2017, is almost all of the money the legislature gave us went into the projects and program side of the the budget it didn't really provide us any money to operate the agency or do the day-to-day -day maintenance and operations of the system and the same thing will be the case if the feds pass a major reauthorization bill all of that federal money has to be spent on projects and programs it really can't be used for the operational side of the agency ODOT and you know that that left side of the budget, the transportation projects and programs, may be solidly middle class. We may even you know do quite well uh, if there is additional revenue coming from the feds, while we still slip into poverty on the operational side of the budget, just because we cannot use that money provided for maintaining and operating the roads on a day-to-day -day basis. This is Commissioner Smith. It's almost like uh, the legislature said, we're going to buy you a new car, but you <laughs> have to put gas in it, new tires, and maintain it under your current family budget, and you don't get a raise. Commissioner Smith, that is a, a fitting metaphor. Yeah. And one of the wage earners in the family loses his or her job, <laughs> which is COVID. So even the assumptions when they passed it are just out the window, $250 million down in six months and gas tax proceeds. Uh, you know, this is just kick me again while I'm down. It's just tough. No one, no one in particular is kicking us, just the virus is, uh, but it complicates it. Um, well, as you say, Travis, a lot more discussion about this, including as soon as tomorrow. So give us something to think about tonight. And I and I just wanted to echo my comments earlier to on the previous agenda item, to just having some little 
challenging and complex um, experimentations on just re re recalibration of our of our costs of administrative uh, and operational costs in the house. I think that's that's one of the things everybody's having to experience right now with the uncertainty of the code that that we're fortunate in. Um, I mean, I've even heard from the folks out there that this is a this is a a first step into we're seeing a recalibration of the entire of the entire financial structure of the entire country, given the fact that everything is highly inflated. And so, what somebody essentially may have you know been making, you know, let's just say a hundred thousand dollars in the salary, you know, in the prior to COVID. Next couple of years, that value could essentially be turned into seventy. Who knows? Um, I think it's, it's it's a real honest conversation about this whole region of our financial system and the unfortunate challenges that we're that we're Thank you. Um, so, Travis, there are some initial thoughts. Great, and we will expect to continue this conversation over many months. What you'll see is, uh, while we, we don't ask you for any action today, uh, your feedback is helpful. Uh, there will be times over the next uh, period of months or years where we bring various elements of these solutions back to you for formal approval. So today was primarily contextual. There'll be further discussions and then a sort of long, slow roll uh, of the commission's approval of various elements of these uh, particularly those that are within your purview rather than things that are within the purview of the agency or the purview of the legislature. Okay. Um, kind of one last comment I would just have, which is if we're, as I understand it, looking for $350 million to balance our 360 to balance out a $720 million funding effort. Um, you, you, we, we're not going to get there with a, a lot of, unless we have an awful lot of small things. So it does. Re for new revenue. In other words, we're not going to get there on, uh, on uh, a lot of little things. We're going to have to have some things that have more fiscal impact. Yes, that's that's absolutely correct. We, we are going to need to do what we might call the not the silver bullet, but the silver buckshot approach. But some of those buckshot are going to have to be relatively large in order uh, to close this gap. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Travis. Anything further you need from us right now? Nope. We appreciate your input and feedback, and we know we'll continue this conversation. Okay, well, then we will uh, break for lunch. We'll recess for lunch and let's plan to reconvene at one o'clock. We're in recess.
Okay. <sighs>
Tom, are we uh, on? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm resuming the recording right now, and you are good to go. Okay, per perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, members of the commission, is everyone uh, back from lunch? This is Commissioner Callery, I'm back. Welcome back, Martin. Hope you had a nice lunch. Uh, Sharon, are you back? Orlando? Commissioner Brown's back. Thank you. Welcome back, Julie. Okay, we're waiting on a couple of folks. And just so I know, uh, as I look ahead to the afternoon program, uh, is uh, Assistant Director Perkins Yes, I'm your chair. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Cotras. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. Uh, we have a whole urban mobility group. Brendan, is your group here or maybe not quite yet? We're not on for a little while. But and then we have the climate group, which is includes uh, other agencies and then Lindsay so who we've seen earlier so uh, Mr. Smith you back I'm here I'm here great welcome back uh, Mr. Simpson Orlando, are you back in the room? Well, maybe we should, uh, let's just wait one more minute. If uh, Orlando's not back by five after, we'll go.
Lando, are you back? Back, sir. Awesome. Okay, we'll hear first uh, uh, this afternoon from uh, Assistant Director Perkins uh, on equity. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Akatris. Good afternoon. Uh, there is a loud horn blaring in my background. Can you all still hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you and we can okay. hear it. <laughs> yes, it, it is not stopping. I'm not sure why. I apologize. Not my horn. It's okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Nikadris Perkins, uh, Assistant Director of Social Equity at ODOT, um, here to just introduce two amazing, three amazing team members to talk about some of the social equity work going on. Uh, as you all know, we're currently working on strategic action to move equity and ensure that we deepen our work to develop, develop equitable systems and culture agency-wide, as well as with external partners. Um, there's also amazing work that's happening right now. Uh, two examples of that are ADA and the disadvantaged business programs. Both are focused on meeting goals and ensuring compliance to state and federal regulations, um, while really working towards a vision of creating accessibility and belonging for populations that have traditionally been left out. So um, the ADA, program in particular has been focused on um, increases in curb ramps, pedestrian signals, customer access as a part of the 2017 settlement with disability advocates, excuse me, and over the last month we started the process of what it looks like to enhance accessibility, creating access for all users as well as those that want to work with and inside of ODOT and that being part of our strategic, again, action plan. So today, um, David Morrissey, the Title VI in Environmental Justice, and ADA Program Manager from the Office of Civil Rights, as well as Richard Upton, the ADA Program Manager, Manager from Statewide Delivery Unit, will give an update on that. And when they're done, feel free to ask questions. And uh, Cody Trudell, who's the DBE and Small Business Program Manager from OCR, will talk about the Disadvantaged Business Program, um, which is a federal requirement to ensure firms who, you know, who manage Management and daily operations are led by historically, socially, and economically disadvantaged owners are put in a position to better compete, um, and we have definitely statewide goals for that, and she is the person that manages that program to make sure that we're removing some of those barriers that we may be unconsciously complicit in. So I am going to turn it over to um, David and Richard to start with the ADA program. David, Richard, are you there? Hello. Hello. I, 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 Michelle, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? We can hear you, I think. I can hear you, okay. definitely. David? Okay, fantastic. Yes, if, as long as you can hear me, I'm, I'm going to proceed. Okay. Okay, so, great. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for including the ADA program on today's program. My name is David Morrissey. I manage uh, the ADA program in addition to our Title VI program and our Environmental Justice program, and I'm based in ODOT's Office of Civil Rights. Let me let my co-presenter introduce himself today. Dick? We don't hear you, Dick. David, this is Tom Fuller. I, I think Mr. Upton may be having an audio issue. He'll need to click on the little three dots at the bottom of his screen and check his audio connection because I'm not showing an audio connection for him. So if you want to proceed, maybe while he gets his uh, audio back, that would be great. Thanks. Sounds fine. And I know Dick was calling in via the phone option rather than the but why don't I proceed, and okay. uh, when we get to our, our second topic where Dick was going to take the lead, we'll see if we can hear him at that point. So let me go ahead and move forward and, and start off this uh, presentation about our work uh, by recognizing that this July 2020 is the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
The ADA implementation program at ODOT is very important and reflects our agency's values of access, inclusion, and equity. ADA implementation is a collaborative program at ODOT and really reflects our one ODOT approach involving engagement across the agency. Uh, the goal is that accommodation for all users is a way of doing business. Since 1995, ODOT has been addressing ADA implementation through our Title II ADA Transition Plan, which covers all aspects of accessibility to facilities, meetings, online media, and our transportation system. The 2016 lawsuit from the Association of Oregon Centers for Independent Living revealed areas of concern to the disability community where ODOT could do a better job. And in 2017, we reached a settlement agreement with the plaintiffs of that lawsuit uh, in which we made a number of commitments that we want to present to you today our status of. Let me ask if Dick is now um, audible. Still, I'm not hearing you, Dick, so I'm going to go ahead and just proceed, recognizing the time. Um, but if we can get you in, uh, we'll love to have you. Okay. So Richard Upton manages the ADA program over in uh, the statewide delivery unit because of uh, the expertise in that unit for designing our assets, um, such as uh, curb ramps, audible pedestrian signals, and other aspects of the transportation infrastructure. Whereas, again, in my role, I'm based in the Office of Civil Rights. And so we work collaboratively to advance ADA implementation here in the agency. Um, in 2017, having reached that settlement, ODOT committed to, one, inventorying and remediating non-compliant curb ramps on the state highway system. That's a large undertaking and has a 15-year delivery uh, plan. Uh, we committed to inventorying pedestrian signals with a remediation schedule that is still in development. Uh, other actions we committed to were hiring an accessibility consultant, engaging community outreach, uh, providing accessible routes through work zones, and implementing a mechanism for people with disabilities to identify and resolve issues uh, with our ADA facilities. We call this our CQCR system which stands for Comments, Questions, Concerns, and Requests. I'll come back to that system and what it's achieving in just a moment. ODOT is actively pursuing all of our commitments in the settlement agreement. Meeting our commitments in the settlement agreement will be complete by 2032. However, ODOT's commitment to accommodate all users will continue. ODOT's 2019 report on settlement achievements um, is now available on the accessibility at ODOT webpage. And if you aren't familiar with that webpage, and I was, it's so simple to find, just put into your Google search bar, accessibility at ODOT, and it will bring you to our clearinghouse landing page where not only you can read about our Title II ADA transition plan, uh, but also the terms of the settlement and our annual progress reporting, as well as customers can use that webpage in order to submit CQCRs or requests for accommodation. Curb ramp remediations are currently the most visible activity inside ODOT related to the settlement agreement. Led by the statewide project delivery branch, all of the regions are engaged in developing and delivering curb ramp projects. Beginning this year, ODOT must remediate 2,400 ramps every year to meet our production commitments in both 2022 and in 2027. The commission dedicated a total of $131.5 million so far for this initiative. This funding is supporting curb ramp only construction contracts in 2020 and design for ramps will be built in 2021 and 2022. Additional funding will be requested later this year for construction during the 2021 to 22 curb ramp project year. Combined with curb ramps triggered by paving, bridge repairs, and other projects, and including those already remediated, ODOT is positioned to exceed the commitment of 7,770 curb ramps by the end of 2022. There is a nexus between the ADA program and our Emerging Small Business program that I'd like to point out. 
In addition to disadvantaged business inclusion goals on all projects which meet the criteria in our project plan, the ADA program is leveraging emerging small business funds to fill a niche. There is a number of maintenance projects that are very small relative to what we normally program, but important to accomplish. We used all of $400,000 of our allotment last biennium in the 2017 to 19 biennium and requested and received double that amount of $800,000 yeah, this biennium. We are in the process of allocating these funds for construction this summer and based on demand, we'll be asking for more funds next biennium. The next section I want to return to is around our customer response system, or CQCRs. In 2019, ODOT received 54 customer comments, questions, concerns, or requests. Of those 54, 34 were resolved by the agency in the, in the same year they were received. Ten were still under investigation at the end of the last calendar year, or were in the process of planning uh, the remediation. Five were scheduled for future remediations as part of other planned projects, and five were referred to the appropriate local jurisdictions where, where possible. This customer-driven concern and response system is centralized through the Office of Civil Rights, but relies on our most local ADA contacts and active transportation liaisons um, for customer interface, uh, identifying solutions, and uh, identifying statewide technical units expertise to be engaged as needed. Again, this is a one ODOT approach to implementing the ADA. Other activities that we are um, implementing currently uh, in, within ODOT related to the ADA include undertaking a sidewalk inventory and a park and ride inventory. So look at those assets. Uh, compared to ADA standards to identify where improvements uh, need to be made. Um, we have launched what we are calling an alternative mobility devices working group. Increasingly, uh, persons who have mobility disabilities are engaging in using really innovative technologies um, for their personal mobility and being able to provide education and be a technical resource um, on such devices is an area of increasing inquiry. Um, and so this is an area where, again, working across um, disciplines within ODOT, we're bringing the best minds together to address this new innovative area. And finally, uh, we're beginning the process to revise our Title II transition plan. Um, and really, we'll begin that process in 2021. The current plan is from 2017. And um, our, in our ODOT's history of developing an ADA Title II transition plan stretches back to the mid-1990s. So we have been engaged in this work for a long time. We have uh, a great institutional knowledge within the agency, and we're working as one ODOT to continue to make the ADA real um, for Oregonians. Let me stop there and see if there are questions or comments to my uh, remarks today, or also if Dick Upton had was able to clear the audio line and has anything to add, I welcome him as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, are there questions from the commission? Commissioner Smith, I have a question. Commissioner Smith, please. please. Right. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Morrissey, for all your great work. I think it's, it suits our agency well. Um, my question is regarding the curb ramp program are you finding that you have to go back and do a lot of repairs after you've completed the work? Is, is that an ongoing issue or, or just speak to that a little bit, please? Mm -hmm. well, it's not entirely my area of expertise, but let me share my understanding. Uh, yes, with new uh, ramp development, there is a review process that sometimes can identify um, failures in areas where ramps were not um, installed correctly or we're still not compliant for a variety of reasons that could interface between design and the environment and the actual um, installation process. When that occurs, we uh, of course go back and remediate the ramp to be compliant. I think to address um, at the source where fails could occur, the exciting initiative has been to uh, increase the capacity 
of um, ramp inspectors that ODOT engages to review the ramps uh, for them to be proactively involved in communicating to builders um, the exact specs, uh, the state of the art, so that we're reducing uh, any fail rate. I'm sure we could follow up with you, Commissioner, if you'd like, um, and provide some fail rate data reflecting the last few build years. Uh, but that's my sense of the dynamic at this point. It's not necessary. I was just wondering if it was an ongoing issue. Sure. I think it, it, they're always, in an imperfect world, there can always be a failure, but we're working hard at reducing that rate. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, great work you're doing, and uh, we all uh, fully support it. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, the opportunity to acknowledge the 30th anniversary of the ADA today as well. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Assistant Thank Director you, uh, Perkins, David. yeah, back to, We're going to you. turn it over to, oh, awesome. We're going to actually turn it over to Cody Fidel, who's going to talk to us about uh, DBE programming. Okay. Thank you. Cody? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair Van Brocklin, uh, fellow commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, I am the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Small Business Program Manager for the Office of Civil Rights. Um, and again, for the record, my name is Cody Trudell. Um, so today I'm just going to give you some highlights of what we've been doing here recently um, in the Office of Civil Rights under the DBE program. Uh, so as prescribed by 49 CFR Part 26, ODA operates the Federal Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, or the DBE program, to assist DBEs on contracts that use USDOT funds. ODA must set overall goals for participation of DBEs in those contracts, including a goal for contracts using federal highway funds. This goal expresses the percentage of contract dollars ODOT might expect to go to DBEs if there were otherwise a level playing field for those companies. Last year, ODOT set an overall statewide DBE goal of 15.37% for federal fiscal years 2020, 2021, and 2022. This is a percentage of actual dollar amounts that are awarded to DBEs on federally funded contracts. Our first formal reporting period for this federal fiscal year was October 1st through March 31st, and we're very happy to report we achieved a 17.9% overall goal performance through that time period. Of that 17.9%, the goals we place on a contract as a requirement for a prime to meet or exceed before awarding them a contract, this is also what we refer to as race conscious, was 12.93%, while almost 5% of this overall goal came from those DBEs that were awarded a contract without a goal being set as a condition of award, or they were a prime. This is also referred to the race neutral category. As the year progresses forward, we'll continue to work with FHWA and monitor our contracts to help us continue to meet the overall goal. Um, also looking forward to the next triennial goal, we'll begin the procurement process this year to identify a consultant to conduct a full disparity study. ODOT has periodically conducted disparity studies since 2007 to analyze whether there is a level playing field for minority and women-owned firms in the Oregon transportation contracting industry. These disparity studies are in compliance with federal regulation, USDOT guidance, and Ninth Circuit case law. It's anticipated this process will take about a year to procure and also a year for the chosen contractor to conduct that research. Costs range around $700,000 for this. We'll continue to provide updates to the commission on our progress. Um, I know my Office of Urban Mobility Partners will be up next on deck, but before they um, talk, I'll touch briefly on two of their projects and where we've been with the DBE side of things. So first, I'd like to start with the I-5 bridge replacement. Um, so since the beginning of this year, our office has been working very closely with the Washington State Department of Transportation on the Bi-State Interstate Bridge Replacement Program, IBRP. 
to ensure the Office of Civil Rights Programs are implemented in thoughtful, innovative, and compliant ways, including the DBE program. Since the General Engineering Consultant, or the GEC contract, will include federal funding from both states, the project will not fall under one state DOT's DBE program. Through collaboration with Washington DOT and working with Federal Highway, an approved DBE goal setting methodology was developed, which included a two-step analysis of available certified firms in both states qualified to perform work on that contract along with a streamlined public comment process for the proposed overall goal. The approach was innovative while still meeting all federal DBE requirements. Based on the availability of certified firms in both states, FHWA approved a 15% DBE goal for the IBRP GEC agreement. A separate DBE goal will be analyzed and proposed for the construction phase of the IBRP as we progress. And then the second urban mobility project DBE um, report I would like to provide you on is on the I-5 Rose Quarter. The Office of Civil Rights has worked closely with the Office of Urban Mobility in setting the DBE goals on multiple contracts for I-5 Rose Quarter over the past year. To date, there are three executed contracts. The owner's rep contract, which was given an 8.5% DBE goal the independent cost estimator contract, which was given a 3% goal, and the professional and related services contract, which was given a 12% goal. All three of those contracts were exceeded at the time of award. The Office of Civil Rights now monitors the compliance and performance of those DBE contracts to ensure the commitments made by the primes at the time of award are met. The CMGC request proposal identified a goal range of 18 to 22 percent. As with the previous three contracts, upon award, we will continue to monitor the opportunities for DBEs and ensure compliance of the program and commitments made to any DBEs under this contract. We also stay really busy with our compliance pieces in the DBE program, and we conduct a lot of training. So the COVID shutdown began just as we were kicking off our annual statewide Office of Civil Rights trainings, which include DBE workforce, ADA, tarot, and all things that require compliance through the Office of Civil Rights. Traditionally, we provide these trainings in person to both internal and external partners and staff. We were able to pivot quickly and create an online training in the iLearn platform, which is now accessible to anyone upon creation of an iLearn account. While COVID prompted the creation of this platform, we are pleased that this option will continue as a tremendous resource that is both accessible and cost efficient for all of ODOT and our partners. I'd also like to provide you an update on certification and small business statuses. We continue to partner with the Oregon Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity, or COVID with a B, for the certification of businesses. As of July 8th, COVID had 712 DBEs certified. There were 2,716 firms with one or more certifications as a minority woman, service disabled veteran, or emerging small business certification. As you are well aware, the small business community has been particularly hit hard by the COVID pandemic. Our office has participated in many conferences, meetings, open forums, workshops, and virtual networking events since March to provide ourselves as a resource for small businesses. Our emails and newsletters help convey important information on everything from accessing financial assistance to technical advice. We will continue to monitor small business needs, adapting and tailoring the supportive services we provide to best meet those needs, especially during this difficult time. So with that, uh, I open the floor to any questions or comments. Thank you, Ms. Trudell. Great report. Uh, are there questions from the commission? Cody, this is Commissioner uh, Simpson. You flew, you flew through there a couple of acronyms. Did you uh, help with explain to the other commissioners? Um, tarot. Did you say tarot? Tarot, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, you cut out. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> tribal enforcement rights, um, which unfortunately I don't oversee in particular, but um, it was part of our training. 
Yeah, I just, uh, it, <laughs> folks in, in a lot of agencies tend to just refer to acronyms. And I don't know. I, mean, I appreciate the, the other commissioners do know what that is, but I, I would assume that they're probably, I don't know. I, I just want to make it clarity and also for the public that this is a, this is a public meeting. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Simpson. That's a great point. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? One last area, um, the the update that you had related from the October to March 17.9% prevalence on race conscious, can you break out those numbers based on specific racial ethnic groups? Um, yeah, I can get you that report. I can get it emailed to you. I don't have it handy right now, but I definitely can email you. Chair Van Brocklin, this is Commissioner Brown. Uh, just a comment. I think this is an area that in the state of Oregon, we really, really struggle um, with DBEs, especially in, in working in government myself um, and hitting our goals is so important and it's just, Kind of nice to see that there's a lot of work that's being done right now, um, and I hope that um, people realize that you know it's becoming broader. The the availability of DBEs is becoming broader, and so to be sure and check the lists all the time when they're contracting. And I hope that you know I know we're doing that, but I think that it's it's a good example for transit agencies. Um, in particular, who struggle to find DBEs. Really good point, Julie. Uh, appreciate it. So, other questions or comment? Go ahead, Orlando. One last one for Cody on the on the disparity studies. Um, I believe the last few studies have been conducted by the same firm. Can you confirm that, or have there been different firms in the last few studies? Disparity studies. Um, so we did a disparity study update in 2019, um, which was still under the same contract from the 2016 disparity study, which was with Keen Independent Research. Um, prior to that, I would have to research um, since I have only been here since 2017. But um, we will definitely keep you posted on an open procurement process as we proceed. This is Commissioner Callery. I have a question. Commissioner are, Callery. Are there, are there regional breakdowns for the uh, goals that you've set for DBE as far as the five ODOT regions, I'll say? Uh, great question, Commissioner. Um, I don't set um, so, for example, the 15.37 overall goal, we don't set them by regions or break that out into regions. Um, so, but each individual contract come, comes across my desk for review and the region it is in and the um, work for the, the DBE availability in that region is taken into account when I do look for setting contract goals. Thank you. Okay, further questions or comments? Well, Ms. Trudell, thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us and getting us up to speed on your work and that of your office. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll turn now to the urban mobility presentation, I think. And uh, Brendan, are you on the line? I am, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Uh, yes. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Brendan Finn, uh, Director of the Urban Mobility Office, coming to you live from Region 1. 
before we begin, I, I guess after watching that last presentation, I want to take the opportunity uh, to thank uh, and recognize the leadership uh, of Assistant Director Perkins, who's been really engaged and leaning in on our work. Um, obviously, it reflects our values uh, of what we're trying to bring to our projects and programs. Uh, Assistant Director Perkins and OCR have been uh, great partners. We look forward to that continued work, but just wanted to follow, follow up on that uh, after hearing their presentation and recognizing that. So, uh, here we are for your Urban Mobility Office status update. Um, again, I want to introduce the leadership of the office, uh, who I have with us today, Deputy Director Della Mosier, Toll Program Director Lucinda Broussard, and Rose Quarter Project Director Megan Channel. Michelle, next slide, please. Commissioners, I want to make it a practice of each of our status updates to give you the overall timing of our programs and our projects and where they stand. Obviously, there will be some changes to this as, as we move forward, uh, but I thought it's good to give this snapshot so you understand where things are. Today, I'd like you to pay particular attention to the Rose Quarter Improvement Project at the top line and the design and construction phase that you'll see at the end of 2021 and then going through quarter two of 2023. One of the beauties of the contracting process that we're going through the CMGC process, which Megan's going to talk about in greater detail, so I won't steal her thunder, is the ability to bring that contractor on board with our design team and have this prolonged period where we can work with the community, we can work with our stakeholders, we can work with other agencies to make sure we're building the best project to meet our goals, to meet our values, and to meet our outcomes. What I'd like to stress, and you'll hear this a number of times today, is that we are at 15% design of the Rose Quarter Improvement Project. We have 85% of the project yet to be designed. We now have an exciting announcement that was made earlier this week of a new partner we'll be bringing on board that reflects our values and that will help bring us to that ultimate goal and again, help us meet and have a project that meets the values and outcomes that we have, uh, that we've set up. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our toll program director because there's a lot of work going on there as well. So uh, Lucinda, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you now and say, uh, and we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. And we'll be back for questions at the end. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I'm going to take just a brief moment this afternoon to give you an update. Again, my name is Lucinda Broussard. I'm the toll, pro, I'm the toll program director. just want to give you an update on where we are, what we've been doing since the last time we showed up. Um, as you can see, my little slide here is just really about what, what's going on in the program. Next slide, please. I think I showed this one last time. Um, we talked about those diamonds, which are milestones, but I want to talk about that orange circle today. That orange circle starts the beginning of NEPA on I-205. We actually have a date for that. It's now August 3rd. It will start the 45-day comment period on the purpose and need statement and the alternatives for the project. Um, it, Kind of interesting because, you know, normally we'd be out talking to the community and we realize that during these times, we're not going to do that. We have really set in a lot. We are doing an online open house, a webinar. We're also going to do surveys, but we've engaged our community engagement liaisons, which we call them. Um, they're out in the communities. They may not speak English as a first language. So we've asked them to help us reach other communities. So they'll be able to do Zoom meetings. They're talking about, they kind of have some ideals of how they want to reach their communities by messaging, Facebook, um, and they'll do that in their communities, reaching others that maybe we won't reach because we're not out there at all. Um, the other great news is that our partners are allowing us to use their websites and their newsletters to actually get the word out that the comment period has began and that you know you can come and, and actually leave your comment. 
So I think that that's really exciting. The diamonds are the milestones as we go throughout NEPA. So we're going to start in August and we're going to end somewhere in August 22. So those diamonds say we're going to hit some milestones as we go through, but we plan to finish in the uh, 2022 about the same time as now. Next slide, please. So I, I think we had this before, but you know, during the value pricing analysis, there are comments being made. And you know, we're out there now talking about what's going on for the toll project and providing updates. And we're hearing, I kind of like list seven here that we hear pretty consistently out there. And it's like, I wanted you to see what people are asking us or what they're commenting about. I, underline the last three because the last three are the ones that I believe the project can actually do something about. We can get some more analysis and we can actually address these. There are a few on here that are we're building into the program when people say, how do tolls work? What are modern tolls? Do I have to stop at a toll booth? You know, I think we're weaving that into our message now. No stopping, all electronic. So I think that that one we're weaving into our project. Um, but those last three are ones that really have to be pulled out. So if you can go to the next slide. So we put them into three questions. It's income equity, how, how are we going to do that in a toll program? Transit, Clackamas County says they don't have a robust transit system, which means there's no additional alternatives for paying a toll um, and then the one with the cars and the minivan, that's about diversion. What happens when people start diverting through the neighborhoods? So if you can go to the next slide. In addressing these questions, we've kind of done some things that kind of help us get there. So one of the things is setting up a regional modeling group. And um, this one says data share because that's the last thing they did. So on July 2nd, they brought in um, all their regional, all our regional partners, as you can see, we took a great photo. Um, and we talked about the analysis that we had performed on the five of alternatives, how we did it, what does diversion look like in those models? Um, and we turned over not only our analysis, but all the data also. We've also set up some workshops. So now they have the data. And now what does that look like for your community specifically? So we did it based on the whole corridor. Uh, our regional partners are doing it based on their cities. So we've actually gone to Clackamas County Diversion Group or Committee. We, we answered questions there on Monday. We're expecting others to call us and say, you know what, we looked at your analysis. We've done some. Here's what it looks like. So we can bring all the data together and come up with a solution. Next slide. Again, there were three questions. One of them was income equity. Um, we convened the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee. They are going on their first, uh, first project meeting. They've had two meetings previously, a reception and a listening session. Um, the next meeting on July 28th will be more project-based. They'll, they'll go through a equity framework and try to lay equity over tolls. What does that mean and how does it work in diverse groups? We're talking income, but we also have health, we have transit. There are many people identified in this group who help in different areas. So all of that will come forward through the Equity Mobility Advisory Committee. Next. And the yeah. third one, we, bless you. The third one we talked about was the transit and multimodal. Um, Clackamas County saying they don't have robust transit. We've convened a group to talk about what transit looks like now using the regional modeling group and the equity group influencing how transit will work in the future and what we can do to help there. Next slide, please. So here were the seven. There were three I talked about that we were working on. There was also a few that I said we could weave into the program. And then there's this one, and it's really, it's one that's that's more for you than for us. It says, how is that revenue gonna be used? Everybody's very concerned about paying a toll and where the toll, where the toll money goes. Um, so this one, I, I, I want to bring forward. If you can go to the next slide. 
specifically on I-205, we have dual objectives, raise revenue and manage demand. Manage demand, we're working on that one. Raise revenue is one we're working on too, as you can see from the gauge. The gauge is really saying we could do both effectively. Once we raise revenue, the question then bears, where does that revenue go? So next slide, please. I have some total workshops that I'm proposing. Don't, don't try to read this one. This one's very littered with many things, but there are a lot of things to get tolling implemented. Um, if you can see the quarter three that, I think it's turquoise slide, uh, star, says I-205 revenue dedication. So I'd like to come back and talk to you next month about dedicating revenue on I-205 to I-205. Um, if you can go to the next slide. It's really about the toll program. As you can see, it goes all the way out to 2026. And there are a lot of steps along the way. And I think all of those are very important like educational moments that we can have together for a toll workshop. So I'd like to propose that also that we get together for just informational only to explain how tolling works and then what that program looks like totally. Thank you for your time. Della Mosier, Deputy Director, will do the I-205 update. Thank you, Lucinda. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, Michelle, could you please move on to the next slide? Or that slide is perfect. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucinda, for, uh, for the record. My name is Della Mosier, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Urban Mobility Office. Uh, I'll start with an update on the design and construction phases for the I-205 Stafford Road to OR-213 project, commonly known as the I-205 Abernathy Bridge project. The team has continued working in earnest to deliver the design of the 60% plans for phase one next month in August, and are still working to deliver the 60% design plans for phase two by the end of the year. As part of our design efforts earlier this week, the Oregon City Planning Commission unanimously approved ODOT's land use permit with conditions for the proposed project. As we've talked about at the commission meeting in May, the design phases are fully funded through House Bill 2017. However, we have yet to identify funds for the construction of phases one and two that you saw on the overall timeline slide that Brendan presented earlier. We continue to work to identify funds from all possible sources, including federal and state funding opportunities, leveraging local partnerships, and also through toll revenue, as Lucinda discussed. Please advance to the next slide. I'd also like to give the commission an update on the portion of the project that is funded for construction, the real-time signs project. These near-term improvements to the I-205 corridor are estimated to cost around $5 million. The real-time signs portion of the project has been under construction for the past few months, and in the past few weeks, there were a few nighttime closures of I-205 that were performed successfully. These closures allowed the contractor to install the foundations and posts and mount signs. Work over the next few months will include significant behind-the-scenes work to hook up power and test the system to get the signs up and running. Completion of the project is expected by this fall. The new signs on I-205 are a key addition to the system-wide real-time sign network that currently exists on several roads and highways in the Portland metro area. Please advance to the next slide. It is now my pleasure to provide an update on the Interstate Bridge Replacement or IBR project. Our new program administrator, Greg Johnson, began his position with ODOT on July 6. Mr. Johnson has led major infrastructure programs in Maryland and Michigan, including early involvement on the Gordy Howe International Bridge Project. The process that led to the selection of our new program administrator included a national candidate search, followed by stakeholder and community interviews. We are extremely excited to have Mr. Johnson lead the Bi-State Interstate Bridge Replacement Program Office. In his role, he will be responsible to both the ODOT Director and WashDOT Secretary for the IBR program. We look forward to his leadership in providing a transparent, data-driven process that prioritizes equity and inclusion as an integral fabric of this nationally significant program. 
Welcome to Greg, to the team. Please advance to the next slide. The team has also been busy reviewing proposals and evaluating interviews for the General Engineering Consultant contract, the GEC contract, for the Interstate Bridge. As Cody mentioned in the previous agenda item, a 15% design uh, disadvantaged business enterprise goal was assigned to the project for this initial environmental reevaluation phase of the program. Both WASHDOT and ODOT DBE, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Leads, work together to maximize the goal with our federal partners prior to advertisement. The team also held a pre-proposal meeting to assist those DBE firms in contracting prime firms prior to the submittal date. Please advance to the next slide. Our activities this summer will, focus, will include a focus on continued re-engagement with our stakeholders and partners, with our first executive steering group ESG meeting later this summer. The ESG membership selection is underway and will include a representative from each of the bi-state partner agencies, as well as a community re representative from each state who will serve as co-chairs of the community advisory group. So we have the ESG and the CAG. As I mentioned, the selection of the general engineering consultant is underway as well, and we expect the selected firm to be announced later this month. The selection of the GEC is a key milestone that allows ODOT, WASHDOT, and the consultant team, which will be led by Mr. Johnson, to begin the environmental work that will meet our obligation to our federal partners to initiate the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, or SEIS, by July of 21 that you see here on the schedule. We expect the selected firm to be announced later this month. With that, I will turn to Megan and Brendan for an update on the I-5 Rose Quarter project. Thank you, Della. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, I'm Megan Channel, the project director for the I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project. Um, and Michelle, if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, and I'm here to provide you uh, this afternoon with a brief overview on our recent project activities. So next slide, please. So the most significant activity, um, which you heard uh, from Brendan earlier in the presentation, is that we've uh, taken action um, and continued to build our team by bringing on an important partner, our CMGC contractor. And the CMGC contractor is going to help us design and build a project that reflects the community input and values. So on Monday, we issued a notice of intent to award for that CMGC contract uh, to Hamilton Sunt, the joint venture in association with Raymore. And this is a significant milestone for ODOT uh, and one that really demonstrates doing business differently. ODOT, for the first time in the Portland metro region, is bringing on a contractor through the CMGC process early in the design phase um, and has also developed the CMGC specifications that have been responsive to and incorporate community recommendations. Based on those recommendations, uh, we've set goals to achieve a lot of the value-based outcomes. Um, and specifically, uh, we've requested that the CMGC meet a goal range of 18 to 22 percent for disadvantaged business enterprises. You heard um, Cody mention that in her presentation as well. I just want to emphasize that that equates to about 103 million to 130 million, 39 million dollars for DBEs. Um, so that is a, a significant action um, in our in our step forward. And. Uh, in addition to the DBE goal range, uh, we also have workforce goals that are part of uh, this contract. And so the workforce goals include 20% goal for apprenticeship, um, as well as a 25% goal for minority male workers and a 14% goal for female workers. So uh, bringing on the CMGC partner, as Brendan mentioned, is really um, helping us to build community partnerships as we'll be working together with the contractor and the community um, together in developing the project. Um, it will also help us increase economic opportunities uh, as we provide support to build up the trades uh, and provide a pipeline for DBE and workforce capacity through um, the specifications in their contract through technical assistance and mentor protege program. Uh, it'll also help us optimize innovation as we develop the project with the contractor engaging early in the design 
to identify cost and schedule risks that we can address early uh, and reduce. The next slide, please. So this slide here just demonstrates the design phase and sort of the design arc of the project. Uh, and again, strategically bringing on the CMGC early to work through with us and the community at every phase um, before we get to construction. So as Brendan mentioned, um, that we are very early in our design and we still have a lot of work to do. We're at about a 15% design right now, and that means that we have 85% to go. Um, so this diagram just again shows how we progress from where we are today um, and, into, and where we have to go. So at 15% right now, we have a high level design concept that's based on the prior planning processes um, that uh, led into the environmental review process and, and where we are in our design today. And beginning in spring of next year, we'll shift into and start the 30% design phase. So during this phase, the design concepts are really um, start to become established. And at the end of the 30% design phase, we have a true understanding of the project footprint uh, and the right of way needs. But again, it's still at the design concept level. So as we approach the end of 2021, we'll shift into the 60% design phase. And this is where those design concepts uh, are refined and the design details are progressed. This then continues into a 90% design in 2022, where uh, the design details become, start to become finalized. And then into 2023, where we reach the 100% design mark, um, which would be a design that's then ready for construction. Uh, and with this, of course, along the way, we'll be engaging the community and our partners to inform these design decisions. But if I, if I leave you with nothing else today, um, I just wanna emphasize and, and put a fine point on, we are very early in design. There is a lot of time and a lot of work to do um, to come to the design decisions uh, that we have in front of us to make the most successful and best project moving forward. So next slide. Thank you. So as we move through that design process, we of course will be working under the guidance um, with our project governance structure. Uh, with uh, guidance again from the Executive Steering Committee, Community Advisory Committee, and Community Opportunities Advisory Committees that have been stood up. And it's through these partnerships that we'll be able to truly design and build a successful project that reflects the community desired outcomes. Next slide. So the Executive Steering Committee right now is actively engaged in defining the values for our work. So on the screen here, you'll see the draft proposed values um, defined by the steering committee. Uh, they include restorative justice, community input, mobility focus, and climate action and improved public health. So these values have been crafted by our regional and community partners and will continue to guide the project and our decision-making process moving forward. And we look forward to the executive steering committee's continued refinement of these values in anticipation of their adoption at their next meeting in September. And next slide. So as part of a last part of my update today, I'll conclude my presentation with a brief update on the other technical analyses items that I know that you have a com that you as a commission have directed us to complete. So the first is the completion of the environmental peer review. Um, as you know, the peer review panel of air quality, noise, and greenhouse gas uh, experts from across the nation um, completed their review and submitted the final report on June 2nd, marking the completion um, of, of that item. And the report supports the environmental assessment findings and provides recommendations for us as a team to incorporate during the project's uh, future design and construction phases. We also continue our active coordination with the Federal Highway Administration to complete the NEPA decision document for the environmental assessment. And of course, we remain committed to fulfilling your direction to complete a highway cover evaluation uh, and understand that this is of primary interest to our partners and the community. The highway cover work really presents, I think, one of the most significant opportunities that we have to provide community connections and establish partnerships for economic development uh, that can help achieve a broader vision for the area. So we're contracted with ZGF and we'll be moving forward with this important work under the guidance of the Executive Steering Committee's values and in a way that will be responsive to and addressing our partners' needs. So that concludes my project update for today. Brendan, I will hand it back to you. 
Great, thank you, Megan. Go, to the, go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Michelle, thank you. Uh, so, Chair, uh, Commissioners, as you can see, not much going on. <laughs> Uh, we're keeping pretty we're we're keeping pretty busy. Uh, so with that, uh, we just gave you a lot to digest in a short period of time. Uh, but we obviously want to get your feedback, uh, answer any questions you might have. So we want to give you that opportunity right now. So we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank the entire panel. Uh, great presentations, and uh, appreciate the time and effort that you put into it. Uh, Questions from the commission to uh, this panel? I do want to say that the contract that was announced this week really is historic as uh, direct, uh, project director channel was mentioning. It's, a, it's an extraordinary step forward, both in the method in which we're working with the uh, various advisors on these projects and uh, uh, specialists, uh, and and also uh, just a dramatic, uh, in this case, commitment to uh, uh, to ensuring that we have uh, very substantial MBE involvement. So, I uh, I really want to uh, just take a second here to recognize all the work that's been done. Uh, from the director Strickler right on through uh, to this to the urban mobility office and elsewhere to uh, to get us to this stage uh, very uh, it's just great work so thank you all so uh, are there questions or comments about this presentation uh, chair I, I have some but I definitely want to make sure that I defer to the other commissioners first as I this is Commissioner Smith. I'm having a really hard time hearing you, Lando. I don't know if there's anything you can do. How's that? That's a little better. Okay, I think it's my mic, so it's further away. I was saying that I would prefer to lean on. Um, you, Commissioner Cowery and Commissioner Brown, thoughts or comments from this matter. So, I'm going to trench on it, and there are any that I would chime in, but we're doing this first. I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. How's that? That's better. So again, what I was saying is I wanted to defer to the other commissioners. And since I'm so heavily involved, I could follow up afterwards if you guys have comments first. Okay, uh, Commissioner Callery, Commissioner Brown, or Commissioner well, this Smith is Commissioner well. Callery. <clears throat> I'd like to have some idea of the impact of some of our partners taking a breather, I guess, from the project, uh, and how is that impacting the movement forward on this project? So this is Rose Quarter, Martin. Yes, please. So, so Brendan, why don't you lead off on that? Sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, you know, we, we've had some great work done by uh, the Executive Steering Committee thus far in, our, in just the two meetings. Um, what we hope is the, uh, some of the work that we've done on the values and outcomes and some of the work that we're doing now really shows and demonstrates uh, where we are as a project of showing, uh, showing real actions towards meeting uh, some of the objectives that, that they've pointed out. So, uh, we've uh, we've obviously done done that, Commissioner, and, and some of the things you got briefed on today, uh, and we will we will continue to do so to earn people's uh, earn people's trust and uh, and and continue to just show show by our deeds. Lando, do you want to add to that? Uh, since you 
chair the steering committee or not either is fine yeah i, I mean i i think the, the group has been doing great work and hats off to, to megan and brendan and even staff and della for that matter as well we've been you know pushing this this boulder up the hill um you know the uh what what i think what what could be perceived or or uh, or uh understood i guess in the media is not necessarily the the, the entire narrative and I, I i would you know just want to take this time to to ensure that people understand that the the agency and staff focus on this project they're definitely doing what 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 is what they've been directed to by not only the commission but what's been asked of the community and um and i'm just you know adamant about making sure that we can continue to move forward in a way that's going to yield and foster you know that restorative justice um element that was identified in the report to create the outcomes we're all striving to achieve and so um it'll be uh a lot more to come but again if, if there's if there's aren't anything if there's anything else I, I i would like to jump in and ask a couple questions sure let me why don't it's as you suggested a minute ago why don't i ask uh, commissioner brown if she has any comment uh, so um as or, question, Marshall, or question or so, question I guess I should say this is Commissioner Brown. Um, as as Martin pointed out, I was a little taken back this week when when we got the letter, or last week when we got the letter about the Rose Quarter and, and our partners. And my concern was that you know we have a long ways to go, and, and this is a, a project that's going to take a long period of time. And I just want to thank both the chair and the vice chair for taking this on, since you're in the Portland Portland metro area. Um, it's a difficult one, and as a commissioner from from the southern part of the state, um, I I know that my fellow commissioners were looking at every piece of this, and I think that the um, mobility office is really the urban mobility office is really trying um, hard to to make this work, and I think that if we can all just pause and and um, it will come together. I, I truly think that you'll come to a solution. I just want to thank you. And I'm just rambling at this point, but it's really difficult for me as a commissioner from this area to, to know exactly what's going on, but I trust um, the work that ODOT's doing because I've never seen this kind of work done on any mega project or any project, period. Um, there's a lot of work being put into it and we are trying to be careful. So to, um, the people of the state of Oregon, we are listening. And I guess that's my point is I think we are listening. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, appreciate Mr. your thoughts Chair? and comments. Yes. Um, Commissioner Smith here. Um, I too have been thinking a lot about this and, and I'm fairly new to the commission and I, I really appreciate all the work that the chair and the vice chair have been doing kind of hands on because you live in the community and our team who I think is, is trying to go down a road that, that is new for ODOT where we're focused on more community building and equity and inclusion. And, and I, this is maybe more of a conversation for tomorrow as we kind of work out, do our workshop, but it seems to me that we need to do a better job as a commission of listening and which is not in any reflection of the work that everybody's done, but I, for one, feel like I, I don't know that we have done, we have at a commission level, had a really good process for listening to the community. Uh, you know, we had public hearings and that's a little artificial where people come and they have five minutes and they make their point, but there's really no back and forth. I mean, there's no opportunity for a really good dialogue. And so I'm just thinking out loud a little bit that maybe in the future, there's an opportunity for the entire commission to have more of an inclusive conversation with the community that um, is affected by this project. And I just throw that out as a, 
let's talk, talk about it some more maybe in our workshop because I'd like to make sure that we are really hearing and understanding what the concerns are. So, my two cents. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so now, uh, Vice Chair Simpson. Thanks, and, and thanks for those comments. I actually really do like that suggestion, um, Commissioner Smith. Um, because uh, as this thing continues to grow and build, it's going to become a, a living organism of its own. And, and it's, it's always good, I think, to have um, those that are not within Region 1 or representing Region 1 to provide their perspective and just get a better, clear understanding of what goes on in Region 1 because there's so many needs <clears throat> and there's obviously so much community input that goes into the investments ODOT makes and um, trying to bridge that gap in terms of what the perception is and of how ODOT has operated historically um, up in this region and for other regions for that for that matter, I think is going to be a it's going to take a lot of time and effort and energy. And um, quite frankly, I just think it's it's really important for folks to hear from other commissioners that represent other areas around the around the state and get their perspective on, on how these things play out. So I definitely support um, your interest in being involved because it's clearly there's a lot more work to go. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, but I wanted to uh, maybe pull Megan back up here just for just for public reference, since Megan has an urban planning background and just trying to get a better lens and idea and understanding around just the contract development and, and Commissioner Smith and uh, uh, Chair Van Brocklin, you probably are very privy to this, um, like 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 a few of us. Just what 15% design actually looks like from like a community development standpoint. Does that mean, you know, we're thinking about sidewalks? Does that mean the structure is halfway built? Does that mean um, you're still just, you know, you have your architect and engineer, you're still designing? Does that mean, you know, where you're permitting? I think it's it's important for people to hear and know about what, what where we're at right now, 15%, what that really means as it relates to a development or a massive project. Sure. Thank you for the question, Vice Chair. Um, so, yeah, 15% is really the kind of initial phase of design concept. Um, I will, I will use a, the like the highway covers as an example and sort of how you'd kind of carry those through where we are today and and what we have going forward. So, at a 15% design level, we know that we're going to have highway covers, um, but we don't know their exact footprint yet. But we know that the that our sideboards are include highway covers. Um, as we progress from the 15% design phase into the 30% design phase, where um, we're really establishing the footprint, the space um, of those highway covers, is it does it remain the two highway covers that we have today? Might there be consideration of one highway cover? How long are the highway covers? What is the orientation of the highway covers as they relate to um, the I-5 corridor and the local street system, how strong are the highway covers, um, meaning what will they have the capacity to hold on top? Um, the question of buildings comes into play. So that's, that's the work that happens from our 15% design mark now up through, um, you know, it's 30% design um, and, and beyond. And then as we get into the 60% design mark, that's where you're talking about, all right, well, now we, now we know the shape and size and, and kind of type of the highway covers and their footprint and the, the right of way needs um, associated with them. Well, if they're going to, if they're going to accommodate, you know, a structure where, where would that structure go? And that's kind of in the 60%. What, how is that structure accessed? Uh, what do the sidewalks look like? How wide are um, or kind of what are the details of, of the sidewalks and potentially the bike facilities and the roadways. And then into 90%, it's kind of a crossing your T's, dotting your I's, uh, and then into 100% uh, the final design. So um, I hope that that example helps kind of illustrate the um, sort of the how truly at the beginning of the design work we are and how much work there is to go um, moving forward. I'll also add um, that as we get into the 60% and 90% mark of design uh, with a CMGC process that we have, um, that's the focus becomes uh, not only on the design detail, but a significant focus on risk mitigation and cost certainty. 
Um, and as you get into the 60% design mark, uh, that's also where you're coming up with the constructability pieces. So how, what's the plan for how you're building the project? Uh, what's the specific staging um, that's gonna be done? What are the specific closures and detour routes that you're gonna need to um, build the project as well? So um, just wanted to make sure that those details didn't get lost in that either. So Vice Chair, I hope that that answers your question. Absolutely. Um, and then you, earlier you had indicated uh, the DBE opportunity um, in terms of um, resources and then Cody gave a pretty good high level um, update on just percentages and, and, I, and I will be standing by to, to get the more detailed um, financial data and, and more um, data related to demographics around the race conscious numbers. But in the meantime, I just want to clarify that one, I think you said 103 to 130 million, right? 139 million. Okay, sorry. Ooh, next. <laughs> so, um, that, that number, it, does that not include the A&E soft costs, essentially? That's solely just hard costs? Yeah, Vice Chair, you're correct. Um, that is for the work that is done by the CMGC contractor. So the, yes, the, the construction um, packages moving forward, that's the 18 to 22 percent, 103 million to 139 million that is on top of um, the percentages that Cody referenced for our A&E design team at 12 percent, um, the owner's representative team at eight and a half percent, and then the independent cost estimator at three percent, um, as well as our third party highway cover evaluation team. Yeah, okay. And so, um, as it relates to that, I mean, all in, soft and hard, what would you say that that number would end up being if everything goes according to plan? I would not feel comfortable guessing right now, but I can definitely follow up with you on what that number would be. What I'll also say is that moving forward, um, we are uh, going to be putting together dashboards to be reporting out this information across the project. Um, and where we stand um, with our uh, just overall project uh, sort of status, but um, specifically our DBE goals and utilization of those. Okay. And then a couple of other things. Um, what has been um, the history and track record as it relates to um, this 130 million that is essentially um, being teed up for the DB community. Is this uh, is this standard for a project? Is this low? Is this high? I'm just trying to provide, get some understanding on how this measures up to some of the other ma major projects and investments ODOT has made within into the DBE community. Yeah. So with within ODOT um, and recent history, the Rose Quarter project is definitely the highest dollar value contract um, that we've seen um, in recent years and. Specifically, the DBE percentage here at 18 to 22 percent um, is also one of the highest that we've seen. So you add the two together with the high percentage and the high contract value, we're getting those high dollar values um, for the DBE community as well. And as we were working with, um, as we were working with the community and who have expertise um, in, you know, minority contracting, specifically through our Community Opportunities Advisory Committee. When we were putting together the CMGC specifications, one of the, the TriMet was always held um, and continues to be held as a model uh, for this work um, and that their goals um, are often, you know, 20%. And um, based on the feedback that we've been hearing from the community, ODOT, ha we, we historically haven't been at that 20% mark um, for, for major projects like this. So the fact that Rose Quarter is coming in at the 18 to 22%, um, is significant um, and also um, demonstrates a, a step forward in, in doing that business differently. Yeah, it's almost like a prerequisite to a lot of other than major opportunities that are coming up in Region 1. Uh, there was one other thing. Um, I, I think what, what is going to be really important for, uh, and this is why I think it's important that other commissioners are involved on this, because it's not solely just the DBE conversation. I think people tend to over overstep and see the importance of workforce and 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 the other subcontracting opportunities that could potentially be coming out of this um, just with the majority firms. And I think that's something that we shouldn't neglect in this conversation 
uh, because I'm sure there's going to be diverse hiring um, elements to this project that are going to be super important because these are really good paying jobs. And as we're in a, again, a, a pandemic, which is really a, a um, recession on the verge of a depression, um, as people know me, I, I like to just go straight to the numbers because that's that's where the that's where the that's where the facts are. And so I really think it's important that there is a narrative and some tracking and and, a, and really a dashboard around not only just the DD piece but the workforce piece and the impacts that those dollars, our public dollars, are going to have on this historically marginalized community, which is obviously creating a lot of attention and a lot of um, anxiety around how this project plays itself out. So. Even though I, I, I know that the team is going to continue to work with its stakeholders um, in the in the region and, and right there on the on, on the ground in the community, I definitely think um, a step towards building some kind of dashboard or metrics where there's a narrative and story that that articulates this investment that was uh, that was approved through House Bill 17 and that ROI on that historically marginalized and specifically black community, I think is going to be an, an important testament to uh, to conveying to the public how ODOT um, conducts business. Um, and I just didn't know if you had any thoughts on, on, on that next step in terms of tracking those, those, those data points. On, yeah, on the workforce side, um, definitely. And, I, you know, that will be as we, the workforce that obviously comes uh, closer to construction, but those will be important conversations with our CMGC as they're coming on board. How are we, how are we setting ourselves up for success uh, as, for that workforce? What's the technical assistance that we can provide um, through, you know, um, a mini CMGC or mentor protege program um, within to make sure that we're building that pipeline for, um, for success, not only for our project, um, but for future projects um, to come um, and those, economic, those long term economic opportunities. Great. Well, I, I appreciate the report and I don't know if any others have anything to chime in, but I just want folks to know that I think the team has done great work. Um, there's been a, there's been a lot of speed bumps and, and, and road bumps, I guess, to a, to a getting here, but obviously without struggle, there is no progress. And those are words of Frederick Douglass. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a really important testament to the, to the commitment that staff has made. And most importantly, you know, the, 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 I wouldn't, I would go remiss if I didn't mention the, the director and his, and his leadership. And I really think him coming into this agency leading with a heavily, heavily, heavy focus on um, equity and diversity and inclusion, I think is, is, is super important because it's, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. It's, it's, it's a culture shift. Um, that is not typically standard in state DOTs. And so I commend him for those efforts and I understand that it's not gonna happen overnight. I understand that these things take time, um, especially when you're, when you're working on um, significant shifts like this in agencies of this size. But I think uh, day by day, people are gonna become more inclined to seeing the value and importance of putting people first, human lives first and economic prosperity first in our ecosystem. And I'm just excited to see how this thing plays itself out. And um, I'm gonna continue to be involved and adamant about getting to the outcomes that we're all striving to achieve. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions of this panel? Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. I'd like to move now a little out of order because uh, Commissioner Simpson has got to depart a little early. I'd like to take up, uh, I hope that Chris is available to help on this. Um, I'd like to take up the uh, only other decision point we have today, which is the uh, consent calendar. And I will just say on the record that uh, there are uh, various of my law firm's clients uh, who are involved in various of these right-of-way negotiations. Uh, and so uh, for that reason, in an abundance of caution, I'm going to declare a possible or potential conflict of interest and recuse myself from uh, voting on this uh, matter, uh, that matter being uh, consent calendar uh, right-of-way uh, acquisition uh, proposal at, uh, I think it's consent item three. Uh, I bet I'll be able to vote on the rest. Chris, are you there?
I am here, sir. Thank you very much for that. You uh, opened it well. So given the potential conflicts uh, for consent item three, can we pull forward consent item three? And I would ask for a motion uh, for that calendar item. Is there a motion? Commissioner Smith, I move uh, approval of consent item number three. There's been a motion. Is there a second on consent item oh, three? Commissioner Callery, second. Second by Commissioner Callery. Discussion? All right, if not, I'll call a roll. Uh, call vote. Uh, Commission Chair Van Brocklin abstains. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Brown votes yes. Commissioner Callery? Yes. Commissioner Callery votes yes. Commissioner Simpson? Yes. Commissioner Simpson votes yes. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Smith votes yes. Okay. Uh, Chris? Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, rest of the Commission, I would ask for a motion on the remaining consent calendar items in block, those being consent items number one, two, and four through 14. Is there such a motion? This is Commissioner Gallery. I move for the approval of the remaining consent items one, two, and four through 14. Commissioner Callery proposes approval of all remaining items on the consent calendar. Is there a second? Is Commissioner Brown, I'll second. Commissioner Brown seconds. Is there a discussion? The commission chair votes, uh, if, uh, votes yes, so I'll start with myself. Uh, Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Simpson? Aye. Yes. Commissioner Callery? Yes. All right. That also uh, is approved. So thank you all very much for that. Thank you, Director Strickler. Uh, and with that, we will move to uh, our next item, which is the climate item uh, at item K. Great. So thank you, Chair Van Brocklin. This is Amanda Peets, uh, Director of ODOT's Climate Office. Nice to be with you here again this afternoon. Um, so I have a distinguished panel here with me of um, heavy hitters, all the directors from the four agencies collaborating on climate efforts known as Every Mile Counts. Um, a few of the directors have conflicts at 3 p.m., so I'm going to be mindful of time and uh, kind of going quickly through some of the background slides to make sure that I'm giving them enough time to share with you some of the work efforts they're leading across this multi-agency climate effort, as well as highlight some of the things that uh, they are engaging in as well um, that support uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation efforts. Uh, so next slide. So Amanda, before you continue, I just want to sure. I just want to say one thing, and that is that uh, the commission chairs for there are four agencies involved here, three of which have commissions, uh, and the commission chairs have been, uh, including myself, have been involved in this work. And I I just want to uh, I want to thank the directors of these four agencies uh, for the work they've done and that their staffs have done. Uh, Directors often get the uh, blame, but rarely the credit uh, for good work like this. And I uh, have been very impressed with the, this group of directors and the staffs of these uh, agencies, including our own Amanda Peets and Jerry Bohard, who have both been uh, involved in this work. So I, I want to thank the staffs and I want to particularly thank the directors and appreciate their being here today to talk to us. So I'll turn it back to you, Amanda. Great. Thank you, Chair Van Brocklin, and for your time and leadership on that group as well and informing that process. Um, so we created this collaboration based on uh, the leadership and direction set by Governor Brown and her executive order. And really, it's in recognition that uh, transportation emissions have been on the rise. Uh, they're the biggest contributor for emissions in the state. And that reducing emissions is not just within the purview of the Department of Transportation. It's really a collaboration across state agencies with our local partners and then with the private sector as well. 
Um, so we work closely under the counsel of uh, Christian Sheeran um, and others in meeting and collaborating, culling through the statewide transportation strategy to look for the effective actions um, that require cross-agency collaboration um, and really highlighting those. We created a draft work plan in May of this year and we shared that with the public. We received back over uh, 300 individual comments on that and we took those into consideration to make some adjustments to the work plan. So if any of you had seen a previous draft, some of the big things that we have done are to um, add more explicit discussion of equity and in particular climate justice and recognition that the communities who are likely most impacted negatively by the impacts of climate change are likely the least responsible for those impacts, including communities of color, uh, indigenous populations, and low-income populations. Um, so really solidifying our commitment to work with um, these uh, frontline communities in finding the right solutions and trying to prioritize investments within those areas as we do our work. The other thing that we highlighted in the Every Miles Counts uh, revision between May and June was that um, we were more explicit about other climate actions that are being pursued beyond the Every Mile Counts work. So this is a two-year work plan. It's really our first shot at taking priorities um, and addressing some of these climate issues for actions that, again, require multiple agencies to get together and coordinate. There are some actions in addition to these that single agencies really have the authority and responsibility for, and they are also pursuing. And so you'll see in the presentation today, as I turn it over to the directors from the various agencies, they'll talk about some of the work efforts that they're leading as part of the Every Mile Counts work, but also giving a little bit broader context on some of the other efforts they're engaged in towards climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, next slide. Um, so we set out three primary objectives for this work. So obviously the first and foremost of which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, Vice Chair Simpson, this goes to an earlier point that you raised uh, in the agenda early this morning um, where we talked about reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a multifaceted approach um, that requires us to take actions under several different areas, including trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled per capita and that's really around um, how do we support utilization of low and no carbon modes like biking and walking, higher capacity modes like public transportation or ride sharing, um, telecommuting options, and uh, other strategies that reduce uh, single, mile, single occupancy trips. Um, and then cleaner vehicles and fuels is obviously part of that as well as people continue to drive and need to access their critical destinations. Um, how do we make every mile driven a little bit cleaner? And then lastly, really trying to integrate greenhouse gas emissions into all of our decision making as, uh, aspects as well as partnering with our local jurisdiction. Um, so these objectives were combined with the equity considerations that I mentioned earlier in climate justice. Um, as well as interest in trying to walk our talk as state agencies. Um, so again, this is a two-year work plan, next slide, um, that we'll be refining over time, um, kind of in a long-term commitment to taking on some of these actions. So the priority efforts that are shown here in this slide um, are just our first take at things that we know we need to tackle and start to address and really we see as foundational aspects moving forward. Um, so I'll turn it over to each agency to talk a little bit about uh, some of the actions that they are leading and again, uh, some of the other work that is going on. And I believe uh, Director Jim Rue from the Department of Land Conservation and Development is up first. So Director Rue, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, gladly. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Are we good? Thank you. Um, so. Um, Chairman Brockland, Commissioners, Director Sprickler, for the record, uh, Jim Rue, Director of the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to, to do this presentation. Um, it partly pays back all the time that Amanda spends in front of LCDC. Um, she has been appearing at virtually every meeting for the last six months uh, to the point where uh, some of our commissioners think that she now works for us. And we would be very proud if she did because she obviously is extraordinary. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you to all of the staff for your work on this. 
Um, as, as Amanda suggested, I'm going to do just two slides. The first one is already up, and this is the area where the four agencies, um, in particular ODOT, DEQ, and DLCD, uh, are working on three very specific projects. And then the second slide, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the other work that we're doing. Um, but regardless of whether it's this slide or the next one, as Amanda suggested, as others have suggested, um, all of this work is centered on equity, on trying to meet the needs of historically marginalized communities, people who've been left out of the conversation, people who have been left out of the benefits of many of these programs. And so specifically, um, one of the things that we're doing um, is engaging members of the community uh, in ways that we've never done before. So we're bringing them in early for conversations. Uh, we are also issuing stipends on our uh, rules advisory committees uh, to people who've never been represented there before. So specifically on, uh, on housing, uh, we are in the middle of uh, a couple of very large uh, housing rules uh, we have issued stipends um, uh, by signing contracts uh, with organizations that represent the unhoused, uh, as well as people who are, uh, who have been marginalized uh, in, in these conversations about housing for, for, for decades, for, for a century or longer in Oregon. So um, we're, we're trying to bring together advocates from across the spectrum, but also those people who've never been in the room uh, when these rules are being crafted before. So we're doing that now with housing, and uh, we will be doing it with our transportation planning rule um, that will be kicking off. Um, our commission initiates rulemaking and they will be kicking off that rule at our September meeting. Um, and it will take about a year and a half to do this transportation planning rule. Um, the TPR is <clears throat> the rule that actually implements goal 12, which in the Oregon State Planning System uh, is, the, is the system, um, or, or is the rule rather, the goal that, that addresses transportation. Um, we think, and I think our role here, um, is that the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. And this is where housing and transportation, equity and climate all come together. Uh, if we do this right, we're going to be incorporating uh, new uh, uh, provisions of rules about uh, the density of housing, the kind of housing, uh, that is along uh, frequently uh, served uh, transportation routes. Uh, but it also develops housing within the context of making sure that uh, we're not talking about just one or two or three modes of transportation, uh, but a full range of transportation options so that people can get from where they live to where they work to where they shop uh, to where they go to school, all of those happening uh, within uh, a, a very localized kind of community. One of the other things that we're taking on is this notion of parking management. I'm sure you all uh, on the OTC as well as staff has, has heard uh, from multiple uh, sources that parking um, is often required per unit of housing. Um, in most cases, it's, it's required uh, and can easily add in the range of thirty to fifty thousand dollars per unit of of housing. Uh, if we pull that thirty to fifty thousand out, delink uh, the the connection between uh, between having to have a parking space for every dwelling, we've obviously lowered the the, the price of that unit dramatically and made it more affordable to a broader range of people. So I'm going to stop on this slide. Uh, next slide, please, uh, if I may. Um, 
So we've talked about transportation and housing. We've talked a little bit about the so-called middle housing. I want to spend just a moment on the housing production strategy. Uh, this is a little bit of an enforcement tool with local government that we've never had before, and we are crafting this housing production strategy right now. The state's land use system requires that every community have land available and a plan for housing for every element of uh, the demographic spectrum. Um, in practice, uh, the, the housing for marginalized communities, the, heart, the housing for less affordable members of the community or housing for, for people who can't afford um, single family houses has largely um, been, uh, been taken away, frankly, by the people who come in first uh, with, with single family housing development um, for tax reasons, for a whole bunch of other reasons we now will have a tool to make sure that the required housing for every element of the community is being built. Uh, climate adaptation framework, um, we um, did a climate adaptation uh, document 10 years ago. We're updating it, but again, if you think about the single most vulnerable community uh, in a warming climate, it's usually underhoused uh, urban dwellers in areas without tree cover parks, um, adequately cooled or insulated homes. It's overnight temperatures for inadequate housing affecting the most vulnerable people among us. And so, again, the adaptation work focuses on those most vulnerable. And then lastly, we're taking a, a look at uh, all 19 of our planning goals uh, to see where and how we could integrate climate cons uh, considerations and requirements uh, into each one of the goals. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rue. Um, so if it's okay, uh, Chair Van Brocklin, I'll go ahead and move um, to some of the other agency directors just to make sure they have some time before they have to leave and then we should have a little bit of time for a uh, question and answer at the end. So with that, Michelle, would you mind advancing three slides forward and we'll uh, cover DEQ and Director Whitman's slides next. So Director Whitman, I turn it over to you. And we're not able to hear you currently, so you may be muted still. Okay, so Michelle, let's uh, let's delay my last. Are you and if, okay, Are you now I can hear, hear you. Yes. All right. So so thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Chair Van Brocklin, members of the Commission. For the record, uh, Richard Whitman, Director of Oregon DEQ. Pleasure to be here this afternoon and talk with you about the cooperative work we're doing with these other agencies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also think about how to um, redress some of the burden that we put on uh, historically um, Burden communities around around air quality issues. So uh, I have two slides. I'm going to try to be very quick here. Uh, the first slide describes the efforts that Oregon Department of Environmental Quality is the lead on under the Every Mile Counts uh, effort. Uh, and then the second slide, which I'll go to in a minute here, uh, um, gives you a sense of the other greenhouse gas reduction work going on at DEQ. In terms of this um, collaborative effort with uh, ODOT, DLCD, and Oregon Department of Energy, um, the first piece of that is a development, really expansion of existing um, trip reduction policy that exists right now uh, only in the Portland metro area, but looking at expanding the employee commute option program to large employers in other parts of the state where there are options uh, in terms of how people get to and from work. Um, 
Right now, this program applies to employers, uh, again, in the Portland area uh, that employ more than 100 people at a particular site. Uh, there's also the possibility of lowering that threshold in the Portland metro area. Those are some of the things we'll be evaluating as we look at this. This is a uh, rule effort, uh, rulemaking that will come before the State Environmental Quality Commission, the Oversight Policy Board for DEQ. The second element um, was one of the lead elements or is one of the lead elements in Governor Brown's Executive Order 20-04, which is an extension and expansion of our existing uh, successful clean fuels program, which currently uh, has us reducing the carbon intensity of transportation fuels used in Oregon by 10% by 2025. This expansion would carry that forward to 2035 and increase the reduction in carbon intensity from 10% to 25% in 2035. This is also a rulemaking that will come before the Environmental Quality Commission. It's likely to timing-wise to be a little bit, um, probably six months or so, behind uh, some of the other rulemaking efforts coming out of the executive order. And that's because we are doing um, some very careful analytical work uh, um, with some third-party experts to assure that those alternative fuels, in fact, are going to be available in that time period. The third element um, is the truck alternative fuel study and emission standards and zero emission vehicle requirements for trucks. Uh, there are a couple of pieces to this. One is um, working with ODOT on the alternative fuel study. Uh, but we are also looking at adopting California standards for zero emission um, medium and heavy duty trucks. And there was actually an announcement about this, the governor uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with 14 other states uh, yesterday, um, committing Oregon to um, California's targets for zero emission vehicles. And um, that target is 30% uh, zero emission medium and heavy duty trucks by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And so we're very excited about that. There is one other aspect of this, which um, is important to the equity conversation. Uh, as many of you know, it's our communities that reside along our major transportation corridors that um, historically have borne the brunt of uh, air pollution from our vehicles. So we are also uh, working to adopt California standards, which we expect the California Air Resources Board to adopt in August for low uh, NOx emissions from medium and heavy duty trucks. And uh, this is important um, uh, and, and California is looking at doing this in conjunction with their greenhouse gas rules for trucks, um, but also will um, reduce the pollution burden in those communities along uh, corridors with a large amount of truck traffic. So those are the uh, cleaner um, every mile counts uh, programs. If I could have the next slide, let me briefly talk about um, other greenhouse gas reduction programs that are going on at DEQ. The, um, the darker uh, color programs here are new programs under Governor Brown's executive order, and the one that I think has gotten the most attention is sector-specific greenhouse gas cap and reduce programs. Those are for three sectors, uh, large stationary sources is the first sector, transportation fuels is the second sector, and natural gas and other fuels is the third sector. Um, and for those who want more information about these programs, uh, there is a uh, fairly detailed presentation that's being given to the Environmental Quality Commission tomorrow starting at 4. Uh, and you can go to uh, Oregon Environmental Quality Commission website on the DQ um, webpage and get information about how to connect to that. Um, but these programs are designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon by 
uh, 45% by 2035 and 80% by 2050. Um, I've already talked about clean fuels. Um, there's a separate rulemaking going on to accelerate work on electrification with utilities uh, that is just about to kick off. And then two other new programs. One is um, enhanced regulation of methane emissions from landfills and uh, the final element is a program on reduction of food waste. This is an area where uh, the marginal benefit from uh, reductions in food waste is actually one of the most effective ways of reducing overall GHG emissions. So that is a really quick uh, run through um, some of the programs going on. We're very excited about working with the other agencies on STS implementation. Amanda is doing a great job keeping us all organized. I appreciate uh, Chris's attention on this also. He's been right there from day one on this. And so we look forward to working with ODOT and the OTC uh, as we bring these things forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Director Whitman. So Michelle, if we could go back three slides and then we'll turn it over to Director Benner. And then, um, Chair Van Brocklin, if, if you might be amenable because uh, Director Benner and Director Whitman need to sign off at three, maybe prior to going to Director Strickler, we could open it up for questions of uh, DEQ or DOE prior to uh, their departure. That sounds great. Excellent. So, uh, Director Benner. Hi. Uh, can you hear me all right? Great. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Janine Benner. I'm the director of the Oregon Department of Energy. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. I'm really honored to be here presenting to you today and also to be a part of the Every Mile Counts implementation effort. And I just want to echo Jim's compliments and say thanks to Amanda for her great work um, turning our ideas and her ideas and efforts into a really uh, fantastic work plan. Um, Odo's role in this effort really focuses on providing expertise, data, and analysis on fuels and vehicles including electric vehicles, electricity as a fuel, alternative fuels, and transportation energy efficiency technologies. And with me today on this call is Jessica Rikers, who manages our technology and policy section. She's been our staff lead on this work, and I'll defer um, any questions, any tough questions to her today. So um, on this slide here, you see that Odo is leading the effort to develop and finalize an interagency action plan that establishes state agency-led initiatives to support increasing Oregonians' access, and that's including for traditionally underserved communities, to zero emission vehicles, and also to increase state awareness of the benefits of driving electric. Odo actually started this process in late 2019 as part of our work facilitating the Zero Emission Vehicle Interagency Working Group, or the ZEVIWIG, which was created out of a previous executive order. And we're pleased that ODOT has now taken on the leadership of the ZEVIWIG. So once the Zero Emission Vehicle Action Plan, or ZAP, has been finalized and agreed upon by members of the ZEVIWIG, ODOT will lead the implementation of the plan and coordination um, with the agencies um, that you're hearing from today and the ZEBIWIG members. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this slide shows some of the other work happening at ODO to address greenhouse gas emissions. There's a lot here and there's a lot going on at the agency because energy and greenhouse gas emissions are inherently intertwined. Uh, about 80% of the GHG emissions in Oregon come from our daily energy use. ODO's authorizing statutes include acting as the clearinghouse for energy-related data and information in Oregon, and that includes the greenhouse gas emissions associated with energy use, and of course there is energy use associated with transportation. We've already talked a little bit about Governor Brown's Executive Order 20-04 that directed um, all state agencies to do everything within their authority to facilitate the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And that Executive order included several specific directions for ODO, which included updating appliance efficiency standards for products to at least levels equivalent to the most stringent standards among other West Coast jurisdictions, uh, to work with the building codes division as they adopt energy efficiency goals for new residential and commercial buildings, to participate in this every mile counts effort, and to support ODOT in their transportation electrification needs analysis, which I think they'll probably be getting into a little bit uh, more later. Um, ODO is also currently in the process of drafting 
our next biennial energy report, or BRRRR as we like to call it, uh, which will provide a comprehensive overview of energy issues and information for Oregon. The first version of the report, which was completed in 2018 and which you see the uh, cover of here on the slide, um, included chapters on transportation and climate change, among others. So the 2020 version is due on November 1st, and this will build upon topics um, in the previous version. And one area that we will likely dive deeper on in the 2020 report is energy burden. That's when a household's energy-related expenditures exceed 6% of their income. So in addition, we wanna make sure that all Oregonians, including those that have been traditionally underrepresented in energy conversations, benefit from the advancements and innovations that we're seeing in the energy sector. On the right of the screen, you can see a preview of a new EV dashboard that we're working on. Um, thank you uh, to ODOT and DMV for sharing some data with us. We're developing this as part of a U.S. Department of Energy grant. Uh, it's an interactive web page that allows users to look at EV numbers by city, county, and down to individual census tract tracts. Uh, and the information can be parsed in multiple ways, including by make, model, and year, used or new. And it also allows the user to enter basic information on their vehicle traveling habits and that will tell them um, what the potential fuel cost savings are and greenhouse gas emission savings would be from getting an electric car. Finally, ODO provides staff support for the Oregon Global Warming Commission, the state's advisory body on greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the commission, as you probably know, has long supported efforts to decarbonize the transportation sector. In its roadmap to 2020, released back in 2011, the commission included a call to shift to lower carbon transportation fuels, embed carbon planning in local transportation and land use decisions, and uh, build carbon efficient cities. So many of these same strategies are being pursued as part of the Every Mile Counts effort. Um, so that's what I've got. Happy to answer any questions, and thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so uh, kind of following on Amanda's comment a minute ago, uh, given the time we have with um, which isn't much uh, remaining. Uh, maybe we could see if any of the commissioners have questions for, uh, I guess, in particular, uh, Director Benner and Director Whitman. Questions? Commissioner Callery. Commissioner? Uh, I have a question about the electric vehicle initiative uh, when you look at the sourcing of the electricity for supporting that electrification initiative, how far back in the chain of production are you looking? Um, I'm not sure whether I understand your question, Commissioner, but uh, we are looking at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the use of that fuel. So. Um, we are looking at the emissions associated with the mix that the utility in your district, uh, or your utility uses. So there's a place on our website called the Electricity Resource Mix where you can go and see what the mix is for every utility in the state. So how much um, coal they use, how much wind they use, um, and the EV dashboard will pull data from that. So if you, like me, have an electric car in uh, Eugene Water and Electric Board territory, you can see um, how clean your electric car will be because the mix for eWeb is so clean. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Other questions? No? Great. Thank you, Director Benner and Director Whitman. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, Amanda, so back to you. okay. So, Michelle, if we could advance uh, three slides forward. We're doing this in threes today. Um, so, now I'll turn it over to Director Strickler to speak to ODOT's responsibilities. And before I open with my remarks, I'll be uh, relatively brief as well, but I did want to send my appreciation to the other directors uh, coming before the commission. I know we started a bit late. My apologies for that, uh, but I think it really is important for the commission to have access and conversation with the other directors to really see what uh, the ongoing coordination efforts are. As you can tell, with many of these individually led efforts, 
uh, almost all of them touches something else within one of the other agencies, so you can see the connection uh, amongst the four agencies. So big thanks to uh, Director Benner, Director Whitman, Director Rue for uh, being available today and spending time with our commission. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'll be brief in my remarks, uh, knowing where we sit with time. Um, but as we sit uh, right now on slide, I think it's um, every mile council that led efforts, right? Um, as, as we look to the efforts that we're leading, uh, many of these you've heard from Amanda already. So I'll speak first to the transportation electrification infrastructure needs analysis. So per the governor's office direction, we'll be taking a lead role in the implementation efforts for transportation electrification, uh, knowing that that's a key component of the STS and is a critical path for reducing transportation related emissions. I think you heard earlier in this meeting, although it was quite some time ago, that it won't be the only thing that helps us achieve our carbon reduction goals, but it certainly is a significant benefit to the overall transportation system. We have to work cooperatively to accomplish what we're hoping to achieve. And that, that cooperation uh, has to transcend across state agencies and private sector in order to enable broad electrification. Uh, and we're working hand in hand with the other agencies around this table uh, on some of these efforts. You've heard a lot about equity in many of the conversations today. And I'll say that as we look to the electrification infrastructure needs analysis, we will also be folding in uh, an equity lens for this effort as well. It's really important that we start to look at what type of availability uh, exists if we're really hoping to uh, shift the market. Um, it's clear that if, if you are within certain income brackets, uh, owning an electric vehicle might be a little bit more difficult. And so we have to look at what those impacts are and we have to look at what those impacts across the system are uh, if we really hope to bring an equitable distribution uh, of infrastructure in, in the electrification arena to all Oregonians. It's going to look at the it being the, the, the uh, electrification infrastructure needs analysis is going to look on infrastructure gaps and barriers that exist across the state. Those barriers will also include um, that equity lens, uh, but then also especially rural areas and frontline communities. Uh, there'll be actions that come out of that report that will require continued and enhanced coordination. We've also then begun looking at performance measures and the STS provides a good foundation for the performance measures on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're looking to hold ourselves accountable and accountable to the Every Mile Counts initiative work by additionally uh, measuring other objectives and within the individual actions that we can take as a state. The state agencies are engaged in a performance measure development, data collection and reporting exercise. And the, the results of that work will be invaluable in ensuring we're pursuing the right mix of, act, mix of actions, excuse me. We've heard quite a bit uh, from each of the agencies, just the significance of uh, Amanda's team playing uh, kind of that coordinated effort and bringing that skill set to the table. We're really lucky to be in that position. And, and as we look to the future, there will be things that we have cooperative efforts that we can coordinate with. And Amanda will, uh, and her team will be leading those. And there will also be things that uh, really, we are solely performing on our own as an agency, and we'll be looking to Amanda's office for that as well. Uh, a lot resting on her shoulders right now and, and the entire agency there to support her. Uh, Michelle, next slide, please. Uh, this is really a repeat of um, the things that you've heard uh, for several months. And in fact, you heard a more detailed conversation about this in the May meeting, uh, and you heard it from the expert being Amanda rather than myself. But I will say, um, that I, I made mention that there are additional efforts that go above and beyond what we can do in those coordinated venues with the four uh, state agencies. Those additional efforts uh, that we're collaborating on outside of that Every Mile Counts initiative uh, regarding climate will have other opportunities for us as we go forward and we'll learn new information as we go forward. When you pair this with the budget implications that we've been hearing about um, uh, for this meeting, we know that there's a lot of work in front of us. Uh, we have to look to mitigation efforts, adaptation efforts, and then ongoing sustainability efforts all coming through the climate office. And then we have to find ways to resource that and be equitable in how uh, we are administering anything that comes out of the program at the same time. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Amanda to maybe wrap us up and then if there's any additional questions from there. Great, thank you, Director Strickler. So next slide, Michelle. Um, so what we wanted to acknowledge and I started with um, at the beginning of this conversation is that uh, the work plan that we're talking about here today is really our only first shot at this. 
Um, so we know that more work is going to be needed, enhanced efforts over time. So uh, the four agencies have today executed um, a memorandum of understanding that uh, commits us to at least 10 years um, of doing this work with a new work plan coming out every two years that renews our commitments to the actions, identifies new ones, um, and really helps work through that process. So the memorandum of understanding, there was a um, draft of it included in the commission packet, gives a little bit more information on those agreement points and our accountability mechanisms through that process. Next slide. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that uh, Director Rue has stuck with us through uh, this entire meeting. Um, it didn't have a conflict at three, and so he's available to help answer questions if you have any. I know, um, Director Rue, we've certainly had some good conversations in front of this commission uh, in recognition of the tie between transportation and land use. So um, again, appreciate your time on this. And Chair Van Brocklin, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. So. Uh... Let's uh, let's take questions uh, for either Director Rue or Director Strickler, or both. Any questions? Gentlemen, it looks like you may be off the hook here. Well, thank you to all of you for, for taking the time uh, to, to listen to this, these presentations. It was our pleasure. Thank you very much, Jim, for doing it. And thank you, Chris. Uh, Absolutely, Jim. Thank you very much for staying on with us. So that moves us to our last agenda item, which is external relations uh, from Assistant Director Baker. Uh, and like she always does, Lindsay will get us back on time. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Lindsay. Up. All right. Wonderful. Hi. Thanks again, uh, Chairman Bauck and members of the commission. For the record, Lindsay Baker, Assistant Director for External Relations. So I will do uh, my very best to sort of do my normal flyover and I will talk 100 miles a minute at you, uh, but please stop and, and stop me and jump in if you have any questions along the way. Um, so I think uh, I'll, in the interest of trying to make up a little bit of time, I will uh, go pretty quickly through what I was uh, planning to, to talk about this afternoon. Um, I think we have an agenda item on the workshop agenda tomorrow to talk about sort of the communications work. So I'm going to put that a little bit aside for now and really focus mostly on the legislative work that we've been doing um, since we last spoke. Um, so as you all know, the legislature met for a special session. Oh gosh, two, three weeks, two, three weeks ago, I think it was. Uh, time sort of means less and less as the days pass by these days. Um, and it was a session mostly focused on, I think, COVID response, certainly, uh, and coronavirus response, um, and a lot of police accountability and law enforcement reform. Um, there were two measures that were included in the uh, special session that ultimately did pass that had transportation-related impacts and that ODOT was very, very actively engaged on. Uh, the, one of those bills was Senate Bill 1601, which I think Director Strickler mentioned very briefly in his opening remarks this morning, uh, that focused, I think, primarily from ODOT's perspective on two sort of buckets and categories of issue. The first one was, uh, as Director Strickler mentioned, the merging and the consolidation of two different public transportation programs, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Fund, or STIF, STS, and also the Special Transportation Fund, or STF. Uh, you'll recall that during the 2020 short session that uh, ended a little bit unceremoniously, perhaps, um, the, uh, we were able to get that sort of merger of those two programs included in that, in that bill. Unfortunately, that bill did not pass in the short session. So uh, this is a good opportunity to sort of revisit that conversation in a special session, uh, and we were successfully successful at the end of the day. Um, that was one sort of component of the, of the measure. The second component, which was um, quite important as well, that we advocated very strongly for uh, and were able to sort of successfully get it across the finish line due in no small part to our uh, ongoing really strong partnerships with the law enforcement community as well as the judicial system uh, was a, a, 
a concept that essentially provided a level of immunity for Oregonians across the state who are unable to access DMV services um, for the duration of the pandemic. Uh, so sort of practically speaking, what this means is for uh, violations like failure to um, have your license, your driver's license, uh, driving on a suspended license, driving without place or valid registration, something to that effect, uh, whereby that uh, offense was was given or that citation was given during the period from March to December of this year. Um, those are those uh, offenses and those citations are sort of dismissed. So again, this was a really close partnership with the law enforcement community and with the judicial system to sort of make the language uh, sufficiently uh, refined and sufficiently narrow uh, that we're really addressing the community of folks that were not able to come into DMV office and get any services. Um, for that period from March until about sort of early part of June when we were to, able to open back up. Um, so those were the two main pieces that were included in that bill. Uh, and then House Bill 4210 also passed during the short session and excuse me, during the special session uh, and that focused on um, suspension uh, and, and no longer allowing courts and um, allowing courts to suspend driver's licenses for failure to sort of pay fines and penalties from the court system. Um, and again, this was one of those bills that was considered, uh, was on its way to passage, passage during this short 2020 session, but ultimately did not become law. And so this is a great opportunity to work closely with the legislature, work closely with our partners at the, in the law enforcement community and work closely with our partners at the Oregon Law Commission uh, excuse me, the Oregon Law Center um, to, to get this one across the finish line. Um, so there we put together um, a, I think, three page long legislative summary that included these special session bills. And with a three day special session, I believe they passed somewhere around the order of 30 bills total, 30-ish total. Um, and again, most of those focused on um, COVID relief, uh, putting a lot of funding through um, and some police and law enforcement accountability measures. So that is all included in the summary that I believe was included in your um, agenda materials. Um, so that's kind of looking in the rearview mirror. And I think as we go forward, uh, the, um, the legislature is likely to have another special session that's really focused more on budget adjustments, budget reconciliation, uh, and some budget changes in light of COVID. Um, that is likely to happen the early part of August. I am expecting it will happen that first week of the month of August, but I think the dates are a little bit sort of up in the air and um, not certain exactly when that's going to be. But again, it'll likely be focusing on budget. Um, I think there's ongoing conversation right now uh, around, you know, what the, what that will actually look like. I think ODOT as an agency is a, so somewhat a little bit isolated from that because we are not a general fund agency. Um, and I think you all have has, has heard a lot this morning, um, we have a lot of different budget challenges, but it's sort of not in the same way. Um, so we'll look forward to continuing to be engaged in those conversations um, as they relate to us or not, and really just sort of standing with the governor's office and with um, our sister agencies across the executive branch um, as we're responding to um, the impacts of COVID-19. So those are sort of the main pieces um, in the legislative space right now. And again, I'll talk more in detail about our communications work tomorrow. Um, so I'm happy at that point to pause, take a breath and answer any questions if you all have any, um, but that sort of concludes what I had planned to talk about this, this afternoon. Okay, she will be uh, leading a session tomorrow as well. Uh, I think that is all of our business for today. Uh, we're supposed to finish this meeting at 3.10. We finish, according to my uh, phone, at 3.12, so not bad. Two minutes over. Um, thank you, everyone. We will stand in recess till tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and we will have our uh, slightly more than half day. Uh, workshop starting at nine. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you.